Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon in India and maybe very good morning in the West and uh, good evening those in the East of yeah, us. We are going live. Very good morning in the West. There's an echo, um, Shifali. Okay. So uh, at the outset, you know, from behalf of the Indian National Association for Study of Flavor, I welcome you to this midterm meeting and to formally welcome you and to tell you about this meeting, I'll request our, the president of Inazal, Professor P. N. Rao, to go ahead. So you need to unmute yourself. I, thank you very much. Uh, I think I, well, I welcome you all for this uh, midterm conference around hepatocellular carcinoma. As you know, that is the right time for this kind of a theme, single theme, which we are doing it, because with the new arrivals of the several medications, that means lenvatinib and cabo, and also availability of immunotherapy, and the fact that you know most of the private and then public institutions are now equipped to do the interventional radiologies, surgeries, resections, and it's the right time for us to go about. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Ajay has done a wonderful job. As you can see, as you go through, we're going to have a very good feast of uh, information on this. Uh, over to you, Ajay, for the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So I think I'll just take one more minute before we go you know, live with the academic sessions. Uh, I'll just like to brief you with the format of the meeting. So in almost all these sessions, we have uh, two to five speakers, and we have two chairpersons who would be moderating the whole session on that uh, particular subject. We also have four to five panelists in the each uh, session. Uh, so the format would be that the chairpersons would be introducing the speakers. The speakers would go one by one, and once they are done with all the talks in that particular session, uh, the chairpersons would then uh, involve the panelists for their questions, comments, and a kind of panel discussion for around 15 minutes given to each session. So uh, I think uh, this is be the format. Let me first check with the uh, technical team. Is uh, Dr. Harsham El Sarag there, Shifali? No, sir, not as yet. Not yet. So uh, maybe I think he would join us and maybe we can reverse the order and I can take the first talk about the epidemiology of HCC in India and the global epidemiology, which you know he has to discuss. I think we can do make that as a second talk if he joins by them. And if not, we can continue uh, with you know the other sessions. So over to Sir Professor Chavla and uh, Professor Saraya. So I think we have two chairpersons for this session, Professor Yogesh Chavla, who's the ex-director of PGI Chandigarh and ex-professor and head department of hepatology at PGI Chandigarh, Padam Shri and well-known figure in the field of hepatology and also in HCC. Uh, second chairperson is uh, Professor Anup Saraya, who's professor and head uh, of department of gastroenterology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. New Delhi, and uh, I think over to you, sir, both of you, and uh, we can start with the first session. Thank you, Ajay. And it's my privilege to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Ajay, who doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he is professor and head of a unit in the Department of Hepatology at Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh, and he's also the Secretary General of INASIL. So it's over to you, Dr. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Let me share my screen and then we can go ahead with the. Uh, let me make it full screen. So, just a minute. Can you see my slides, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I think when we were, you know, kind of making the scientific program for this meeting, and obviously we had to discuss uh, both. Uh, I think Dr. Sir, uh, Harsham El Sarag has joined. Should I continue or should we uh, start with the global epidemiology? Dr. Rao, he, he's just joined. 
Ajay, you could do your talk because yeah. to settle also, he might take a little time. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. So okay. He, he okay. could be the second speaker. Right, sure. So, as I said, when we were, you know, kind of uh, preparing the scientific program for this meeting, and obviously we had to discuss both uh, global and the Indian epidemiology of uh, HCC. So, I mean, we, we thought that there's some change which we have observed in last, you know, a decade or two in the etiology and the risk factors of uh, HCC in India. So, we thought that let's keep topic as, you know, a little more catchy etiology and risk factors of HCC in India, but then giving a rider to this that are these really changing? So my job in next 20 minutes or so would be to show you some data on the etiology and risk factor of HCC from India. And I think then we can maybe discuss at the end whether these are really changing or not. Uh, let me con confess in the beginning and admit in the beginning that whatever epidemiological data we have uh, from this country, India, on HCC, it's little sparse, variable, and the quality is also little uncertain. And I would say the only five, six big tertiary care centers who have been, you know, uh, publishing on HCC, those who have been, you know, managing HCC. So as I said, the data may not be off, you know, uh, as I said, it, it's a, a sparse kind of data. Uh, then we do have cancer registries um, in India, both population-based cancer registries and as well as hospital-based cancer registries. But again, I think they do not provide the accurate estimate of HCC in this country. The reason being that you all know, I know that the HCC in India and globally would be managed predominantly by the hepatologists or maybe by gastroenterologists and maybe by GI surgeons or the liver surgeons. But then these registries look at the data, which are, you know, they get information from the cytology, oncology, and the municipal registries people who have, you know, there the HCC may not be really, you know, they may not have in, enough information on HCC. So I think that's the one reason that the probably to rely on cancer registries for epidemiology of HCC in India. And we know that cancer is not a reportable disease in India. So I think that's another issue. But let me give you some figures that it's a male predominant disease and maybe the fifth most common malignancy as globally. It's a male predominant disease and the age group what we see in India is again around 40 to 70 years. Uh, these are some, some of the you know, incidence figures per 100,000. As I said, more in males than in females. There's only one study from All India Institute, which is, I think, uh, maybe 10 years back or eight years back they had done. And they actually followed around 200 patients with cirrhosis of various etiology, child A, B, and C. And then they looked at the incidence of HCC in them, and they found HCC incidence to be 1.6 per 100 person years. Uh, we know that when we talk about the risk factors for HCC, cirrhosis is the most common risk factor, irrespective of the etiology. So they followed these serotics and came out with these figures. But then there's also a perception, and I would say there's some published data also, which I'm going to show you that overall in last two decades or so, the incidence of HCC has been increasing in India. There was a lot of unpublished data, but then as I said, there's some published data also, and maybe I'll show you some of that. And then HCC is responsible for around, you know, mortality rate of around 2.7 per 100,000 population per year. So now, as I said, when I talk about the etiology and risk factors, as I said, cirrhosis is the most important risk factor. And why I'm saying this is, I'll show you data that in India also and globally, around you know, 80 to 85% of people with HCC would have underlying cirrhosis. Uh, but then a non-serotic group of you know, HCC is coming up, which would be covered by Professor Rao in a subsequent session. In the etiology, I think it's hepatitis B, the viral hepatitis, both hepatitis B and C. I'll show you some data and tell you whether they are, you know, whether the things are really changing. Alcohol, again, whether it is changing, very important cause. And very important cause which is emerging, we know, is a fatty liver disease, you know, again in serotics and as a non-serotic cause. And obesity and diabetes, irrespective of the etiology, we understand are very important risk factors and put you at a risk of, you know, having HCC. Uh, there are certain uncommon risk factors, which again, I will be discussing briefly to again, give you the concept, whether, you know, we're seeing them more often or not, the aflatoxins, the genetic factors, 
bud carry which could be peculiar to india autoimmune liver disease hemochromatosis wilsons are not very common causes and there's some data to suggest that the smoking or tobacco use could be you know the culprit so again when i was you know preparing this talk i i thought i have to give you the whether the etiology and the risk factors are changing how far should i be going so i decided that let me go back maybe 20 years uh, and i have 20 minutes to you know speak so i said let me go back 20 years and this is 2021 so i went on to 2001 so this was the first study which was published from that time by professor sarin's group that time he was in gb panth uh, and and a small number of patients 74 patients of hcc uh, and again as i said male predominant disease uh, and mean age was around 50 years and 76 percent of these patients had cirrhosis as i said cirrhosis is the biggest you know risk factor but when we look at the you know etiology hepatitis b was responsible for 72 percent of patients with hcc and look at hepatitis c only four percent alcohol total was 22 percent but if you look at alcohol alone alone means without viruses no b no c only alcohol was only three percent and the alcohol with you know uh, hepatitis b and c was little more commoner there was an unknown or a cryptogenic group which was around 20 percent and in them i think the majority of the patients were you know non-serotics they had divided these patients into cirrhosis and non-serosis uh, they also did some p3 gene mutation studies in some of the liver biopsies figures were not very big and they didn't find any aflatoxin toxicity in their you know patients uh, then from our center led by professor chavla that time a small study was published 50 patients of hcc again predominantly male predominant mean age around 53 years predominantly again that time we did only hepatitis b and c and 54 percent were b positive and and in around 30 patients where we did hepatitis C, 27% were, you know, hepatitis C positive. So then came a larger study, again from Professor Sarin's group from GB Pant and around 213 patients. And as I said, they divided them into, again, serotics and non-serotics. 72% of them were had underlying cirrhosis. But if you look at the etiology again, 70% was hepatitis B. 70% hepatitis B and C was only 12%. And alcohol in total was around 16%. But again, I want to emphasize here, alcohol alone without viruses was only 4%. And then, you know, cryptogenic group of around 19%. That stayed. And in the cryptogenic group, as I said, there were more of, you know, non-serotics. Uh, larger study came from, you know, All India Institute of Medical Sciences two years later. Uh, led by again Professor Acharya and the first author was Dr. Paul and I'm so lucky to tell you that all these stalwarts Professor Acharya, Professor Sareen, Professor Chavla, uh, Professor Carr, uh, Dr. Shashi, but they're all joining us for this meeting and I think it'd be really privileged for that. So this study from All India Institute of Medical Sciences again looked at the data of around 15 years and they showed data of around 300 and 24 patients of HCC, again, male predominant, almost all cirrhotics, 97%. And But then look at the figures which I wanted to show again, as far as the etiology is concerned, the hepatitis, you know, B was, you know, the commonest. Uh, let me, yeah. And my, mm, I can't see the figure. Okay. So hepatitis B was in 50% or 51%. C was only in 11 percent and alcohol alone was again only 6 percent and they also had around 20 percent those who are you know cryptogenic. Uh, this is an unpublished data from All India Institute which Professor Acharya had you know uh, published in in one of the review articles. Uh, this is again a very large number of around uh, I would say 22 years from 1990 to 2012 1000 patients and this is one data which shows us that over the years, if you look at the figures, you know, the number of patients with HCC is going up. And in 2012, I think, or 10, they had around 100 patients per year of HCC coming up. But again, coming to the etiology, again, look at this figure, 50% was hepatitis B. C was only 11%. And if you combine both hep and B and C, it formulates around 65%. So viral hepatitis was 65%. 
as I said, predominantly B, and unknown or cryptogenic figure was, you know, 16%. Uh, thereafter, you know, again, a large study came from Professor Carr's group, the Molana Azad Medical College. And again, the figures were hepatitis B, 62%. C was, you know, started rising maybe by that time, 26%. But alcohol alone was again around 3%. So alone, alcohol was predominantly with, you know, hepatitis B and C. But then the important thing, the cryptogenic was a very small group in this. But the another three important things which they came up was, one was that the smoking, you know, they found in around 40-50%. The other was they started finding diabetes in their patients, around 7% that time. But the other thing what they found was that 17% had history of aflatoxin exposure. And the same group, you know, did another study on aflatoxins and they again had a very large number, around 300 patients with HCC. And then they had a control group of chronic liver disease, you know, cirrhosis and chronic hepatitis without HCC. And they found that if they had, you know, high aflatoxins in the blood or in the urine, amongst the patients with hepatitis B, there was around three to five times increased risk of having HCC. Similarly, in the non-viral etiology, I think the aflatoxins probably worked as a synergistic risk factor, and that was not seen in hepatitis C virus. Uh, there was some data, again, on the genetics and uh, HCC from India, again, from the same group, Professor Carr's group, and they initially showed that the glutathione S transferase, you know, genotype, especially in those those who were alcoholics or those who were smokers could be responsible. Then there were three, four studies from our center, again, a real led by Professor Chavla with, you know, the biochemistry department and where, the, again, the GST variants and the DNA methylation work was shown to be associated in virus-associated HCC. There was one study from Southern India also, which also showed some variation of P53, you know, could be responsible for this. But, you know, this was all in 2009 and 2010. Thereafter, we do not have any good data on aflatoxins or on genetics getting involved in the pathogenesis of HCC. One, you know, I'll take one, this uh, uncommon cause, and then I think we will move on to the story of, again, the NASH and the hepatitis C. So this is one study from, you know, all in Institute of Medical Sciences. Again, very large uh, number of around 420 patients of hepatic venous outflow tract obstruction. And this is over a period of maybe around 15 years. And what they found uh, was that eight patients at presentation had HCC, giving a prevalence figure of around 1.9% of HCC in Badkiari. Over a period of another follow-up of, you know, five years of mean follow-up, eight more patients developed HCC, thereby giving a cumulative incidence of HCC in Badkiari as 3.5%. Uh, and then they looked at certain factors, presence of cirrhosis, combined IVC and hepatic vein block, long segment block as a cause. So I think, again, this is probably peculiar to India, but again, not a very common cause. Yeah, just 3.5% was the cumulative incidence, and we do not have much data on this. Then, you know, came the wave of hepatitis C, especially in northern part of the country, especially in Punjab and Chandigarh. And, you know, we know that the story of IV drug abuse in Punjab and, you know, the story of hepatitis C and the hotspots of hepatitis C in Punjab. And this study from Ludhiana came in. And one of the panelists we have is from the same center, DMC Ludhiana. Uh, Dr. Varun Mehta is there. So this study was, again, you know, around 130 patients, predominantly males, again, 50 years mean age, underlying cirrhosis in 99%. But then if you look at the figures, of, you know, etiology here, hepatitis C had taken over. 52% of their HCC were related to hepatitis C. The alcohol total was 43, but look at this, alcohol alone went up, which was only 2, 3, 4%. Alcohol alone became around 19%. So this is again because of the, you know, high alcohol consumption in Punjab and the northern part of the country. The B had come down. The hepatitis B was only 29%. And the cryptogenics started becoming NASH related. So it was started realizing that these patients of cryptogenic could be NASH related. I think that story, you know, started coming in. So the, the, I mean, how this was established that these cryptogenics were NASH related. Again, I think there was a lot of data. We had done some work on this. And this is, again, our study, which was published in hepatology 10 years back, where we looked at, you know, 40 patients with non-B, non-C, HCC. 
so-called cryptogenic HCC, and we compared them with around 40 patients with virus-related HCC, and we showed that the patients with, you know, uh, the cryptogenic group or non-B or non-C definitely had higher BMI, had more of diabetes mellitus. So, you know, the story, I mean, more of metabolic risk factors and in the absence of other causes, no alcohol, no B, no C, and, you know, cryptogenic group and you're finding metabolic risk factors, people started believing that all this, you know, could be NASH related. But yes, diabetes per se could have been playing or the obesity per se could have been playing role in the pathogenesis. There's a similar work, which was from the CMC Velour. They also said, you know, more of, you know, metabolic risk factors in the cryptogenic group, non-B, non-C, you know, HCC around 50 patients and the similar message. But the best study, I think the best evidence from India on this came from this large study. That time again, you in the Gangaram Hospital, Professor Nayak, Dr. Soyan and Dr. Sagal's group, you know, this was an explant study where they looked at the histopathology of the um, people who underwent, patients who underwent liver transplant. And you look at this, the cryptogenic group, which was 22% pre-transplant, 17% of them became NASH on a very, you know, meticulous, you know, looking at the histopathology and they thought it was all NASH. And it was not only in cirrhosis, even in HCC, you know, they, they thought that the NASH was, you know, becoming a very important cause. So, you know, then came, as came the era, you know, the, the NASH, you know, started becoming recognized as, you know, an important cause of HCC in this country. And this is one of the, you know, the largest published data from our center, which we, we know, recently analyzed. And to tell you, Anon, uh, the, the, this has been published in this month's November issue of JCH. But this, we started analyzing, you know, data two years back. And we analyzed this data for over nine years, 2007 to 2015. This was a retrospective analysis and a real life, you know, management of all our patients of HCC, which we had done over nine years. So in total, we had around 870 patients of HCC and the etiological risk factors, which is the topic for me today. I think we had data of around, you know, 785. And again, I would like to see you here that 26% of our patients had diabetes. Now, the problem is that we only recorded diabetes, you know, whether it was a hepatogenous diabetes after the occurrence of cirrhosis or HCC, or did they have longstanding type 2 diabetes as a risk factor? I think that be what was a limitation for this, but then 26% diabetes, 20% smokers, 86% had cirrhosis, only 14% were non-cirrhotics. And in the non-cirrhotics, it was hepatitis B and NASH, you know, which were responsible. You know, the global non-cirrhotic data would be shown to you by Professor Rao, as I said, but then this is what we found that 14% non-cirrhotic and in the non-cirrhotic, it was hepatitis B and NASH 50-50%. And then when we looked at, you know, the etiology of our, you know, 785 patients, look at this, the hepatitis B was down to 20%. C was down to 16%. C and B with alcohol obviously continued as an important cause. Alcohol alone went up to 18%, which was only up to say 3%, 4% in the earlier decade. The NASH went up to again 18%. So I think this is what we thought that this things were little changing. And again, when we looked at the data over the years, not only the numbers were going up. I mean, again, our figures in the 2014-15 were close to around 100 patients, you know, um, uh, per year. But look at this alcohol alone, which was 10% in 2007 to 9, went to 20%. Similarly, NASH or cryptogenic, which was 14% went to you know 20 percent and this is alcohol plus virus continued the hepatitis b came down from maybe 23 percent to 17 percent so you know this is what i think we have observed and very recently this is an unpublished data courtesy i'm showing you professor sareen and uh, dr mania prashad from ilbs this is an ongoing who work you know and ilbs is the who collaborating center and there is an ongoing study and and we are all nine centers we are all uploading data on this website which is a who you know collaborating center data and this is the interim analysis which is being pub you know submitted for publication and again over a period of you know uh, six five years nine center data 1,342 patients with HCC. Again, look at diabetes is 38%. But the problem here again is we do not know whether this is a hepatogenous diabetes or this is a type 2 diabetes, which is, you know, causing this. And again, if you look at, you know, the etiological breakup, 
of these patients, you know, hepatitis B is down to 28%, C is down to 15%, the NAFLD has gone to 34%, but again, there's some problem with the definition of NAFLD because they said cryptogenic patients with metabolic risk factor were defined as NAFLD. We can have more discussion on this. Alcohol alone is, you know, 15%. So that's what, you know, it's going up and the cryptogenic is kind of, you know, vanishing. So I think let me summarize, ladies and gentlemen, what I said in last 20 minutes, that viral hepatitis obviously still remains the commonest. Hepatitis B, I would say, is a common cause. But then over the years that the figures for hepatitis B have come down from 70% to down to 25 or 20%. Similarly, hepatitis C, which initially increased, you know, has now started decreasing, you know, with the better drugs, what we have. Alcohol plus viruses is a, is a problem. You know, that is an alcohol, you know, uh, usually happens with viruses and that remains around 25-30%. But the other change which we have seen is that alcohol alone is going up, which was only 3% is close to now 18%. Cryptogenic is decreasing and that's converting into NASH. So that's, you know, the NASH figures have the, most of the cryptogenic, which was 15-20%, now we recognize is probably NASH related. And type 2 diabetes could be an important risk factor. Now, as I said, the limitation is whether this is, you know, hepatogenous or, you know, the type 2, I think. But then looks like that diabetes is a very important risk factor for HCC in India. So uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Let me stop sharing my slides and uh, uh, maybe Dr. Harsham, if he has joined, I'm not sure. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Sarag, are you there? Ajay, we are there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Ajay, for uh, an excellent talk. Good morning. Morning, Hashim. Can so, you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides, but can you go back to the first slide? Yes, I'm, I'm trying with difficulty, but yes. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. I think morning. I should start. I have 20 minutes, uh, unless you want to say something first. Yes, yes. Hashem, uh, it's a proud privilege for me to uh, introduce my very old dear friend, Professor Hashem El Sarag. I've known him for a number of years. Uh, a brief introduction for him would be he's the chair and professor department of medicine at the Texas Medical Center of Digestive Disease Center. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Epidemiology, School of Public Health at Houston. So over to you, Professor Hashim. I, I know it's you... extremely early in the morning today yeah. for you. But yeah, that's uh, what I wanted to say, you. sir. Uh, uh -huh. Just before you start, Professor Hashem, this is our special thanks to you uh, from Inazar and from our personal this thing that you have agreed to be present live during this session. We gave you the option of, you know, a recorded lecture, but you said at that time we realized that this would be 5 a.m. in the morning, but now yes. I'm learning this is probably 4 a.m. for you. So thank yes. you so much for that gesture and we're looking forward to your lecture. It's, it's an honor and a privilege, and thank you for inviting me. And I insisted on being live because this is the closest uh, way for me to be to in, in India right now. Thank you. Um, uh, so thank you for uh, setting the ground uh, and for this wonderful talk that you just given. I would like to start with a color-coded map uh, of the incidence, uh, age-adjusted incidence rates for uh, liver cancer. Most of it is HCC worldwide. The darkest areas are the highest incidence area. As you can see, Southeast Asia uh, is the highest. And then you pick your color, as you correctly pointed, the uh, few data from India, but probably low to intermediate uh, levels. Uh, this is a very static picture of age-adjusted incidence rates. Incidence rates meaning a numerator of cases divided by denominator. So, that's one picture. The other one is, no matter where you go, the female-male ratio is such as men are affected three to four times more than women. Typically, the ratio is accentuated. It's higher in high incidence area, drops in low incidence areas, but still maintained. So I've shown two slides that shows the static picture. 
Now I'm going to show a slightly surprising slide, if you will. Most of these talks tend to say everything is going up. So I'm going to show you a slide that shows actually the age-adjusted incidence rates for liver cancer globally has been going down since 2002. And it's going down in men and in women. And I'm going to show you another slide here that will confuse you even more. It shows the total number or the frequency of cases in China, for example, it's the highest, and those are the different continents, and they're actually going up. So the total number of cases are going up, the age-adjusted incidents are going down. What does that mean? It really means that because the population A is increasing, number two, it's aging, you're going to have a lot more cases of hepatocellular carcinoma, but if you take that number and divide it by the underlying population, the age-adjusted incidence rate has been actually declining. So how do you interpret that? If you're a public health official trying to prevent hepatitis B and C, that's a sign of success. If you're a provider who's sitting in a hospital and expecting this to translate as lower number of cases that you see per year, you're disappointed because these numbers are still going up because you have a lot more people living in your area. This decline has been mostly contributed to by high incidence area, such as Japan, China, Korea, uh, Taiwan. Uh, so this is just a representative slide that shows a dramatic drop from the 2000 thrill 2020 in the age adjusted incidence rates in Japan and a slight increase in the US and uh, some European countries. You can substitute this graph with uh, China or Korea, and you'll be also right. So as mentioned in the previous talk, the main risk factor remains as uh, cirrhosis. Um, there are a few cases that are probably increasing of non-cirrhotic HCC related to NAFLD NASH, and there is a predictable uh, 15 to 20% that happen in the context of hepatitis B, but cirrhosis remains an easy way of understanding the epidemiology of risk factors related to HCC. So first victory related to hepatitis B is vaccination. Uh, you must have seen one shape or form of these slides, uh, typically transmitted from Taiwan where there was a, a national uh, vaccination system, and they've shown 20 and then 30 years later that the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma has started actually dropping in cohorts of children, then young adolescents, then young adults. So this shows the vaccinated versus unvaccinated incidence rates of HCC, and clearly the dark bars, which is vaccinated, is considerably lower, indicating the success of uh, hepatitis B vaccination. However, China has another story, which is the decline related to uh, drop in aflatoxin in crops. So this is a somewhat complicated slide that, that shows um, at the very bottom of the slide is the effect of vaccination and therefore the uh, percent of hepatitis B antibodies. At the top part of the slide shows the aflatoxin albumin adducts showing that they are decreasing. And at the very top part of the slide shows the uh, uh, liver cancer rates uh, dropping and the, ever, uh, the average age incident increasing. So in general, uh, there are two interventions that worked with hepatitis B, which is uh, vaccination and aflatoxin reduction. Continuing the theme of hepatitis B, just to give you some numbers, uh, the risk factors or the incidence rate in general are uh, 04 to 0.6% uh, per year, uh, slightly lower in female, and family history of HCC and African ancestry increase the risk of HCC and hepatitis B carriers. There used to be a time when I would spend the whole 20 minutes or hour explaining the determinants of HCC in untreated hepatitis B. Fortunately, among those who uh, qualify for treatment, there's only one risk factor that really matters if you treat them, which is antiviral treatment. So antiviral treatment with 
adequate HBV uh, suppression uh, results in a dramatic uh, decrease in hepatocellular carcinoma with some residual risk. And there are many scores that I would advise uh, most of you to use. And the buzzwords is, has the score been developed among people who are treated for hepatitis B as opposed to people who were naive to treatment like reveal B and all of those things. So this is one such score and it shows uh, the most important thing um, is, is hepatitis B. Uh, so this is the old uh, reveal. And as you can see, most of these scores, uh, the, the elements of the scores uh, are affected by hepatitis B treatment. And therefore a treatment, uh, a score like this that used to be revered is really uh, not useful anymore. So I would advise you to look at things like CAMD, C-A-M-D, uh, where you notice that the main residual risk factor is really age and cirrhosis. So that's the story for hepatitis B. It is declining. Those who are treated have lower risk and the residual risk factor is really cirrhosis and age. How about hepatitis C? Hepatitis C, uh, as mentioned, um, uh, predominantly Europe and North America, to a lower extent, Latin America and some parts of Eastern Asia, uh, but it's almost uh, an inverse uh, presence of these proportions depending on the area and compared to hepatitis B. Hepatitis B, again, I used to spend a whole hour saying what are the different factors uh, host, virological, lifestyle factors that may increase the risk of HCC among those with hepatitis C. Fortunately now, and a lot more dramatic than hepatitis B, the only risk factor that seems to matter for HCC and HBV, have they been treated? Have HCVR been achieved or not? If that happens, then the only remaining thing really is the presence of cirrhosis or not. So this is a study that shows the risk of HCC among those with cirrhosis at the time of treatment and cure and among those without cirrhosis. I'll start with the without cirrhosis. These are age, race, diabetes, alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. And basically it shows it doesn't make a difference anymore. If you treat someone and they get cured without cirrhosis, the rate of HCC is so low. It's 0.1 to 0.2% per year, too low to require surveillance. If you treat them with cirrhosis, then the rate remains high. It's 1.8% per year, too high to let them go without surveillance. Um, so what is the issue with hepatitis C? Is it more or better treatment? Uh, the answer is really a public health issue. So the major deficit that remains in hepatitis C related HCC is screening, linkage to care and treatment. It's the drop between the people who we think are infected to those who actually get treated and get cured. It's becoming a public health issue as opposed to a science and drug development issue. A word about alcohol and smoking, both are potentiating factors in the presence of hepatitis B and C. Both are kind of weak risk factors on their own. So the bottom graph is hepatitis is alcohol consumption. The risk of HCC goes high once people exceed 60 grams of alcohol, which typically corresponds to more than two drinks per day uh, every day. Uh, and the risk is higher if you add hepatitis B and highest if you have hepatitis C. Now I'm gonna to move to the new risk factor, which is related to obesity. And uh, the global epidemic is globesity. And you can see there is no country that is safe from this epidemic. Well, if you look at the association between BMI, body mass index, greater than 30, and the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in multiple studies, it's actually not impressive. Most, but not, suggest a modest increase. Actually, some studies show no associations. Other studies show even a decrease in the risk of HCC. So this is a meta-analysis that shows uh, the association and those that categorized obesity and those that categorized overweight. In the overweight 
and I point your attention to the diamond at the bottom of your slide, uh, the incidence rates are actually, or the risk uh, ratio is actually not significantly elevated compared to normal. In the obesity, it is elevated, but approximately two times. So a modest, inconsistent increase. So what's the problem? The problem is in examining obesity and HCC, you're looking at two global phenomenons that either of these are imprecise, but particularly obesity. It's what epidemiologists call, it's a distal association. Uh, it doesn't reflect what's the injurious part of obesity. And therefore, uh, as obesity increases in prevalence, you will get to a point where obesity becomes like oxygen. It's very difficult to examine an association between breathing oxygen and the risk of cancer because everyone is breathing that. So what's useful is looking at proximal associations such as abdominal fat, humoral mechanism, NASH or NAFLD as a mechanism of understanding the link between obesity and HCC as opposed to examining BMI. So if you look at waist hip ratio, there are multiple studies and good ones from North America and this particular one from Europe that shows that those with a waist hip ratio in the highest tertile have three times, remember what I was talking about BMI? It was, was only 1.5 to two. This is now remarkably stronger and remarkably more consistent, three times than those in the lowest tertile of waist hip ratio. And uh, I was hoping to show you my, how I changed because this used to be me, and now that's how I look with a little bit of exercise and diet. So I, the first intermediate risk factor I mentioned is uh, the ob abdominal obesity. The second one is nash -Naffold. Um, As you know, it's a big problem in multiple places, including your part of the world, where uh, the overall uh, prevalence is almost a quarter of the population and the overall prevalence in type two diabetes, more than half of the population uh, have uh, NAFLD. And then if you look at NASH, then uh, one to 5% of the population have NASH. So I'm sharing with you, uh, although I'm biased, it's, it's our study here from the US, it's in the national VA system, which I regard as probably the best epidemiological evidence linking NAFLD in a general population. In this case, it happens to be primary care population in all the national VA system and compared to controls without NAFLD. So a very large number of cases and controls, uh, it's a cohort study actually, a large number of, of people with NAFLD, almost half a million compared to half a million without NAFLD. And the uh, risk, uh, hazard ratio is elevated seven to eight times uh, more than those without NAFLD. But look at the y-axis, it's the annual HCC incidence. The absolute incidence is still quite low with NAFLD in general to, for you as a clinician to do anything about it. So it's 0.1% per year. I remind you, after curing hepatitis C, your risk is 0.1% per year. After curing hepatitis C with cirrhosis, it's 10 times as high as this. So this is just establishes uh, the principle that NAFLD in general increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So if you dig deeper and you look at the subgroups, the subgroup where the risk of NAFLD related HCC is meaningfully elevated is the group with cirrhosis. And that's at the bottom. So if you have a diagnosis of cirrhosis and a Fib4 that is in the cirrhosis range, then your incidence rate is now more than 10 per thousand or more than 1% per year. And that is the number that is recognized by most societies to screen for hepatocellular carcinoma. And hence, NAFLD with cirrhosis is a condition for which hepatocellular carcinoma is surveyable. Uh, the other factors elevate the risk, but don't elevate it to a, a group that, uh, to, to a level that is surveyable. I did not show on the slide, but Hypertension, obesity, hypertriglyceridemia altogether also increase the risk, but it doesn't give you a 1% per year. So if you look, and this is a fresh slide from our review in, in Nature review, uh, review of Gastroenterology Hepatology, at the proportion 
of HCC attributed to NAFLD based on published studies. Uh, your country uh, leads the list in terms of uh, studies that reported uh, the highest uh, proportion of HCC uh, related to NASH in the world. Um, to complete the story about NASH NAFLD, since people always ask about chemo prevention, there is a hint that among diabetics treated with metformin, there is uh, several epidemiological studies that show 40 to 50% reduction in the risk of HCC. And that's compared to those who use insulin or sulfonylurea. There's also a hint, and, and we produced that hint first uh, several years ago, that those diabetics, again, treated with HCC may have a reduced risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. In this case, 37% reduction uh, in the risk of HCC. Uh, and there's also a hint that coffee drinking, um, caffeinated coffee, um, not decaffeinated coffee, caffeinated coffee, um, mostly not tea, uh, is also associated with a reduction in the risk of having elevated liver enzymes, the risk of cirrhosis, and the risk of HCC. And it's estimated that every additional cup of coffee is associated with a 20 to 25% risk reduction. Uh, the, re the reason I put this uh, uh, slide on, apart from being cute, is um, the mechanisms proposed, while caffeine is a biggie, uh, phytochemicals is another one, uh, one of the proposed mechanisms that coffee reduces the risk of insulin resistance and diabetes. So it's becoming a, a more fitting sort of explanatory model in the context of NAFLD NASH related uh, HCC. Uh, so I'm getting to the end of, of my talk, and it's a busy slide, but I want to take sort of some time to explain it because I have a, a minute to spare here. There is really a shift in the risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma from risk factors that used to be uh, very, very uncommon, but very dangerous, So, which is hepatitis C and hepatitis B to factors that are very common, but have a modest elevation in the risk of HCC. So let me take you through this line by line. If you look how common NAFLD or MAFLD in the general population, it's very common, 30 to 40%. If you look at hepatitis B or hepatitis C, and yes, there are variations here and there, but it's quite uncommon in general. It's one to 2% of the general population. If you look at the prevalence of the risk factor in those with cirrhosis, 10 to 20% hepatitis B, 70 to 80% NAFLD or MAFLD. If you look at how dangerous the risk factor is, MAFLD, NAFLD, diabetes, any of these things, you barely get in epidemiology a 1.5 to 2 per two fold elevation in the risk. While in the days of hepatitis B and C, to have an untreated hepatitis B or C, you're elevating your risk 20 to 25 fold. So the percent of develop, and, and another difference, the percent of those developing HCC in the setting of cirrhosis, in hepatitis C, it's 95% higher. In hepatitis B, it's 85% higher. In NAFLD, MAFLD, it's 60 to 70%. There's a lot uh, greater proportion developing it without NAFLD, MAFLD. If you look at the population attributable fraction just 10 years ago, MAFLD NAFLD was attributing only 20 to 30% of the overall burden of cases, while hepatitis B or C were attributing 30 to 40%, 50, 60%, as you heard in the previous talk. If you look at the population attributable fraction in 2020, this one doubled, this one plummeted. In a place like the US, where there's practically no more active hepatitis C in hepatology clinics and no one with hepatitis B who needs to be treated, who's not treated, uh, this dropped a lot. The problems that this kind of epidemiology produces for clinical epidemiology is uh, when we used to do risk stratification, there's really nothing to guide us in MAFLD MAFLD. The only thing we know is cirrhosis or not. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C, it's time to revise and review and use new scores because the old scores are dominated by viral activity. In terms of chemoprevention, 
We have practically nothing. I showed you metformin and statin and methyl. Hepatitis C cure and hepatitis B virus suppressions are fantastic chemopreventive agents. And in surveillance for HCC, apart from uh, uh, cirrhosis, there is nothing we know. And it's really mildly recommended while it's incorporated in practice in the other one. So in summary, there is a total global HCC decreasing incidence, but because people are getting older and there's more people, the frequency is increasing. There's a dramatic change in HCC risk factors, less active hepatitis C and B and more metabolic syndrome. There's a changing in the type of individual risk. There are more people at risk because there are more people with MAFL, but their individual risk is much lower than it used to be with hepatitis B and C. In the metabolic syndrome, the relative risk is really modest and inconsistent with obesity. But the factors that influence the risk and narrow it and sharpen it are abdominal obesity, diabetes, and NAFL. And clearly, more knowledge is needed to rewrite the epidemiology of, of HCC in a modern era with better risk stratification and prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You, Professor. Yeah, Anoop. For an excellent presentation. Yes. So at this stage, I would like to invite our panelist also, Dr. Jayanti Venkataraman. She is professor and head department of hepatology at Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Research, Chennai. Dr. Abbas, who is professor and head department of gastroenterology at Ziauddin University Hospital, Clifton, Karachi. And he's a consultant gastroenterologist at Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan. Then Dr. Bhaskar Nandi, who is Director of Gastroenterology at Sarvodaya Hospital, Faridabad, and Dr. Varun Mehta, who is Professor of Gastroenterology at Dayanand Medical College in Hospital, Ludhiana. So we have a panel of four distinguished gastroenterologists and hepatologists. I think they'll have to make a comment uh, on both the talks. They may be having some question also for the speakers. So... Um, can, I, yeah. can I... Yes, yes, Dr. Okay. Dante, yes. Yeah, so uh, my, my first question is the, taking the last issue, that is the NAFLD or MAFLD as cause for HCC. Most of the cirrhotics that we do see uh, do not have dyslipidemia. They do not have a hypertension. Whatever diabetes we see, it is more of heterogeneous. At least in our study, we found 40% uh, diabetics. So do we have any longitudinal study to say, that the person who has got NAFLD progresses to cirrhosis and then to HCC, say F4 fibrosis. Until we have that particular data, I'm not really certain um, whether we can say that the cirrhotics, which is cryptogenic, which is actually 5% explant even in our own study. So in explant livers, when we see the, the true cryptogenic, that is one. The other cryptogenic is, I think, few things that they're really not doing is looking into anti-HBC total, which we are finding in about 40 to 50% of our patients as well as whether we are clearing all these with HBV, DNA, and HCV, RNA, the cryptogenic. So the so-called cryptogenic, which we are putting as uh, NAFLD related, because just because of the presence of diabetes, um, uh, some, these are some of my doubts. I would like some clarification on this. Uh, it's, it's an excellent point. And it reminds me of us in the United States, I would say 15 years ago. And I would submit to you, it's, it was then impossible for us to tell how cryptogenic happens when you're swimming in a sea of hepatitis C and hepatitis B. It's very difficult, and alcohol. It's very difficult to peel it off. But I can tell you now, the picture is so dramatic and suddenly as if something is lifted off of your eyes when you're seeing people without hepatitis C for sure and without hepatitis B for sure, and their only risk factors are and it's not just diabetes, but it's the diabetes, the dyslipidemias, et cetera. So my answer is twofold. First, it's difficult to discern if you have the big player uh, in place, as I showed in the slides. So my second question is, I, I completely agree. Until recently, there were really no longitudinal studies, as you said, that shows NAFLD then 10 years later, cirrhosis, then 20 years later, HCC. I believe now there are at least two studies, and, and I've showed one of them, that shows, uh, I hate to say it, but beyond the shadow of doubt, that there's at least a proportion that really goes the journey from nothing to NAFLD to cirrhosis to HCCs. And it happens 
at a much lower rate than uh, viral hepatitis. And when it happens, it's not just, as you said, a little bit of diabetes, because that little bit of diabetes can happen with any cirrhosis, but it's typically the entire gamut uh, of dyslipidemia. Uh, do we need more studies in different places? Uh, absolutely, but I can at least reflect in North America, we're starting to see this uh, to a somewhat convincing way. I think there are two questions. One is both, I think, can be addressed to Dr. Ajay Duseja. What is the impact of alcohol abstinence on HCC risk? And second is, should we consider diabetes as an independent risk factor for HCC? Yeah, very important very questions. I remember again, I think the alcohol story when the HCC, and this was used to be the standard teaching with us uh, uh, that probably still holds true that, you know, the Patients who consume alcohol would develop HCC only once they are, you know, kind of abstinent from alcohol. And that observation was based on that alcohol, you know, uh, predominantly causes either a mixed nodular cirrhosis or a micronodular cirrhosis. And once, you know, they leave alcohol, these nodules become a little bigger and what we call them as macronodular cirrhosis and the risk of HCC probably goes up. So I think there's some relation, maybe I think Professor Chawla can add on to that. There's some relation with abstinence of alcohol versus active alcohol consumption and the risk of HCC, probably more in those who are abstinent. But then the more than that is that we used to see more of alcohol and virus as a combination, you know, as a risk for HCC. But now, as I said, we are seeing alcohol alone also. About the diabetes, I think that has probably been answered by during the first query. You know, we really don't know the diabetes, you know, uh, the history of type 2 diabetes is very, very important before you label it as a risk factor for uh, cryptogenic or NASH cirrhosis uh, rather than the hepatogenous diabetes because the impaired glucose tolerance or the hepatogenous diabetes would happen, but that does not mean that all patients, those who have cirrhosis and diabetes are NASH related. We need to look at the history of diabetes, history of obesity, history of dyslipidemia, and history of hypertension. Because all these, you know, tend to improve, right? You know, lipids become normal, the blood pressure becomes normal, uh, you, you tend to lose weight, and, and you get hepatogenous diabetes. So your risk factors changes with the onset of cirrhosis. So the history of these risk factors is more important than the presence of these risk factors. I May agree I ask with you? that, and, and I would add that that platelets and I mean ALT in NASH and NAFLD also normalizes as cirrhosis and HCC develops. So one trick is to look at the platelets as they're dropping while the ALT is improving. Doctor Abbas. Yes. Uh, yeah. Zaygum. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, though the hepatitis B is not so common. Uh, it's about 2.5 percent, but we see our population. We see much higher prevalence of hepatitis B core antibody total. So uh, whenever we see a patient uh, with hepatocellulocarcinoma, then there are, I think, multiple factors that may be interplaying in cryptogenic uh, sort of uh, hepatocellulocarcinoma where do, we do not find any cause which may be some occurred infection or previous infection with hepatitis B. Another problem in Pakistan is the delta hepatitis and delta hepatitis related hepatocellular carcinoma that we see in our population. And these are the patients who have cirrhosis of liver and uh, they come to us uh, with uh, advanced sort of a cirrhosis of liver mm -hmm. and uh, they have the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. They do not have the high viral load of hepatitis B. Some of them have the absent uh, HBV DNA, but they have the HDV RNA, which is there, and more higher the HDV RNA, then more we see that these patients have the delta hepatitis related hepatitis carcinoma. And they have much larger varices. They have the more severe sort of uh, uh, ascites and cirrhosis as compared to hepatitis B mono infection. Thank you. There's another query. Any role of increased ferritin in HCC? Hashim or yeah, yeah. Ajay? I, I think, I think uh, you know, uh, hereditary hemochromatosis 
uh, is a risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, but it's typically in those who develop cirrhosis. Um, uh, almost all cirrhotics in the presence of necrosis would have ferritin. Uh, the mixed uh, genotypes of hemochromatosis haven't really panned out. Um, and I would say with the rare exceptions of, you know, Bantu drinking tea in, in iron pots, um, it doesn't seem like it's a, it's a major risk factor outside the hemochromatosis world. May I ask a question to Hashim? Hashim, uh, is there any role of chemoprophylaxis? Like uh, you mentioned it was statins. So patients who have uh, uh, NFLD or NFLD, should they start taking uh, metformin or statins as chemoprophylaxis? And what is your opinion about aspirin? taking aspirin in these patients? Uh, all good questions. And I, I want to qualify it in the absence of really stronger, especially randomized control trial evidence. Uh, I'm very reluctant to advise it per se. Having said that, it's a, it's a pendulum. And the pendulum 15 years ago was, don't take statins if you have NAFLD because it may flare your NAFLD. So at least now I say, take statin for your heart or for your lipids or for whatever it is, and it may help your risk of HCC, but don't take it primarily for that. Uh, metformin, uh, same thing. I'm actually now a huge advocate for perhaps maybe expensive medications like liraglutide, semaglutide uh, to treat diabetes because there's evidence of an additional bang for the buck for that. As far as aspirin, um, I think the observational data show uh, a slight reduction in HCC. Uh, the number of the studies are still small. Um, and as you know, there is a real harm with aspirin uh, that it happens there. Uh, there's good news here before I make my recommendation is there are now actual real randomized control trials in cirrhosis to look at meaningful outcomes, uh, both related to portal hypertension and HCC which says that people suspect that it will be useful enough to go through that effort. So my short answer is I actually look for excuses to use metformin and statin because I say, at least I'm not doing a harm and I'm treating something. If they have a little bit of abnormalities in lipid, they have prediabetes, which in the United States is not very difficult to find. Most people have one or the other. Uh, I don't do aspirin per se for, hepatos for hepatocellular carcinoma prevention. Dr. 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 Nandi had a point here. Yeah. 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 May I ask a query? Yeah. Yes. Hello? Ask. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, this is for Dr. Ashim and Dr. Duseja. Uh, do you think time has come for us to actually modify our protocols for surveillance of HCC in the high-risk group? Uh, we have identified that diabetes, alcohol, NAFLD are increasing in our country. Uh, we really need to look into that uh, prevalence of all these three is high in our country. So are they independent risk factors or suppose we take out cirrhosis from these three, do they still matter and how significantly they matter? Uh, Ajay, the problem please. with the studies is that how do we define cirrhosis? Because apart from the expand studies, uh, I think the importance of knowing the risk factor is to identify our patients who are at high risk and then how to screen them. There are many limitations what we are doing right now. Like every six months ultrasound, we are aware that the sensitivity is only in the 60s. And uh, it is also reported that in most of the NAFLD patients, when you are a non serotic you are developing an HCC. So how do we identify our high risk patients and do we change our protocol? You have a valid point, but we have a full session on screening and surveillance and our points are well taken. The issues are very, very important. Maybe Dr. Harsham can quickly answer this. But then, as I said, we have a full session discussing all these issues, you know, about the screening and surveillance. Dr. Harsham. I, I think briefly, there's simply not enough evidence to say screen non serotics with NAFLD. And the problem with a recommendation like this is unlike in hep C, where you would say, who cares? It's only one or 2% of the population. Let's survey all of them. If you make a recommendation of this, that you'll be surveying what, a third of the population? It's, it's just not manageable. And, and I believe you'll be hurting other people from whom you're diverting resources. 
um, there's just simply very little in terms of risk stratification at this point in time. You'll be screening everyone. Dr. Rao had a point. Yeah. Um, I'm just a little bit uh, confused and concerned about the, what is the exact definition of a NASH cirrhosis and cryptogenic cirrhosis. Because ASLD 2017 says what we are thinking just opposite that one. They say that NASH cirrhosis is the one where you find that there is a cirrhosis and there is a fat either now or in the previous biopsy. Whereas cryptogenic is the one where there is no etiology but associated with the metabolic risk factors. So this changes quite a lot about what we are thinking now. What we are thinking now is a cryptogenic or mostly NASH cirrhosis. Oh, uh, I, I was hoping that you would do this, but <laughs> um, no, I, I think I think cryptogenic is for lack of knowledge, honestly. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember cryptogenic turned out to be hepatitis C and cryptogenic is turning out to be NAFLD NASH. And I honestly don't see many real cryptogenics anymore. Suddenly when your eyes start seeing, there's less cryptogenic. And now we have electronic medical records. I can actually see what happened 30 years ago. And I say, ah, it was obvious. The person had fatty liver. Um, so I think uh, an evidence of now or in the past of something suggestive of fatty liver and a metabolic syndrome, in my mind, is, is a reasonable enough to say that this is NASH-related cirrhosis. Yes. Uh, Dr. Abla, Dr. Sarai, probably we need to wrap up because the were uh, yes. Short time, uh, yeah. Uh, I thank, thank you, Rasha. Uh, it's it's been wonderful listening to you and to Ajay, and uh, we've made the good start. And thank you very much for joining us. I just wanted to add two more things in this session. I think genetics is going to play a major role. We haven't looked much into it. And number two, Nafeld. I just recently read that patients who have been treated for HCV, if they have NAFLD associated, they are more likely to develop HCC. So I think we have to be more aware of these uh, new developments. And thank you very much, uh, Hashim. Thank you. And Ajay, thank you. And congratulations thank you. on a successful meeting. Bye-bye. Yeah, so thank it's my you. proud privilege to thank both the chairpersons, Professor Chavla, Professor Saraya, and uh, uh, Professor Hersham el -Sarag. And uh, the panelists, uh, Dr. Abbas, uh, Dr. Nandi, Dr. Jayanti, and Dr. Uh, I think I can't see uh, Varun now. So thank you very much. And we close this session now and move on to the next session on pathogenesis. And uh, for this, I will request my colleague, Dr. Arka Day, to introduce the chairpersons of the next session. Dr. Arka, please. Uh, thank you, sir. So we'll uh, move forward uh, with the next session, which is on the pathogenesis of hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, uh, I, I'd like to invite the chairpersons for the session. Uh, Professor uh, Abraham Koshi, who is the director of, director of Research and Hepatology in Lakeshore Hospital, Kochi. And uh, Professor S.P. Singh, sir, are you here? No, he will not be. I mean, right. So if sir is not here, then I'd uh, please request... Uh, uh, Professor Deseja uh, to uh, chair the session. Thank you, Dr. Arka. Professor Koshi, can you please uh, go ahead with the yes. actual? Yeah, please. We have uh, two talks uh, now over the next uh, one hour or so on the pathogenesis related to hepatitis B and C viruses and with uh, reference uh, to NAF. And we have two speakers, Professor Anil Arora, Director. Institute of Liver Gastroenterology and Pancreato Biliary uh, Sciences, Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, and uh, Professor Jean Francois Dufour uh, from Bern, Switzerland. I had the great pleasure of working in uh, Jean Francois' unit several years ago, and it will be a great pleasure to uh, hear him now. I'll first invite uh, Professor Anil Arora. Discussions will be at the end of both talks. Yes. Sir. So, Professor Anil Arora, please, okay. on the pathogenesis of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Later, we will have panelists who will take up uh, questions and they can also ask questions. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Koshi. 
at the outset, I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Ajay and his team for having given me this opportunity of presenting my concepts and my knowledge about the pathogenesis of hepatocellular carcinoma. Ajay, can you see my slides? Can you, see it? you can make it full screen, please. Yes. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's okay. Yeah. HCC is now the fourth most common cancer causing mortality all over the world. As is expected, the major etiological factors being hepatitis C, B and C, 60 to 70 percent of these cases tend to occur in Asia, Pacific and Sub-Saharan Africa. And unfortunately, despite advances in management of HCC, the five-year survival of HCC as of today is extremely dismal with only 5% of the patient come to the stage where the cure can be achieved. And as, a, as a, it has already been mentioned, majority of these HCCs tend to occur in an underlying cirrhosis with a male predominant of a uh, factor of about 2.5. The reason why Dr. Ajay Duseja chose this as the first talk for presentation is, if you look at the virus as the etiology, be it in the North America, or Europe or Asia, 80% of HCC even today is related to viral infections. If you look at a combination of hepatitis B and C, 80% of today's problem is related to the oncogenic viruses. Some important aspects of hepatitis B and C related HCV. Typically, HBV associated HCC occurs more com common in low and the middle human development index countries. The reason is Unfortunately, like what has been happening in COVID-19 infection, these poor countries have a poor vaccination strategies and the coverage of hepatitis B vaccine, which is very unfortunate. Whereas hepatitis C virus associated HCC tends to occur in countries which have a hu uh, high human development index, which is expected. Now, if, if I have to choose one most important risk factor for development of HCC, so I'll say this is cirrhosis of the liver. Various etiological reasons can cause cirrhosis, including hepatitis B, C, and NASH, but my talk is on viral-related cirrhosis. Are these oncogenic viruses, hepatitis B and C? Let me sir, give you some basic information of what is something called oncogenic virus. Now, on their own, these viruses are insufficient to cause cancer. Cancer occurs as a biological accident during their travel and passage through the uh, the uh, parenchyma, tumor cells, when they tend to develop, they will see to it that the virus does not multiply. None of the tumor cells will allow the viral replication. And for, for virus, it is so-called black blockchain of the Bitcoin. So virus will not like to be ending its chain. And because it causes problem over a period of time and alone it cannot cause cancer per se. So you need to have a lot of host and the environmental factor which will contribute to the development of cancer including immune system. So to sum up, oncoviruses only have a small contribution to development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Starting with the major viruses which cause uh, uh, HCC, the reason why these cause viruses cause HCC is because in the normal course of the events, be it COVID-19 or influenza, body tends to overcome the virus and get rid of it. But these two viruses, Somehow they tend to remain in the body depending on what stage you get into the body. And the failure to eradicate leading, leads to persistence of these infections called chronicity of these infections. And this chronic persistence leading to chronic inflammation is the basic hallmark as to why do we develop HCC in patients with viral hepatitis. So first and foremost is the persistent liver inflammation which leads to impaired immune response. This by default, will lead to intracellular and extracellular oxidative stress caused by the replicating virus leading to production of the wild as well as the mutant viral proteins. This ultimately results in dysregulation of the cell signaling pathways where the cells fail to get apoptotic, they continue to proliferate resulting in hepatocellular carcinoma. Two more important aspects of viral related HCC is the concept of HBV getting integrated into the human host and a special tendency of hepatitis C virus to produce steatosis of the liver. So whenever there is an ongoing injury in the liver because of the virus, 
So by two mechanisms, you are trying to perpetuate development of hepatic cell carcinoma. These include extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway. The moment you have cell death and necrosis, there is the release of damps and PAMPs, which leads to persistent inflammation. And once you have an ongoing inflammation, there will be release of TNF alpha, and which will inactivate NF kappa B. And you, we know that once you have activation of NF kappa B, there is a there is a stimulation of the JNK pathway which inhibits apoptosis. So inflammation is leading to in inhibition of the apoptosis, which results in hyperplasia of the cell, which ultimately results in development of hepatocellular carcinoma. At the same time, especially hepatitis B virus is integrating into the human genome, which is causing genetic changes. And this try, this try to suppress the tumor suppressor genes, leading to the activation of the replication of the hepatocytes resulting in hepatocellular carcinoma. So you have a double whammy of intrinsic and extrinsic pathways colliding with each other and conspiring with each other to produce HCCs. Important, another important aspect of inflammation is the change in the macrophage polarization. In the normal course of the events, the moment you have an acute infection, you will have the macrophages which get converted into M1 phase they, are, they have anti-inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, they'll get rid of the virus. But what happens with persistent and passage of the time, once the virus does not get inactivated and does not get out of the body, so you have, will have a conversion of the M1 into M2 type of macrophages. I'll explain you what it means. Once you have a change in the polarity of the monocyte from M1 to M2 because of the release of IL-6 and IL-10 and 13, so these macrophages, they tend to stimulate Treg cells, which by default are immunosuppressive. They also end up recruiting Th17, which causes angiogenesis. So mere shift over of the polarized monocyte from M1 to M2 causes a problem of development of hepatocellular carcinoma. So ladies and gentlemen, it is important to remember that both cancer and replicating virus are doing their best to keep the immune system in check. Do you have a proof of that? Answer is big yes. All of us would have seen these diagram which shows the life cycle of hepatitis B. If you look at the HCC risk, it is maximum at a stage of inflammation. You have four stages of inflammation as recently suggested by ASLD. You have chronic hepatitis B infection, E and E antigen negative infection and the quiescent phase. It is only in the phase of hepatitis, both E antigen positive or negative, there is a high risk of development of cancer, thereby clearly indicating a direct relationship between inflammation and cancer. How does inflammation cause problem? The moment there is a persistent inflammation, you will have a generation of uh, reactive oxygen species, which lead to plethora of problems as mentioned in this slide, which lead to transform transformation of a normal hepatocyte to a anti-senescent or anti-apoptotic cells, which has a potential to grow into hepatocellular carcinoma. Also, because of the fact that the virus continues to multiply, so you have two types of increased oxidative stress. If you look at the cell, a hepatitis B virus containing cell typically has far more oxidative stress than a normal uh, non-infected cells. This uh, oxidative stress could be extracellular as produced by the pro-inflammatory cells or the stellate cells, or they could be occurring within the hepatocyte that is the intrinsic X. Uh, in, intrinsic oxidative stress. What, do, what does this oxidative stress do to the human cell? Let's see, in the normal course of the events, if you have a virus which is multiplying in the endoplasmic reticulum, it tends to send its component onto the Golgi apparatus where the assembly of the virus is completed and virus is extruded from the body. Now, if you have a mutant virus which tends to occur, say, because of the integration, so these mutant virus somehow fail to go to the Golgi apparatus. They tend to get accumulated onto the endoplasmic reticulum, resulting in activation of the unfolded protein response. This unfolded uh, protein response or UPR is a harbinger of inflammation, tissue damage resulting in the fibrosis of the liver. Second thing which is happening is hepatitis B virus uh, integration. I think it's important to when does it occur. You'll be surprised to know immediately after acute infection, the virus can get integrated. Where does it integrate? There is a recent publication from King's College London, which has shown that 64% of the time it will get integrated into the introns of the human genome. 
the major site of integration is the hbs x protein with and what does it do to the integrated human genome it causes chromosomal instability it causes genetic alteration in the component of the cells giving them a selective advantage to uh, survive and there is a way of predicting which patient has a higher chance of integrating the virus if you have an hbb dna which is more than 20000 if you have a hbc core antigen which is more than 3 picogram per ml and if hbs ag quantitative is more than 5000 international units this is a subgroup of the patient which is very likely to have a high integrated virus or high intrahepatic reserve of the virus so these integration leads to insertional mutagenesis expression of the altered mutant proteins from the hepatitis b virion and there is a basic difference between a non tumorous cells which is getting integrated virus versus the tumorous cells in which the virus is integrated in the in the normal course of the events once the virus gets integrated into the human genomes these viruses these are getting inserted at different places but once they come close enough to produce a collation or a big lump of the virus onto the genome so this is the area which starts getting monoclonality the moment you get monoclonality you shift over from a simple uh, uh, hepatocyte to a malignant hepatocyte so this is what happens once you have the virus which comes near the cancer driver gene it tends to proliferate tends to cause a stimulation of genes in and around the other parts of the human genome and stimulation of the number of these pro proto onco genes and the suppression of the tumor suppressor genes resulting in development of hepatocellular carcinoma other other consequences of the integration are that once you have hbv which is getting integrated into the human genome it keeps on producing mutant viruses and mutant antigens mutant antigens somehow cause oxidative stress and this oxidative stress again will lead to uh, advantage of the cells which are harboring this resulting in development of hepatocellular carcinoma this is a recent beautiful diagram presented from again royal college of london published in cut only this month online which shows that virus is getting integrated at multiple places within the hepatocyte gene this is a human genome and the site which typically gets activated and is integrated is the hbx portion with this which, which has a specific nucleotide pattern as has been shown in this slide so this is the c terminus part of the hbs x protein which has the highest chance of integration is there any relationship between the genotype and uh, development of hcs it has been shown that c is more important than b and f is more important than g and these are the various pre core mutation and the core promoter mutation which have been characterized and if you have these specific mutation you have a 80% chance of development of hepatocellular carcinoma similarly there are some studies which have shown that genotype 3 has far higher risk of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in hcb than in non uh, g type uh, non 3 type of genotypes in fact this integration of hbx onto the uh, human genome leads to promotion of genetic instability it induces oxidative stress it causes epigenetic modification and all this integration does not need to be occurring in the tumor promoter gene but it can be occurring at places other than that so the same thing happens with hepatitis c you have various uh, different components of the structural and non structural genome of hepatitis c which tends to cause oxidative stress different components of hepatitis c are also known to cause hepatic steatosis there are different mechanisms why especially genotype 3 causes hepatic steatosis the reason it it increases the uh, decreases the mobility of the uh, lipid from the uh, hepatocyte out it decreases the fatty acid fatty acid oxidation and leads to the accumulation of the fat in the liver so hepatitis c is giving you a double whammy of causing hepatic steatosis which itself will produce oxidative stress and will produce all changes which lead to change over of uh, normal liver to chronic hepatitis to uh, fatty liver disease to steatosis so a combination of inflammation as well as development of fat in the liver is the double whammy for the reason of hepatitis c causing hepatocellular carcinoma there are other risk factors like aflatoxin which are important in causation of hepatitis b which typically causes inactivation of the pt p53 tumor suppressor gene 
there is a good relationship between alcohol and hepatitis b and c because hepatitis c is known to induce the adh1 production which increases the metabolism of the alcohol and with increasing adducts of alcohol and acetaldehyde adducts you have higher chances of injury resulting in hepatocellular carcinoma the reason why males are more prone to develop hcc as mentioned by dr sirag than females is because at uh, the androgen receptor they somehow tend to cause more expression of hbx antigen as and as i said out of all hbv related antigen hbx x antigen has the highest potential of causing genetic abnormality and development of hepatocellular carcinoma in fact combination of hepatitis b and c has a 135 fold higher incidence of development of hepatocellular carcinoma compared to mono infection in which the risk is about 20 to 24 25 fold so do we have from this pathogenetic mechanism do we have any future direction something which is very important is as i have mentioned earlier that both the cancer and the viruses they are trying to suppress the immunity so the first and foremost thing we have to do in chronic hcv and hbv related is immune uh, hcc development is that we have to restore their immunity and there is a corresponding result from that recently published that if you give uh, drugs which increase the immune system by by suppressing the pdl1 component on the t cells that is nivolumab that this drug has shown the best result as of now in treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma to sum up if normal liver which does not is not able to eradicate hepatitis b and c leads to development of chronic inflammation which uh, results in formation of cirrhosis over a period of time these hyperplastic nodules tend to develop early hcc and then this early hcc gets converted into an advanced hcc which patients usually present to us with so what are the reasons where we can act is that hepatitis b and c if you treat or suppress them in time you can prevent the development of chronic inflammation once you have chronic inflammation so these sets of the genes can be taken care of because they can prevent the occurrence of cirrhosis once cirrhosis has occurred there is a conversion of the dysplastic nodule into a mal transformative nodule called early hepatocellular carcinoma and once there is a beginning of the hepatocellular carcinoma you have activation of this tumoral pro tumoral cytidyl genes which develop uh, which lead to development of hepatocellular carcinoma to sum up ladies and gentlemen you have two oncogenic viruses called hepatitis b and c which lead to because of the failure of the body to eradicate them lead to development of chronic inflammation the moment you have chronic inflammation you have both intrinsic as well as extrinsic oxidative stress which leads not only to the activation of the cell signaling pathways but by cell signaling dysregulation you are trying to increase the longevity of the cells you are decreasing the apoptosis and whenever there is a impact of other cofactors as i said virus alone is not enough beat alcohol diabetes hepatitis b or another hit there is a development of uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma more so if the virus is integrated more so if there is a large amount of steatosis in hepatitis b and c uh, in a patient with chronic viral hepatitis so this is in a sense the pathogenesis of viral related uh hepatocellular carcinoma thank you so much i'll stop sharing my slide and hand it over back to professor koshi thank you professor arora for that excellent comprehensive overview of uh, pathogenesis by the two oncogenic viruses uh, we'll take uh, questions at the end of both talks and i'll now invite uh, professor jean francois dufour it's a great pleasure to welcome him to uh, see him and to hear him uh, jean francois please tell thank us you. about thank you very much aram it's very nice to see you yeah it was a long time you were in bern i remember very well it was a nice time indeed thank you for the kind invitation i would also like to thank the previous speakers who really uh, laid the ground for my presentation so uh, let me yeah here we are so these are my disclosures which are actually uh, not very relevant for this presentation and uh, as uh, has been beautifully shown just now they have a sequence in events in the development of hepatocellular carcinoma which is well known in chronic hepatitis b and c also mm -hmm. alcohol and you have accumulations of different mutations early on in third and then you have p53 beta catenin and you have others on later p10 coming 
We have a second pathway, which is relevant for the discussion of NASH, which is the sequence of adenoma, adenocarcinoma in the context of non serotic livers. There are patients developing adenoma when they are men and when there's a mutation in beta catenine in this situation, really there's a high risk to develop a petrocellular carcinoma in this context. So this led to a integrative classification of hepatocellular carcinoma when you have the proliferation class and non-proliferation class your different features here which has presented in terms of pathophysiological pathways genetics signalings and you see that actually we are talking mostly of uh, two or three uh, etiologies you have hepatitis b mostly on the left and alcohol and hepatitis c on the right so what about NAFLD, NASH, hepatocellular carcinoma? So very uh, little information actually until recently. Then there's this paper published from the group of Joseph Lover, looking specifically at features of NASH related hepatocellular carcinoma. First, they look at the mutational frequency of the most commonly altered genes in this tumors in comparison to viral alcohol hepatocellular carcinoma. So you see that you have also very frequently mutations of DIRT, beta-catenin, and P53, P53, maybe less frequently in the case of NASH. Then you have this ACVR2A, which is a cytokine risk receptor mutated in case of NASH, but it's affecting 10%, and you have others, which are the other usual suspects. What you see here is that they knock down, they use shRNA to remove ACFR2A in cell lines and show that actually you have more proliferation, you have more colony formation, suggesting that this uh, genes may cause actually for a kind of a tumor suppressor. Then they looked at a unsupervised hierarchical clustering of the different mutational signatures which have been reported for hepatocellular carcinoma. And they compared here 43 samples for NASH ACC with 43 samples from viral alcohol ACC. And what they found is actually in case of NASH, there is a specific new uh, mutation signatures, which is in blue here in this uh, NASH patients. This is much less frequent in the other ACC. So they were able to find a specific signature for NASH ACC. And then looking at the different Showing these pathways, and you have uh, here uh, the NASH HCC, and you have here the others uh, HCC with other etiologies, and you see clearly there is more frequently pathways involving the metabolism of fatty acids, bile acids, of reactive oxidative species, and uh, also of inflammation. So different makeup in the signaling pathways in these tumors. So to summarize this paper, adding two uh, further uh, points, uh, I show you that there is more frequent mutation in this gene. There is this uh, uh, specific signatures. There is this specific signaling pathways. They found also that uh, in the surrounding liver, there was a more immunosuppressive uh, cancer field. And they found also in terms of molecular classes, there are more frequently WNT-TGF beta subclasses and less involving beta. So now looking at specific papers dealing at drivers which could have been implicated or can be implicated in natural related UCC. There are a few that I would like to mention. There is this uh, paper looking at this uh, prefolding complex uh, URI, which was previously implicated in hepatitis B and C related hepatocellular carcinoma. So in this paper, they found that nutrients and inflammations increase expression of urea in the liver, leading to DNA damage, increasing Th17, interleukin 17, which leads to insulin re resistance in adipose tissues, recruiting neutrophils. This leads to fatty acid release, NASH, and finally to hepatocellular carcinoma. So a sequence of events which begin with an increase in this uh, urea factor, which where they were able to mechanistically in this paper implicate in the development of NASH HCC. 
There is another paper from the group of Michael Karin looking at IgA. So here we found that uh, when you have Nashville, balloon in the hepatocytes, so that these hepatocytes die, they will cell death, you release dumps, which will activate B cells, IgA, and this IgA will release PDL1 on interleukin 10, which has immunosuppressive functions. And as there is a cellular death, there are compensatory uh, proliferation. And in this context of uh, less uh, immunosurveillance, you will develop hepatocellular carcinoma. So another way to develop hepatocellular carcinoma in the context of MASH. Then there's a paper looking at this specific T-cell protein tyrosine phosphatase, which actually dephosphorates STAT3 and STAT1. It inactivates STAT3 and STAT1. So in the context of NAFLD, the oxidative stress will actually inhibit TCPTP, leading to an activation of STAT3 and STAT1. And they were able to here show that STAT1 leads to NASH and fibrosis with the recruitment of T cells and the STAT3 responsible for the proliferation and the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Here also, a specific paper dealing with a specific protein involved in the development of HCC related NASH experimentally. Another one of this one, this is squalene epoxidase. Uh, they found that this gene is overexpressed in case of uh, natural to the HCC, and these genes lead to the production of cholesterol, the cholesterol ester, and at the same time produce uh, reactive oxygen species, changing the methylations of uh, many proteins, including P10, decreasing P10, increasing the mTOR activation, and leading to a hepatocellular carcinoma. So we're using transgenic animals for this uh, gene, they develop more hepatocellular carcinoma, and you have more expression in human NAFLD HCC of this squalene epoxidase. Interesting, need to be confirmed, has not been so far as I know. Then there's a very interesting from the group, paper from the group of Tim Drayton looking at the effect of bile acids. This is not specific for NASH, but can be implicated in NASH because there are many papers on bile acids in NASH. They found here that early primary bile acids leads to the production in endothelial cells of the same kind, the CXCL16, recruiting NKT cells in the livers, and you have then an immunosurveillance. Then you have more secondary bile acids, you have less of these cells, and you have a more poor uh, carcinogenic environment. And so modulating the balance between primary and secondary biases, like with antibiotics, may affect actually the capacity of the liver to harbor tumor. And then I would like to spend a few more slides on these papers because it's really, uh, it's a landmark papers which lead to a lot of discussion from the group of uh, Matthias Heikenwelder. So here in this uh, figure, you have a uh, C57 BS6 mice which were fed pollen deficient high fat diet. Uh, some of them developed tumor and then they were randomized to receive a PDL1 immunotherapy. And in case of treatment with a PDL1 immunotherapy, like uh, nivolumab has just been mentioned before, these mice develop actually more tumors, which is the contrary of what you would expect. You see here their treatment with a PDL1 antibody leads to more tumor. The incidence of the tumor is higher, 10 on 10, uh, in comparison to the control group. They did more experiments to try to understand that, what are actually the different uh, signaling pathways involved. You see clearly when you add the PD-1 antibody in comparison to the control, the IgG, you have here all this in red for the immune-mediated cancer field. You have change in TNF, you have change in the angiogenesis, and so on. So you really change the environment leading to more tumors. And then they went on to use PD-1 knockout animals and show that they develop in the, on the high fat diet more tumors. Quite important is this observation actually relevant in clinical uh, situation. So looking at phase three clinical trials, 
three trials with immunotherapy, the Checkmate, the Embrave, and the Keynote, comparing viral with non-viral etiology. Clearly, in case of viral etiology, there is an effect on these drugs, which is not any more significant in case of non-viral etiology. Now, if we look at previous trials testing tyrosine kinase inhibitors, all these different trials here, you see that the effect is maintained viral or non-viral etiology. Let's look now if we can obtain more specific information on that. Retrospective uh, cohort from different countries, including Switzerland, uh, of patients with HCC treated with the checkpoint inhibitor. If you look at the patients who have NAFLD as an underlying liver disease, they have a much shorter survival on this treatment than the patients with an HCC not due to NAFLD. So it looks like really uh, patients with NAFLD driven HCC respond less well to checkpoint inhibitors. Now, I heard with interest a previous discussion regarding treatments and development of hepatocellular carcinoma and possibility of chemo prevention. So, uh, metformin. So, metformin, yes, there is a lot of data showing that actually metformin reduces the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And interestingly, if you look at insulin, it's associated with a higher risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. I don't want to say that insulin is really a growth factor in this situation. It might be, but insulin is not a very good growth factor. It may probably be a marker of more severe diabetes. But at least when I have patients with compensated cirrhosis, have a mild diabetes, if I can put them on metformin rather than insulin, I do it. Now, not what about statin? Our uh, many, 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 many papers on that. Effectively, statins reduce the risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And there is this beautiful paper from Tracy Simon showing that actually a lipophilic statin have an effect which is not seen so much with the hydrophilic statin. So it's better to use in this situation simvastatin and not ovastatin. I will not prescribe the statins at this point in patients with cirrhosis as a Chemo prevention for hepatocellular carcinoma. But there are ongoing studies that are looking at the effect of studying the progression of cirrhosis. And so I think in the next years, four or five years, we'll have more a reason to use statin. But in the patients with NASH, clearly many of our patients with NASH need statin on not on the statin. That has been studied. It's about 40% of the patients. So really, if there's a reason to use a statin in these patients, I add it. What about aspirin? Yes, aspirin also reduces the risk to develop a vessel carcinoma. Trace Simon shown that also uh, in the New England Journal paper. Um, that's decreased the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. This is in line with the previous nature medicine of Matthias Heidenwelder showing the importance of platelets and the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. What else? Coffee. Coffee, fantastic. Reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And when I discuss lifestyles with my patients with NAFLD or NASH, I always mention coffee. It's good, and you reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Really importantly, you see here uh, the relative risk or the average ratio is 0 0.5, 0 0.6, so a very important effect. Another thing not to neglect is physical activity in these patients. Physical activity is excellent to treat NASH, but it's also excellent to reduce the risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Many papers on this. This is an epidemiological paper showing as the more you move, the more you reduce the risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And we went on in the lab to use a kitten uh, knockout mice, which develop hepatocellular carcinoma, and we randomized these mice to run or not to run. Uh, there was no differences on the development of NASH in these animals, but you have a reduction of 30% of the risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And in our hands, that was due to an activation of AMP kinase, which actually inhibit uh, mTOR. So there is a mechanistic explanation to the effect of uh, physical activity on the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. So I always uh, motivate my patients uh, to uh, have physical activity. They can go biking and they should take their liver with them. I thank you for your attention. I'm really happy uh, to discuss uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-François, for an excellent talk.
Uh, I'm sure there will be many questions. We have uh, six panelists. Dr. Atul Sachdev from uh, Max Super Speciality Hospital. Dr. Sandeep Sidhu from Diana Medical College, Ljubljana. Uh, Dr. Major Sandeep Tereja uh, from Lucknow Command Hospital. Dr. Manas Panigrai from Bhuvaneshwar All India Institute. And Dr. Arka Day from uh, EGI Chandigarh. I think so before we request the panelists, I think there's some echo from your side, sir. I think Professor Koshi probably had two devices on or something. And before we go on to the panelists, I think let me also thank Professor Dufar uh, from my personal behalf and on behalf of Inazal for this wonderful talk and for accepting our invitation to be part of this uh, single theme meeting on HCC. So I think uh, as uh, introduced, we have... Uh, Four panelists, Dr. Thareja is not joining us. So Dr. Arka, Dr. Manas, uh, Dr. Atul and Dr. Sidhu. So I think you can go ahead with your questions and comments here, yeah, please. Maybe Dr. Arka, you can start, please. Yeah, please unmute yourself. Yes, my question is to uh, Professor Arora. Uh, like, so you said that uh, the vi uh, viruses per se are not oncogenic. So even in hepatitis B, the real increased risk of HCC really comes in when there is ongoing liver inflammation. But in the from a clinical setting, both age and the viral load per se are the, are the most important risk factors for, are important risk factors for HCC development. Uh, you know, uh, uh, particularly in a non serotic patient. From that angle, what is your opinion on treating all immunotolerant patients or what we would now be calling CH, uh, CHB infection patients? You know, uh, at least after a certain age, maybe after the age of 45 years or 40 years, to decrease the risk of HCC development per se. Uh, and Dr. Arka, if you remember, I think I'm the biggest uh, proponent, Ajay, is smiling. Yeah. of treating everybody because we have nothing else to do. In fact, in the last APDW debate also, I strongly was for it. But the problem is twofold. You see, the currently available medication, if you look at the life cycle of hepatitis B, you are acting at the far end of the cycle. The whole elephant has gone away. You are just catching the tail. Virus has attached to the... See, what is happening in COVID-19? You are stopping the entry of the virus at ES2 receptor. Whereas in hepatitis B, you're doing nothing. You're not stopping the entry at NTPC. You're not letting the virus uncoupled. You're not letting uh, stopping it from entering into the nucleus and integrating, then producing pre-genomic RNA. You're acting at the fag end where you're just, just undoing the uh, 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 reverse transcriptase mechanism. So how will it ever be cured? I think we have missed the bus by the time we are treating it. The only thing that can do is by decreasing the replenishment of the viral load again to the CCC DNA, you're trying to decrease the incidence. But the problem is by the time you start giving antiviral therapy, virus has already got integrated. That is number one. Secondly, the, the moment it has got integrated and there is a CCC DNA, there is nothing which works at the moment. So even though I am proponent for giving antiviral therapy, but we should know the limitation. So the best answer today is only 10% of the patient in the world know there is a hepatitis B in their blood. And of those with guidelines repeatedly published by Ajay, only 8% are uh, eligible for treatment. That is the biggest problem in hepatitis. So unless you vaccinate everybody, unless you increase awareness, we are going to live with HCC related to hepatitis B. Yes, Dr. Manas, please go ahead. So, uh, uh, excellent presentation, sir. Congratulations. Uh, Professor Anil sir and uh, Professor Francis. So uh, my two questions are there. So one question is hepatitis B and NFLD. Both are uh, both can cause hepatocellular carcinoma without going into cirrhosis. So uh, we have excellently seen your pathogenesis uh, top uh, slides and all those things. Sir. So can we find some population, subpopulation in this uh, 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 NFLD and also hepatitis B, where we can say that this subpopulation is going to develop SCC and we can uh, give some chemo prevention or something treatment to them so that we can innovate that. That is first question. And second question, sir, uh, to Dr. Uh, Professor Dufa. So 
you have excellently uh, shown in your slide the uh, insulin growth factor receptor that is a uh, uh, insulin resistance is a factor which causes hepatocellular carcinoma and insulin as such is causing increasing the hepatocellular carcinoma so all those cirrhotic patient who are the most major risk factor for scc so are you suggesting we uh, we give them oha or some other drugs not on insulin or something like that sir so this is my two question thank you uh, dr dufar you want to uh, respond first go ahead then i will answer yeah okay Please, thank you yeah you see your first question manoj very relevant and pertinent question is in the absence of cirrhosis what causes uh, the two uh, you know double whammy of nfld with hepatitis b in the absence of cirrhosis that is your question now as i said i in the beginning that virus per se is not oncogenic if it was to cause cancer then it will not for wait for 40 years to develop cancer so it integrates at multiple points in the human genome at scattered areas it is only when there is a lump of collection at a particular point which need not be on to the tumor suppressor gene it can be in the vicinity of that and then somewhere down the lane you have a selection of the monoclonality which causes hcc so it is a single monoclonal tumor which will produce hcc not a dysplastic nodule which will produce it and then as dr jayanti very rightly said in patient in whom we say that nfld in the absence of cirrhosis has called hcc we have not looked for occult hbv infection in fact if you look at the data in occult hbv infection the risk is as much as with the overt hbv because you have a virus which is integrated the only difference between inflammatory hcc hbv related liver disease versus integrated disease there are two processes which are occurring simultaneously i have shown very clearly so it is possible that in sub group of the patient with nfld if you look for occult hbv you may find some answers and that may be one of the reasons they have higher risk i have a question from prof also uh, before he answers you mentioned several mechanisms of pathogenesis for nash related uh, hcc can you prioritize some of them well that's a good question abraham it's a very good question uh, we should be able to prioritize them in the future because i believe that when you live with a negative definition as nash you have a heterogeneity of the disease and so we should be able to subclass this nash patients in a better way uh for their risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma or even before that to treat them with more specific drugs so yes that would be very important and in the nash in the hcc the same thing to understand which are the most important uh signaling pathways so far we are not at this level and the problem with hcc um if you begin to biopsy them there's a heterogeneity of the cancer itself that's we we really uh be well demonstrated so probably liquid biopsy looking at circulating ck dna you know might would be helpful in this situation regarding the previous questions so first uh trying to identify patients with a national nephrology to develop hepatocellular carcinoma in the context of hepatitis b you have the page or very helpful recommended by easel for nash we are missing a kind of the score incorporating the most important feature you know which make a patient at risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma a validated score obviously you will take into account diabetes you will take into account age gender obesity i think which need also to take into account in such a score uh, uh genes you know pnpla3 increase the risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma there is a nice paper from the group of quantin and the showing that patients who don't have this polymorphism in PNPLA3 have a low risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma and don't need actually if they are not cirrhotic to be put in a surveillance program. So this might be quite relevant and helpful. Once our insulin, well, okay, this is a good point. Um, I think we have now in pre-cirrhotic patients, many drugs we can use, which are 
even probably better than insulin. But as she mentioned, the GLP-1 uh, uh, drugs, you know, semaglutide, liraglutide, patients lose weight, you would treat also the NASH, you have a new some New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, yes, these are wonderful drugs for the, for the liver, and we should use them more. And probably the place of insulin will decrease. Now, in steroidic patients with severe insulin, uh, it's more difficult here. Uh, we don't have so much data with these drugs, and there's a tendency to use insulin. There's a reason I said that might be a marker of the severity of the, of the clinical situation to use insulin. I don't say that insulin itself leads to hepatocellular carcinoma. But still, um, if I can avoid insulin, I try not to use it. Uh, Professor Dufour, I much. think uh, very uh, well answered. I think before I go to Dr. Arka and Dr. Sunil, they have raised their hands. Just a quick question, you know, the burning topic or the burning subject in the NASH-driven HCC today would be the higher occurrence of HCC in a non serotic setting. You know, even within NASH, we know most of them would have underlying cirrhosis, but in comparison to virus-associated HCC, more of HCC would happen in a non serotic Say maybe if it is 10, 15% in virus, it would be 25, 30% in NASH. So the question again is, I think that, I mean, let's not go into the implications of surveillance and lots of other things in that, but is it the fat which is the culprit, steatosis per se, which is so closely linked to insulin resistance and the molecular mechanisms which you have shown? So it is the fat and, it, and the inflammation and fibrosis is probably not playing major role in the pathogenesis in the non serotic setting. Mama, just a quick question on that. And then we have uh, two more questions for you. This is an excellent question. I wish I would have the answer. I don't have it. Uh, uh, if the fat is playing a role, it's very likely that you have some fatty factors here playing a role. If you look at the publication from uh, Joseph Lovett in hepatology this year, they are looking at the um, field effect, and they compare the serotic with non serotics and they found that actually, as expected in the serotic liver, you have a field effect uh, favoring the development of cancer based on their previous uh, publications. And actually, in the uh, non serotic liver with hepatocellular carcinoma, they found already uh, the same features. So there are changes in these livers which are already uh, favoring the development of hepatocellular like carcinoma. Okay, but uh, Dr. Arka. Ajay, Ajay, can I just please. say? Yeah, please uh, go ahead. The majority of those with NFLD presenting with HCs in the absence of cirrhosis have an underlying NASH. So you cannot discount the contribution of the inflammation in form of NASH. So you just cannot have a bland liver and HCC. Majority of them have as NASH in the absence of cirrhosis. If you look at the histopathology, yes. you may, they may have F2, F3, or F4 without cirrhosis. But, but then F, F0 is also have been reported to have, you know, HCC in NASH. In component of inflammation cannot be discounted. Okay, Dr. Arka, please. So my, my point is exactly along the same lines as, uh, um, as Professor Arura. Basically, like, just like you were saying, the severity of steatosis could have an impact. Is it is the is the severity of steatohepatitis playing a role in the sense if if we, I mean if you look at the NASH CRN scores is, are the scores higher in patients who are developing HCC in the absence of cirrhosis and count, counterintuitively also patients that who at any point of time are having NASH are those patients who are having a higher level of you know ballooning or lobular inflammation are they are at a higher risk of developing HCC in the in the future in longitudinal studies. Okay, I think uh, before we wrap up, maybe Dr. Sunil. Sir, uh, this is a question for Professor Dufus. So a very interesting talk. Uh, is it important to differentiate between type 2 diabetes mellitus and hepatogenous diabetes as a risk factor for HCC? Because, you know, hepatogenous diabetes will obviously be of short duration as compared to type 2 diabetes mellitus. And are they having different implications on HCC? You mean type 1 and type 2? That's the question. Type 2 diabetes okay. and hepatogenous diabetes, which happens after development of cirrhosis. Oh, okay, okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see your point. Um, <laughs> this is a good question. I, I don't think I can very, uh, I can present 
clear papers and good data on this point. But certainly, um, well, certainly patients with a diabetes due to the cirrhosis, uh, because they are very advanced in their disease, have higher risk to develop prejudice carcinoma. This is just a clinical context because they have a more advanced cirrhosis. I'm not sure we can here differentiate the contribution of the diabetes per se. We know that I should mention these papers, that two diabetes is really a risk factor for hypertensive carcinoma. To say that the cirrhotics we develop uh, uh, diabetes because they have a fat advanced uh, cirrhosis, uh, higher risk to develop hypertensive carcinoma, yes, probably, but uh, due to the due to because the cirrhosis is worse. So I don't think you can separate here really the effect of the diabetes, but it's possible. It's a good question, but I don't have data to support an answer here. Maybe I think we've run out of time, so uh, maybe Dr. Koshi, if you have any point to make, otherwise Dr. Arka, I'll request you to wrap it up. Dr. Koshi, any... No, thank you. It's, uh, both were excellent talks, very good discussions, kept to time. Very good. Congratulations and thank you. Dr. Arka, you can please uh, thank and wrap it up. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Aurora and Professor Dufour uh, and uh, 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 Professor uh, Koshi. Uh, I think uh, uh, we can move on uh, to the next session on the clinical issues. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, maybe right. we can request Dr. Madhumitra to please uh, invite the next chairpersons for the next session. Yeah. For the next session, we are going to have the proud privilege of inviting Professor Carl, who is the uh, former <laughs> professor of medicine. <laughs> Currently, the yeah. head of the department. Welcome, sir. And also, Professor Manoj Kumar, who is now the head of the Department of Hepatology at ILPS New Delhi. Welcome to both of you, our chairs, for the next session, which will be clinical issues in hepatocellular carcinoma. Yeah, it's Madam uh, Mita, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite the panelists for the next session, Dr. Prasun Jalal. Dr. Saroj Kumar Sina, Dr. Umesh Goel, Dr. Tarana Gupta, and Dr. Akash Roy. Now, it's my privilege to invite Professor Dr. P. N. Rao, who is the Director and Chief of Hepatology of the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad, and is also the current president of the Indian National Association for the Study of Liver, delivered his talk on hepatocellular carcinoma without cirrhosis, the magnitude of the problem, the clinical characteristics, and its relevance in clinical practice. Dr. Rao, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaur. Uh, am I audible, please? Uh, yes, sir, you're audible. Your audible, there's some echo there. I think maybe the technical team can check that. Uh, I don't have any other parallel instrument here. Uh, am I, uh, yes, is it okay now? Yeah, 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 thank you very much. And uh, Ajay has act actually put me into trouble by giving this topic, you know, and think by what has gone uh, just now before the discussion. But this talk appears to be very, very important and relevant considering that the growing occurrence of an ancillotic uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and the lack of a guidelines and lack of a clear understanding in the, especially the pathogenesis. And uh, as we see here that I am restricting to the non serotic uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, but we're not going to the details of the other things which have been mentioned on the right side, that is the fibrolamellar and the other causes. And here we have to differentiate between what is a non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma. A is the liver is absolutely normal before and they develop the cancers. And another is non serotic that means even F3 fibrosis, which is not yet uh, 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 happened in cirrhosis, just like what happens in hepatitis B and then HCV, and even non alcoholic fatty liver disease, also the fibrosis being an independent factor for hepatocellular carcinoma. The other aspect of the intra, uh, the, the cholangial carcinoma will be dealt with later by Dr. Akash. Uh, Dr. Duceza has already excellently has gone through what is the proportion of the non serotic heptomas in our country, and then starting with the, the WHO, which puts into about 20%, uh, 
and also in uh, <clears throat> 30 to 40 percent. And the proportion of the patients who have a non-serotic hepatocellular carcinoma uh, is usually around 10, you can say that 20 to 30 percent here. Uh, this is a global um, uh, <clears throat> information, but unfortunately, our data is not depicted here. And also, we already alluded to the definitions between the cryptogenic and the NASH, and that creates a little bit of confusion into uh, which of them are really cryptogenic. As you can see here, the cryptogenic key is about nearly 40%. Whereas in NASH, the, the data, this, this is the recent you know, 2019 uh, publication. But then what is the clinical phenotypic characteristics here? They usually generally present an advanced phase and the surveillance is not performed in an ancillotic liver. And they are, as such, you know, they are clinically silent in early stages because there's a lack of symptoms and then surveillance staging. But fortunately, because the rest of the liver has got a good hepatic serve, uh, reserve, unlike in the conventional serotic uh, uh, HCCs, and there is a chance for the resection in this population. And uh, as I told just now, that the F3 fibrosis in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hepatitis B, hepatitis C infections, are associated with the high risk of developing uh, HCC. And this is where we have to differentiate uh, just simply we say that it is a non serotic but there is an advanced fibrosis is already uh, existing there. And also we know that differentiation between at this point of a time and advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, even with the excellent or whatever the biomarkers or non-invasive biomarkers or imaging biomarkers which we have, at least 20 to 30 percent, they fail to uh, really categorize uh, this kind of a population about the um, cirrhosis. And uh, the HBV and the non serotic uh, hepatocellular carcinogenesis, the, uh, Dr. Anil Arora has excellently discussed about the pathogenesis here. And these people are usually younger and there's a strong family history and the genotype <clears throat> C rather than the B, I'm sorry about it. And uh, the base, basal promoter mutations, you know, which has been mentioned. Other risk factors, of course, there is a co-infection, alcohol abuse, and then other cryptogenic etiologies also play a role. Uh, but having said that, we had an excellent discussion just now about what really causes, what, what are the factors which drive them into non serotic hepatoma are still not very clear, but at least in hepatitis B, we know that the integration appears quite early and uh, the going by the hepatocellular carcinomas in, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where the very, very children they get into hepatocellular carcinoma, we know that at this point of the time, those who have got a strong family history and those vertical transmission are who developed in very early in their childhood, they're very prone for uh, HCCs uh, without uh, any cirrhosis of it. And in a non serotic setting, the, there are so many genetic alterations which uh, uh, Dr. Anil has uh, uh, eroded to that about the insertional mutagenesis, chromosomal instability, and the mutant HBV protein formation. But still, we are still not clear what really drives them without having any cirrhosis. At least in HBV, there is some answer, but in NFLD and HCV, we don't have a clear answer to know how. The other um, that Anilora has explained that inflammation and fibrosis are the factors you know, where they're going to HCC bypassing the serotic stage. Whether some other independent factors like a diabetes and then obesity also uh, play a part in this is still not very clear. But the uh, incidence of uh, non-serotic hepatocellular carcinoma ranges up from 4.4 to 10 point. And the risk factors are the male gender, advanced age, persistently elevated transaminases, high GCT, hepatic steatosis, and other cofactors like diabetes and alcohol abuse. Of course, these diabetes, alcohol, and obesity come into the picture of a progression to both in the hepatocellular carcinoma and the, the uh, in fact, the cirrhosis, they come into factor and then mutually into every etiology, whether it's the hepatitis B or hepatitis C, or whether it's an alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
and we've been discussing about the uh, what is the position of a diabetes and hepatocellular carcinoma and this is decode study which clearly says that there is a, a vertical linear relationship of uh, the risk of uh, malignancies uh, car hepatocellular carcinoma or in general any carcinoma from pre diabetes newly diagnosed diabetes and the known diabetes as you can see here both in the men and the women men more frequently as compared to the women that as the status increases there is a hazard ratio also increases and uh, you can see suppose if someone has doesn't have a diabetes and he is no overweight it is taken as a reference standard those who have gotten only overweight but not a diabetes as uh, dr elsarag has already alluded to only obesity as an independent risk factor this still is not very clear but even if it is there it is it appears to be only very small about 1.13 and if someone has a diabetes and then definitely the uh, the odds ratio or hazard ratio is about 4.38 and if someone is both the diabetes and also obesity is present that is the more highest risk and uh, this can say that liver is at the maximum risk here about 2.5 as compared to the uh, other organs in the body and the various uh, pathogenic mechanisms have been proposed um, at the development of hepatocellular carcinoma in uh, uh, nafld and then nash but more and more the intestinal microbiota dysregulation are coming to the picture and we'll have uh, some slides on this you know, in, in a little bit more time and we know that the primary bile acids are gaining more and more importance in nowadays with the for the hepatocellular carcinoma and inflammation and hepatocellular carcinoma in both the alka in serotic and the non serotics and this is a, just a simple uh, over simplification but this will give us the more concept about this that is liver uses the cholesterol for producing the bile acids and obesity and nash have been associated with the elevated serum bile acid levels and we know that the intestinal dysbiosis has been related to the development and the progression of uh, liver disease but do we have any evidence for this you know let's see now and this is one of the recent papers you know which has shown you know, that is nash related increase in the plasma bile acid levels depend upon the insulin resistance we know that the plasma bile acid concentrations are higher in the nash compared to the no nash patient both in the diabetics and also in the non diabetic patients and the plasma bile acid concentrations are elevated only in those nash patients who are exhibiting the pronounced insulin resistance limiting their ability as nash marker this is about the elevation of plasma bile acids in people who have a nash and then what is the relationship between the microbiota diversity and the bile acid signaling in the serotic and the non serotic uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and this is again a recent paper uh, which they have investigated the 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 bile acid metabolism and the the microbiota together and they have come up with the fgf for the fiber growth factor 19 levels were associated with Uh, in independent of a liver fibrosis you know these people can go on to hepatocellular carcinoma but still this is only a small hypothesis but still we have a lot to go as to how uh, these people go on to hepatocellular carcinoma uh, escaping the serotic stage and when it comes to the diagnosis of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in these people as we know that the sensitivity of the alpha beta protein even in established serotics with the serotic hcc is is only 60 to 84% that means about at least 20 to 30% of the serotic hccs will have a normal uh, alpha beta protein levels and uh, the non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma it is still much less as i can see here that hardly 31 to 67 percent in various series are shown that the afp levels will be high and uh, therefore um, afp levels will still be normal in the fibrolamellar carcinoma variant of hcc which is again non serotic 
and elevated AFP levels may suggest in HCC, but normal levels should, should never be used to exclude the diagnosis, uh, especially in a patient with the high risk factors. Of course, this applies both the serotic hepatomas and the non serotic hepatomas. And uh, when it comes to PIVCA, that is the DCP, uh, it has not been adequately examined uh, in people with the non serotic patients. Even in serotic patients, this is being used mainly in the East uh, and the West. But uh, there are some indications that both put together uh, will have an increased uh, sensitivity for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma diagnosis. When it comes to the imaging, of course, you know, the, the serotic hepatocellular carcinoma will look for the evidence of cirrhosis, whereas in a non serotic, there will not be any evidence. Uh, but more than the imaging qualities, what is more important is the uh, what is the pattern? Uh, in a cirrhotic, it is a homogeneous with a irregular but a well defined margin. But if the, usually the non cirrhotic ones are the large solitary masses, at the most they will have a, some saturate nodules. But whereas the cirrhotic, as we know, that they can have a multiple masses and the extra hepatic extension is less common here. And extra hepatic extension with the direct adjacent organs is more often seen. That means if there is an usually they will have an exophytic um, um, component in, uh, in the liver and metastasis is frequently seen, vascular invasion is less common. And these characteristics are more uh, important. Sometimes you know, it's uh, sometimes very hard to differentiate between these when uh, between a cirrhotic, uh, the only thing which differentiate is presence or an absence of cirrhosis in the rest of the liver. And there are classification can only be applied in the presence of cirrhosis, and this cannot be applied in non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma population. And usually, whenever it is a large and then single, the usual differential diagnosis occurs between the adenoma, the FNH, and the non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, the only thing, the one thing which definitely uh, says is that they have in the hepatobiliary phase. And we have a no contrast retention in the CA and classically retains the contrast material in the FNH. And again, no contrast retention in non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma. There are, of course, other differences are there. And that's the reason why when you get a large SOL in the liver without uh, cirrhosis, uh, usually it is imperative to do a liver biopsy in these people for establishing the diagnosis. In contrast to the serotic uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, where we say that if there is the, the, the classical features are there, that is the enhancement, uh, arterial enhancement, and then wash out if they are there, we don't require to do the biopsy in these people. But then when it comes to treatment options in the non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma, of course, it's obviously it goes without saying that if HBV and then HCV are identified, and we all know that, you know. The, at the time of a development, at the time of starting the treatment, if the cirrhosis is already set in, and also in hepatitis C, even after the the uh, the viremia has gone, that means sustained virological response, but still we need to have in surveillance. And surgery is the mainstay treatment for non serotic um, hepatocellular carcinoma. And here one must know that we should know that the BCLC staging cannot be used for. Uh, as we are using for uh, serotic hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, mainly the tumor, uh, the, the tumor size, the elevated bilirubin level, and vascular invasion, these are the ones which will predict the prognosis in non serotic Local regional therapy, there's not much of a data, and systemic therapy, just like in uh, serotic hepatoma, these have been used. And this is a systematic review and then outcomes of a meta-analysis of risk factors and prognosis after liver resection. As I already said, resection is a major uh, way of uh, treating the non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma. And we already know that the hepatic reserves are good in these people because the rest of the liver is uh, normal. And this is a, one of the things which is available is a systematic review. And you can see uh, in the diagram here that the overall survival and then disease survival after reception have been quite uh, impressive. And at the bottom, you can see that the overall survival of a one year, three years, and then five years have been good. The disease free survival also almost to uh, five year survival is again.
And the ones which are uh, related to the poor survival are the ones here with the multiple tumors, larger tumor size, non-clear resection margin, poor tumor stain, invasion of the lymphatic vessels. Of course, it's obvious that it's not very particular to only non the, 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 in this tumor, and this is common for any, any tumor anywhere in the body also. And overall survival of uh, this one after the resection, after the surgery between the serotic and then non serotic has not been much improved, more or less the same, you know, it's not different. But surgical resection is a treatment of choice for the CC in non serotic liver, and it is considered quite safe because of the good hepatic results here. And clinical staging systems, as told already, the BCLC and then Lopuda or any other stagings are uh, not relevant in these patients. And primary tumor features are the ones which are utilized, that is uh, the size of size and for staging and then prognosis. And majority of these patients require a major hepatic resection. And these surgeries are, are uh, quite feasible because of the preserved liver function and uh, also very low perioperative mortality when compared to the serotic liver. In fact, sometimes they can have a repeated resections also if there is a recurrence provided the FLR is good and uh, the cause of the hepatic results are good. The perioperative morbidity and mortality is low when it compared to the serotic liver. And uh, as I said already, uh, impressive post-operative survival rate have been seen in the tumors who do not have other features, that is a vascular invasion, protobin thrombosis, and a lymph node involvement in the tumor. And the recurrences are associated with the poor outcomes since we don't have an effective post-operative adjoint chemo and re repeated resections are possible if adequate uh, future liver removal is available here. And when it comes to the transplant, the, uh, actually initially they were not doing the transplant, but uh, our some uh, accumulation of the data has shown that the five-year survival rate in the systematic review between the period 66 to 88 and uh, were dismal, that is 11.2 for HCC and for FLC variant is slightly better. But uh, there's an extensive data is available from the European liver transplant registry and analysis of the literature that the median tumor size of eight centimeters, five-year survival has been quite good of the recent data, maybe because of improvement in the surgical techniques and the early identification in about 50 to 70 percent. However, there's a 40 percent recurrence rates for lesions of the 4.8 and 78 for lesions more than eight has been reported. And because of this, there has been international consensus conference to report recommend LT liver transplant in patients when it is not resectable HCC, and in patients who experience intrahepatic after surgical resection, provided these patients do not have any vascular invasion and. But then, um, basically, uh, this uh, last slide summarizes. That is, uh, epidemiology wise, the differences between the HCC and the non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma 80%, as we already said, about 20%. And this got a bimodal age distribution peak seven and the six and then later decade. And this, the one which are uh, second, uh, the second decade must, must be some of the ones <laughs> which are hepat uh, hepatitis B. The risk factors are hepatocellular carcinoma, we already discussed, and also the same risk factors are there for non serotic but still the pathogenesis is not clear and uh, the uh, symptom wise uh, they also they come quite late because we don't have any surveillance so they're just like as what happens in cirrhosis of liver and in the diagnosis lirat classification cannot be used and um, the, the same modalities have been used for the diagnosis here and treatment that the in the uh, antiviral treatment for as usual for the hepatitis b and c and surgery remains the main treatment of modality. Systemic and local therapies or options are also increasingly used in non serotic hepatocellular carcinoma. And thank you very much. Uh, over now, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Rao, for such a nice presentation. We quickly move on to our next presenter, who is uh, Professor Akash Shukla, who is Professor and Head Department of Gastroenterology at SET GSMC and KEM Hospital, Mumbai. And he will be speaking on differentiation from HCC uh, from combined hepatocholangio and cholangiocarcinoma. Do we really need it? Professor um, Akash Shukla, please. 
good evening everybody uh, am i audible yeah yeah go ahead please uh, thank you chairperson at the outset i would like to thank uh, professor ajay duseja and uh, inazil for uh, inviting me for this uh, lovely meeting i'll be talking about uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma mixed hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma does the differentiation make a difference so the biliary tract cancers are classified into extrahepatic and intrahepatic basically based on the site of origin whether it is originating from common uh, bile duct or from the left and right or the common hepatic duct when it is called as perihilar cholangiocarcinoma or above that what is called as intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas which again have different variants it could be intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma it could be hcc uh, icc a combination or it could be a cholangiocarcinoma now it is important to understand that all these tumors in the liver they are originating from the canals of herring where these uh, stem cell niches are present which then differentiate into either cholangiocytes or hepatocytes whereas in the extrahepatic ducts they originate from the peribiliary gland which have the which are the hepatobiliary stem niches there are huge number of variations in these primary liver cancers and although primophase it becomes very uh, it becomes very uh, simple to classify them into hcc or combined hcc cca or intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma but there are huge amounts of overlap with each of them having a different variant for example your intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma could be classic intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma or that with a hepatocyte immunohistochemistry similarly you can have a combination of a uh, classical intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma with scfp uh, combining with classic hcc so what is a classic hcc cca but there are also variants like chcc clc chcc clc cca and on top of it you may also have intermediate cell carcinoma with mixed hepatocytic and cholangiocytic ihc and then each of this can again combine with hcc or classical cholangiocarcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma so huge amount of variations are actually possible and are seen in patients with primary liver cancers other than the ones which we are just going to discuss we need to understand what are the precursor lesions for these intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas they could be the intraductal papillary neoplasms of the bile duct which are very similar to the ipmns in the pancreas there may be biliary epithelial neoplasia which is very similar to the uh, adenoma carcinoma sequence which you see in the colon you may have mucinous cystic neoplasms and you may have intraductal tubular papillary cystic neoplasms so these are usually the precursor lesions for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma now what are the differences between the three groups the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas mixed and in terms of epidemiology and the expected outcomes the hcc we know is the commonest around 10 per 100000 followed by intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma which is around 1 per 100000 and mixed hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma which is less than 0.1 per 100000 the male preponderance is much more in hcc 3 is to 1 followed by mixed which is 1.9 is to 1 followed by intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma which is 1.4 is to 1 hcc we know is far more common in the east asia and sub saharan africa because of hepatitis b intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma because of the liver flukes is far more common in the southeast asia the expected 5 year survival is the highest with hcc almost 19% 8% with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and similar with mixed hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma while viral hepatitis and cirrhosis it is posed to all three uh, groups of prim primary liver cancers there are specific predisposing factors we know that in addition to cirrhosis we just discussed nafl nash can co predispose to hcc similarly psp and liver predispose to intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma now even when we look at intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma it is not a homogeneous group there is a subclassification for that as well 
depending on whether it is originating from the large intrahepatic bile ducts, which are the segmental ducts and its primary branches, or the small intrahepatic bile ducts, which are the interlobular ducts and smaller. This is important because the small intrahepatic bile ducts tend to be uh, tend to have mass forming cholangiocarcinomas, whereas the large intrahepatic bile ducts usually have either periductal or interductal uh, tumors. So the periductal ones are the ones which infiltrate and the introductal ones are the ones which grow rapidly into the lumen. So the large duct type which arise in the large ducts have uh, 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 infiltrative or a intraluminal growth pattern. They are large size tubular or SNR elements and have a luminal spread and wall invasion. And they are usually pass positive. Whereas the small duct type, they are derived from the interlobular and septal bile ducts and they basically show the mass formation growth pattern. On histopathology, HE staining, they have small size tubular or SNR elements which are usually larger than the normal interlobular and septal bile duct and they are passed negative. For want of time, I won't go into the details of the histology of other patterns, but suffices to say that in the mixed HCC CCA, you'll get the morphology of both hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma in the same mass lesion. Is there a genetic basis for this heterogeneity? The answer is yes. The large duct type intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas have a high frequency of mutations of the general oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes like the KRAS mutations and the TP53 and they lack the IDH1 and 2 mutations and the FGFR2 mutations. Microsatellite instability is seen in up to 30% of patients with uh, cholangiocarcinoma, particularly in the ones with liver fluke, unlike uh, the non-liver fluke associated CCA where MSI is really rare. The small duct type intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas show the IDH1-2 mutation in almost a third and FGFR2 fusions in up to one-fourth of all patients. Why this is important? It is important because you can have targeted therapies against these mutations. There are several biologicals which are available, monoclonal antibodies which are now available, which target specific genes and therefore they may be used in these patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas depending on which mutation is present. Some of them are first line, some of them are second line, and some of them are still in the phase of trials. Now, how do the clinical features and outcome compare between intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and HCC? This was a multi, uh, it, this was a UNOS database study in from the United States. Sorry, the CR18 database uh, from the United States. So when you compare the two groups, there is a significant male predisposition for HCC. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas is far more common in people above the age of 65 years as compared to HCC. And among the non-Hispanic whites, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is far more common, but actually it is that uh, uh, it's more in the non-Hispanic, non-Black population. If you look at cirrhosis, patients with uh, cirrhosis tend to have HCC, we know this. At presentation, Far more patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas have a tumor which is more than five centimeter. They tend to have higher likelihood of having a lymph node involvement and are also at higher likelihood of having metastasis and have a, having a poorly differentiated stage three or an undifferentiated stage four. And fewer patients with cholangiocarcinomas tend to undergo mm -hmm. a curative treatment because the tumor size is large poorly differentiated and often metastatic at presentation. And that is why if you look at the survival between HCC and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the survival is much better in HCC as compared to intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And the separation starts as early as within the first nine months. Across all subgroups, if you see the survival benefit uh, is, is, is better for hepatocellular carcinoma if it is picked up early. So it is interesting to see the 
heterogeneity in the outcomes when you compare HCC and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So if we compare HCCs and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas less than five centimeter size, HCC does better. But if you take more than five centimeter size, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma does better. Without lymph node involvement, they do equally, but with lymph node involvement, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma does better. In the absence of metastasis, HCC does better, but in the presence of metastasis, cholangiocarcinoma does better. In the presence of grade three and four disease, cholangiocarcinoma does better. For earlier grades, the two are almost equal. Interestingly, when you offer a curative therapy, HCCs tend to do better and cholangiocarcinoma do better with non-curative therapy. And that is basically because you have some targeted chemotherapy available for cholangiocarcinomas. How do you radiologically differentiate between HCC and other primary liver cancers? Arterial enhancement is a feature of HCC. And if at all, you see peripheral weak enhancement in cholangiocarcinomas, and you see a peripheral strong enhancement in combined HCC cholangiocarcinomas. Delayed washout is a feature of HCC. Delayed enhancement is a feature of cholangiocarcinoma. Pseudocapsule is a feature of HCC. And a reverse target appearance on hepatobiliary phase is a feature of cholangiocarcinoma. The other findings, like hepatic surface retraction, is seen far more commonly in cholangiocarcinoma and to some extent where there is a cholangio predominant cholangiohepatocellular carcinoma. Major vascular thrombosis can be seen in all three, but is most likely in combined hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma. Lymph node involvement is again a feature of cholangio. And of course, you are more likely to find cirrhosis in patients with HCC or combined HCC cholangiocarcinomas. <clears throat> now, there was a huge confusion about terminology for these combined HCC cholangiocarcinomas. And therefore, in 2018, Verant and the group came out with consensus terminology guidelines. I'll not go into the, all the guidelines, but the ones which are relevant from clinical practice point of view. The first thing is the diagnosis is on the basis of routine staining on histology. And if combinations of primary liver cancer are present, the diagnostic terminology should include whichever forms are combined, like HCCCCA, HCCCLC, CICCA, CLC, or, and so on and so forth. Some investigators recommend reporting percent of each component present but that is usually possible, not on histology, but basically if there is a resected specimen which is available. Different radiological uh, studies have reported huge variations, and this is basically because the amount of HCC or the cholangio varies in different uh, tumors. And depending on the number of patients with the predominance of whichever type is there, there is a variation in the radiological findings. The proposed terminology of primary liver cancer with both hepatocellular and cholangiocytic differentiation within the same tumor is actually combined hepatocellular carcinoma. The diagnosis of CHCC CCA relies on routine histochemical stains, and IHC is used as a supplemental diagnostic tool. The stem cell phenotypes or features may exist within this combined HCC CCA and should be noted in a descriptive report, but does not warrant a separate subclassification. There are two other types of PLC, which are intermediate cell and the cholangiolo carcinoma, and they may coexist with other tumors. Newer molecular advances are happening in this combined tumors, but the importance of the pathological confirmation of the tumor type cannot be overemphasized. The radiological findings indicate features between those of typical HCCA and ICCA, but are not specific for either, and therefore biopsy confirmation is often indicated. Radiological evidence of different components with different imaging features within a single tumor raises the as yet unanswered question of whether to biopsy each distinct region for accurate assessment of the combination. Coming to the treatment part, is there a difference in the outcomes? We know that for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, resection is considered to be the treatment of choice. Now, these are all the studies which have looked at the outcomes 
of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas after resection. The morbidity has varied between 5 to 44 percent, but I think 10 percent in this large study by Lou et al. Is, could be considered as a benchmark. The mortality is between 0.6 to 7 percent. The median survival is approximately 27 to 28 months, and the five-year survival has ranged between 11 to 40 percent, but I think around 25 percent on an average. So that is what we are looking at, the survival rate with the treatment of choice, and therefore you required better treatment of choice. Can you improve the outcomes if you add new adjuvant chemotherapy? And again, this is an option which is available to only intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and not hepatocellular carcinoma. Just like the outcomes of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma after surgery are far inferior to the resection outcomes after a resection for HCC. And with this, several studies have shown that there may be a role of new adjuvant chemotherapy in a select subgroup of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Can we offer these patients liver transplant? Because we are not doing very well with resections for these patients. So if you look at the, resection, the overall recurrence rate after transplant, almost 40% recurrence rate has been reported in this meta-analysis published last month. And if you divide this uh, recurrence rate it, for those patients with a very early intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and advanced, then it is around 20% for very early and approximately 50% for advanced intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So it is better than resection, but still far inferior to the transplant uh, recurrence, HCC recurrence rates after transplant for hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, when does this recurrence happen? It starts happening very early. So within one year also, there is a 25% recurrence, which increases to almost 30% at three years and becomes almost 50% plus at five years. And similarly, the overall survival is also affected uh, recurrence-free overall survival, which you can see in the lower graph. Now, if you look at very early, the results are better but again, significant. So 20% is the recurrence in the first year with a survival of almost 80%, which reduces to around 70% and then 60% at five years. If you look at recurrence-free survival for uh, very early, it can be as high as 85% uh, in the first year, but goes down to almost 75% and then 65% at five years. So in this subgroup of patients with very early, probably there may be some role of transplantation. Can we do transplant for patients with combined HCC cholangiocarcinomas? And these are the recurrence rates, which look worse for combined hepatocellular cholangiocarcinomas. But when you look at patients who have well differentiated HCC, CCA, the, although the numbers are very small, the patients tend to do much better with very low rates of recurrence. These are all the published series of liver transplantation for mixed HCC CCA, and they have talked of survival rates of around ranging from 16 to 66 percent, but majority have been around 40 percent survival at five years, which does not uh, look very promising. But remember, most of these had looked at patients at, at, of different sizes and different stages. So they were all combined here. This was a study which was published this year in April, which looked at these combined HCC, CCA liver tumors who have undergone transplantation. And when you look at the outcomes after transplantation, they were better than patients who underwent resection. Similarly, if the combined HCC uh, cholangiocarcinoma was within the Milan criteria, the outcome was comparable to those patients who were within Milan criteria for HCC, 70.1% versus 73.4% five-year overall survival. So that, this is encouraging. Now, how do local regional therapies for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas perform? Now, we are moving to 
the palliative therapy. These are not curative, except for maybe ablation. The overall survival with ablation is approximately 30 months, but it is less than 20 months with all other modalities. With EBRT, with TASE, with HAI, it becomes inferior. When you look at intra-arterial therapies, again, the pooled overall survival is around 18 months, but it is better when it is used as a first-line therapy and it improves further when you combine it with a systemic chemotherapy. So if at all uh, intra-arterial modality is being used, it should be used as first-line along with systemic chemotherapy. So which are the modalities which we use when a patient cannot undergo transplant or resection? So the treatment of choice, if it is feasible, is ablation, depending on the size. If that is not possible, then the next in line will be EBRT for if there is no resection or ablation possible, CERT, TASE, or HAI if it is chemorefractory, and CERT, TASE, HAI as first line with systemic chemotherapy. Only CERT, TASE, and HAI uh, should not be used for these patients. So what are the take-home messages? There's a significant heterogeneity which exists between PLCs, including genetic and targeted therapy. The radiological and histological features are important to differentiate various primary liver cancers. Resection is the conventional treatment of choice for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, but has high recurrence rates. Recurrence after transplant is higher and survival poorer for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma than HCC, although there may be a subgroup of patients with very early who will do better than larger intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. New adjuvant chemotherapy may play an important role in the management of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. The HCC CCA combined has varied morphology, clinical presentation, and treatment approaches. Low grade, well to moderately differentiated HCC CCAs have excellent survival with a low risk of post-transplant recurrence and should not be excluded from liver transplant. And improved pre-transplant identification of pathological characteristics in combined HCC CCA may allow for successful utilization of liver transplant in this subset of patients. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Professor Shukla. Now, at this stage, I would like to uh, bring in our panelists for comments and questions to the speakers. And uh, let me start with Dr. Prasoon Jalal, who is Assistant Professor of Surgery at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas, USA. Professor Jalal. Hi, uh, it's an outstanding presentation and thanks for inviting me. My question to Dr. Shukla, um, you know, the biggest challenge we always face is to make the diagnosis uh, between typical HCC versus others, like cholangio or mixed tumor. Uh, we depend on radiology, and if radiology is not reliable, then we go for biopsy. And again, that's kind of hit and miss. Do you know any role for any biomarkers to distinguish between these three? And second question is, uh, we, we understand the difficulty in transplanting these patients, but uh, I know that you guys do more uh, LDLT. What's the data on LDLT on these mixed or uh, interpretic lunge you see? Uh, thank you very much. I think both very relevant questions. And as very uh, appropriately, you raised the point of biomarkers. Uh, biomarkers for uh, cholangiocarcinoma is, uh, is basically CA99, which we use very frequently. So whenever we have any atypical features on radiology, we would do uh, before transplant uh, biomarkers for, uh, for cholangiocarcinoma. And similarly, if there are atypical features for uh, cholangiocarcinoma, we would rely on, uh, on al alpha fetoprotein and PIVCA. But I think, uh, again, these, because these, there are so many other variables and the sensitivity of these biomarkers is of, of, of at least the HCC biomarkers is so low, uh, you would uh, almost <coughs> all depend on, on a biopsy. And again, uh, targeting uh, on, in a biopsy is challenging, especially if it is a combined hepatocellular uh, cholangiocarcinoma. And, and I agree with you. And there is no consensus, like I told in my talk, whether you should target two different parts if it is substantially large. 
But I think it is usually in a multidisciplinary team meeting where we are all sitting together and putting our brains. That is where we decide uh, what it is likely to be. And uh, by, by and large, I think uh, you are able to make the diagnosis with quite some surety. Coming to your second part, I think there are at least three recent studies which have talk, talked about uh, mm -hmm. living donor liver transplantation for patients with, uh, uh, with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. And uh, they were actually included in the meta-analysis which I presented. And uh, the results are very similar to the ones which were incidental and uh, with almost 30% uh, five-year survival rate. So again, this is a matter for, uh, for debate whether you would offer or you would not offer. And I think it will depend on the individual center's policy for the same. Well, and now I would request Professor Sinha for a few comments and questions, if any. Uh, He's a professor and head at PGI Chandigarh. Uh, I will like to uh, uh, hear from Dr. Rakas on the same lines on the workup. <clears throat> In a common garden variety case where there is a uh, uh, issue of distinction between uh, cholangiocellular carcinoma and HCC, what will you consider optimum workup? Mutations you will go for in all patients or only for the purpose of uh, selecting the monoclonal antibodies. So what should be the optimum workup for in uh, these patients? Routine histochemistry will do or we, we should go something uh, beyond that. Thank you, Professor Sin. I think a very <laughs> relevant question. Uh, this is actually a dilemma which we face uh, quite often when we are managing these patients. Uh, the minimum uh, workup that we send is, is, is a routine staining, which is sufficient to diagnose a mixed hepatocholangiocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue comes if it is an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, then you would ask typically for uh, biomarkers, uh, sorry, immunostochemistry, if you're looking at a specific therapy to be offered and the patient is non resectable Usually, if you have diagnosed intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma without a biopsy, radiologically and you're planning a resection, then of course the whole resected specimen goes and then uh, the, the histopath team will actually do immunostochemistry for everything because uh, in, in future you may require a second line therapy. Uh, similarly, if you're not offering surgery and you've done a biopsy, then you end up doing immunostochemistry. So indirectly, if you see, if you have resected, then the whole tumor has undergone immunostochemistry and if you're doing a biopsy because you think the patient is inoperable uh, is non-resectable then also you end up doing a immunostochemistry so eventually all the patients at some point of time will undergo immunostochemistry depending on whether you're resecting in which case it will be afterwards or if you're not resecting it will be before akash is there any role for stem cell the liquid biopsy in these people so the studies are going on uh, liquid biopsies uh, are being done i am aware of at least one study from ilbs uh, which uh, looked at it. I think it was presented at ASLD last year, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Manoj. I think you yeah, should yeah. be able to uh, tell about it. That's I, re I remember I, I was present when it was being presented last year or last, last year maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, but the sensitivity is very less actually. Sensitivity is not good. Okay. So let's move on to uh, Dr. Umesh Goel, Professor, Department of Gastroenterology, DMC Ludhiana. Your comments or questions, sir? Good evening, everyone. Uh, both the talks were very excellent, and I think most of the questions uh, have been answered. Still, I would like to ask again, Dr. Akash, regarding the clinical presentation, uh, and is there any real difference between the presentation as far as the physiology <clears throat> and the etiology, basic etiology is concerned? So, are there any clinical indicators which in, by which we can suspect such a thing? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Omesh. I think uh, in our setup, uh, one of the things which we should always uh, look for is if it is a non-serotic uh, HCC, you would always look for, uh, if it is not the classical HCC on radiology, biopsy is what is actually uh, indicated, uh, like Dr. Rao also discussed. And you would always look for features of cholangiocarcinoma in that biopsy. Uh, Similarly, if you are having a patient with uh, cirrhosis where you do not see the classical enhancement, if you're not seeing the classical washout, if you see peripheral thick enhancement, you would think whether you're dealing with uh, uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And sometimes you'll see patchy areas of enhancement uh, on radiology. And that is where, again, you suspect whether it is really necrosis. So if you have a 7-centimeter, 10-centimeter tumor, you can expect areas of necrosis which are not taking up. 
but if you have a 3 cm tumor and 50% is lighting up and 50% is not enhancing at all, then you would suspect, okay, this is probably a, a mixed lesion. Similarly, if you see capsule retraction in somebody uh, in a lesion which is enhancing and, uh, and showing washout, but there's also capsule retraction, then you would immediately suspect, okay, you may be dealing with a, uh, a, a mixed lesion or a, uh, uh, and, and therefore you'll, you'll probably keep that in mind before you offer the therapy to the patient. And uh, again, viral hepatitis, we know is associated with rapid angiocarcinoma. There is not so much of a strong data which so Nash get. Although there is the beginning of the case with report, Nash we have not started a bearing with Nash. Well. Of the case report, we have not started a bearing with Nash. Uh, well. Seems to be an echo from somewhere. I'll just pull up here, Manoj sir. There's a question in the chat box. It comes from. At present time, 25% of the global population has NAFLD. How do we perform surveillance in these patients? So this question will go to Professor Rao. How do we perform surveillance for patients uh, with cirrhosis and without cirrhosis in NAFLD? What would your recommendations be vis-a-vis -vis the Indian population? No, of course, with the cirrhosis, we have already the guidelines which are existing in there. And there, of course, there is a surveillance. And then I feel that in our population with the hepatitis B, we should have a more stricter uh, surveillance than what is recommended in the ASLD, you know, once in six months. That's not possible. Uh, I call it as a rogue virus. So it has fooled every physician at some point or other. Just seen about two months before, perfectly all right. Now he comes with a very big tumor, right? Uh, for uh, people with the non uh, cirrhotic, I don't think we, we have got a, any kind of a surveillance in these people. Except that those who have got, because almost all, whether it's a C or a B or a non the uh, NAFLD, the risk factors of the two, that is diabetes and then obesity. As already discussed, diabetes, obesity alone is not a major factor, alone, without any other thing. So you don't have to do any kind of a surveillance for them. It is hardly one or even that El Sarag has said, some of the studies have shown that the lesser incidence of these obese people. So in the other two, where the diabetes and obesity are persisting together, and we know that the Indian Diabetic Association, the American Diabetic Association has said that every diabetic has to undergo an ultrasound. And therefore, LFT, and these are the risk factors which are there. There we have to be cautious. Ultimately, when it comes to a government, what is the treatment? Again, life. Control your diabetes, control your diet. Only the reduce your diet. So it's not possible to have a linear surveillance in these people. The surveillance will not be cost effective in the yeah, in the in, as a public health intervention. So we cannot offer it. I hope that answers the question. Sir, there's one more question in the chat mm -hmm. box. So are all primary liver cancers prone to develop in hepatitis B virus, C virus, or only HCC? So what is the uh, pathogenesis of the uh, you know the viral insult or the metabolic insult to carcinogenesis, and why does the differentiation go down the HCC line, the hepatocholangio line? So this question to Professor Shukla, and then back over to you, sir, Dr. Manoj. Yeah, so uh, I think again, uh, I, we just discussed this briefly, that we there's a far higher predisposition for uh, HCC with uh, HBV and uh, HCC, HCV, but also all other primary liver cancers can form in the presence of HBV and HCV. And uh, we really still don't know uh, which is the, uh, the cause which, uh, which basically diverts the proliferation into different directions. I think that is still under uh, research, although there are pathways which are considered as potential pathways which may determine. But as of now, I think we are not uh, confident enough of knowing what <laughs> is the exact trigger. With NASH, I think we still have uh, far more, both NASH as well as alcohol, there's far more uh, data available with uh, HCC, and there are very, very few uh, case reports of, uh, of other PLCs in the presence of alcohol and NASH. But like I said, I think with NASH, it's only a matter of time before we start seeing these as well. So that is what I would predict for the future. But as of now, I think that is uh, something which is uh, less. Only thing, majority of the people, yeah. sorry, majority of these... Uh, Anger people, you know, with the HCC, even when we see the uh, anger of the person, the more the chances of is going to be non cirrhotic uh, simply because they don't have enough of time to develop the cirrhosis of liver. Right. In the South Africa, right. you know, the Sub Saharan South Africa, 10 years, 12 years old, you know, that 
only place where uh, there is some kind of integration and the, which we already discussed. Otherwise, uh, it is still not known, you know, which pathways we, which we take. And younger people are having NAFLD, so. Yeah. So uh, let me now bring in Professor Tarana Gupta for her comments and questions. She is a professor at Department of Hepatology at PGIMS Rotak. Professor Tarana. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, both the speakers for their excellent talk. My question is to Dr. P. N. Rao. Uh, sir, as you have told, the ultrasound screening can be done in these patients, but most of these patients who are very obese may have very poor uh, ultrasound window. So, is there any role for coming up of non contrast MRI in these patients for screening uh, for SCC? Uh, especially in patients who are very obese, diabetic, and uh, maybe at high risk for SCC. And then at, after how many years of diabetes, you would say that it is reasonable to conduct screening for SCC? Uh, for the diabetics, of course, you know, we don't have any kind of a, I don't think there is any data that after a typical, after some time, you know, you have to go for uh, surveillance or uh, any kind of surveillance. In diabetics, we don't have any surveillance for HCC as such. We have it only after the development of cirrhosis, we got a irrespective of the cause, we got a surveillance feature. So, and the other one, which you said, they are not clear because voice was not coming properly. Abbreviated MRI for screening of diabetic population or obese that, population, sorry. Uh, obese po population for looking for that one is... Uh, a good ultrasound is a quite good for initially for suspecting. After that, you know, it depends upon the other features, whether you have to go for the CT or an MRI. And the non contrast MRI doesn't have any special advantage over the CT or an MRI. Yeah, there is some echo. Uh, okay, so um, my, I would invite Dr. Akash Roy for last few questions. Um. Uh, good evening to everybody. I think we are already out of time. Yeah. So I'll just ask one, one practical question to Akash, sir. Uh, sometimes we have got these hepatocholangiocarcinomas, which we get either on biopsy or plus imaging findings. They are not transplantable and we take them up for either TACE or a systemic therapy. So what is your experience about the response to TACE and the assessment of the response in such cases? Because the primary tumors are not something which we very classically see like HCCs. So how do we follow up? for them when we offer them an intervention like this? Uh, excellent question, uh, Dr. Akash. I think uh, uh, like if you're offering a systemic therapy, uh, a radiological intervention, first of all, I think only radiological intervention is by and large not sufficient for these patients. And it should always, almost always try to combine it with the systemic therapy. And uh, unfortunately, your uh, HCC response criteria is no longer uh, valid for this or the M-resist or 1.1. Is not valid, so you are actually looking at the shrinkage of the tumor uh, for as the response. And uh, very often, actually, you you will not find a shrinkage of the tumor, but it's only the CA99 which will go down, and then these patients actually tend to do well. So I think what I have, we have been doing is once you have achieved a significant reduction in the tumor size, and uh, if you if the CA99 is normal, very often on follow up you find that it is. Uh, if the size starts increasing again, that is when you suspect a recurrence. Or if the CA99 starts increasing in size, the, uh, sorry, in, uh, it starts increasing, then you'll suspect a recurrence. So those are the two things which you look. So size and CA99 is what you will follow up in these patients. So would they be candidates to add on lenvatinib or sorafenib or even now with ivozatinib coming up with cholangiocarcinoma? So would they be add on for combination therapies? Yes. So if you are having a mixed uh, type of tumor, uh, I think there is every reason to target uh, both the components rather than targeting a single component. Okay, so uh, I think we have already overshot our time and uh, I would like to close this session by thanking our speakers, Professor Rao, Professor Shukla, <clears throat> my co-chairperson, Dr. Kar, and our panelists, uh, Professor Kaar, Jalal, Professor Sinha, and Professor Gupta, Professor Gupta, and Professor Jalal, Professor Jalal, Professor for actively participating in this session. Thank you very much. And let us move to our next session. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting session. And uh, we move on to the next session on diagnosis of HCC. And for this, I invite the chairpersons, uh, Professor Ramesh Rai, 
who is the head of uh, gastroenterology at Fortis Hospital uh, Jaipur and Professor Samir Shah, uh, who is the head of hepatology at Global Hospital uh, Mumbai. Please, sir. Good evening. Uh, very interesting talks going on as yet. And uh, it is very important that we must uh, concentrate on how do we reach to the diagnosis of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and what is the role of various diagnostic techniques which we have in hand. To elaborate on this particular point, we have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Raju Sharma, who is a professor and uh, uh, head of uh, uh, Department of Radio Diagnosis and Interventional Radiology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He is going to talk to us on the very much importance of uh, liver emerging reporting and data system, LIRADS. Has it improved the diagnosis and prognosis of HCC? So it is very important that uh, this system, which has been uh, developed over the years, has, has it reached to its zenith or it is still developing? And how we use algorithm uh, algorithmic approach for this diagnosis of HCC. So over to Dr. Raju uh, Sharma. Thank you, sir, for that uh, kind introduction. I'll just take a minute to uh, my screen. So what I hope to do over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, is talk to you about uh, LIRAD, which is a liver reporting and uh, data system, which has been developed to essentially assign category codes reflecting the relative probability of HCC in imaged liver observations. Essentially, it standardizes the nomenclature, lays down guidelines for the technique, and uh, also for reporting and interpretation. And the good part is that it was developed by an international consortium of radiologists, but inputs from hepatologists, GI surgeons, and uh, hepatopathologists as well. And the 2018 version is fully consistent and integrated with the ASLD guidelines. So what it does is it also lays down guidelines for appropriate imaging, what technique should be used, you know, how should you do the liver uh, MR or the CT, for appropriate diagnosis, and therefore it uh, reduces the inconsistencies that uh, occur between centers, it reduces the imaging variability, and also uh, promotes communication with the referring clinicians. This is the Venn diagram of the multiple stakeholders that are involved in a typical MDT kind of setting where uh, most decisions for management of HCC are. And it shows there is a felt need for having a third lexicon which all the stakeholders should be using. LIRAD talks of four different modalities, ultrasound for the sake of surveillance, multiphase CT and MR are the bread and butter of this uh, system, and contrast enhanced ultrasound, also there are guidelines, LIRAD guidelines for contrast enhanced ultrasound. All marks that have been mentioned include non-REM arterial enhancement, washout on the venous or delayed phase and capsular enhancement on delayed images, and uh, threshold growth, which has also been added in the 2018 version of uh, LIRAD. So these are the four different categories where it lays down uh, that ultrasound is essentially only for surveillance. Contrast enhanced ultrasound can be used for diagnosis, but essentially, at least in our setting, we use it more for problem solving than the findings on ultrasound and CT are equivocal. And the most important, of course, uh, categorization in codes relies on CT and MR. There's a separate category for the assessment of treatment response. The important thing to remember is where can we use LIRAD and which are the situations where we should not use LIRAD. So LIRAD is used only in those patients who have a high pre-test probability of developing an HCC, typically in patients with cirrhosis, with chronic active hepatitis B infection, also can be used in patients with current or prior HCC. So here's a liver with an irregular nodular outline. There's ascites, there are multiple nodules in the liver. And this is the kind of situation where for these observations, you can apply light. This is a T2-weighted axial MR image, which shows you this very fine, reticular, lace-like pattern of fibrosis. And again, this is a patient where you can use LIRAD to assign your degree of probability of HCC to any option that you see in the liver. The term observation 
is used instead of lesion because some of these are pseudo lesions and do not have any pathological correlate. Let's look at this patient who has an enlarged caudate lobe, a dilated caudate vein. There's a narrowing at the cavoatrial junction. So all features of bud chiari syndrome. And you have a large lesion in the left lobe of liver. Now, this is a situation where you cannot apply LIRAD. In the presence of bud chiari syndrome, LIRAD is not to be used because these patients are prone to developing multiple other kinds of nodules and therefore the predictive value of LIRAD nomenclature is not high enough. So any focal lesion developing in the background of HVOTO, LIRAD cannot be applied. Again, this is a child who, uh, a 15 year old boy who had uh, this liver lesion in the left lobe. There's a scar in the center, a T2 dark scar with some foci of calcification. This again is a situation where LIRAD cannot be used. LIRAD is not to be used in patients below 18 in cirrhosis due to vascular causes of any kind, LIRAD is not to be applied. So essentially you go from uh, LIRAD non-characterizable or non-categorizable to uh, LIRAD, which is a definite HCC. The category LIRAD non-categorizable is used when the imaging is suboptimal, the imaging is degraded for whatever reason, either the equipment was not all right or the patient didn't hold breath and you cannot categorize then you can assign the category LR non-categorizable. LR1 is a definitely benign lesion. LR2 is probably benign. LR3 has an intermediate probability of malignancy. LR4 is probably HCC. And LR5 is a definite HCC. LRM is a category assigned when the lesion looks malignant to the radiologist, not necessarily HCC. And mass forming phalangios fall in this category. Atypical HCCs fall in this category and so do the mixed cellularity tumors that were being talked about in the previous talk. Similarly, you can assign categories to assess the response of treatment, which is uh, after giving local ablative treatment like TACE or RF ablation, you can then assess your response to treatment by the enhancing component and assign categories like LRTR, non-viable, equivocal, or viable remaining after therapy. Notice that LR1 and LR2, the categories, the lesions are essentially the same, but it is the degree of confidence of the radiologist that changes the category. If the radiologist is certain that the lesion is a cyst, you assign an LR1 category, whereas if he feels that it's, a pro it's probably a cyst, you would assign an LR2 category. And I'll try and show this with uh, some examples. So this shows the stepwise characterization of uh, any observation in a uh, uh, cirrhotic liver or in a liver which is uh, prone to developing an HCC. So the LR up to LR2, you assign it based on your experience. For LR3 to LR5, there is this diagnostic table that has been laid out and we'll see some of this as we go along as well. There are some recommendations based on these categories and this is a busy slide, but essentially it shows that if LR5 is the category assigned on basis of LIRAD, the MDT head for managing HCC without any need for a biopsy. Let's look at what these features look like. This is the typical arterial phase enhancement where the lesion enhances more than the background liver. So there is this lesion in the left lobe of the liver which enhances more than the background liver. This is a multi-phase, remember you have to be looking at a multi-phase CT where there is a late arterial phase, a portal venous phase, and a delayed phase so that you can study the contrast kinetics, see the passage of contrast temporally. Notice that there is another lesion in the posterior segments of the liver in this patient where there's no enhancement. There is this typical appearance of uh, daughter cysts periphery, and this is a typical benign lesion, suggestive of a hydat and cyst, so it would be assigned an LR1 category, whereas the left lobe shows you hyper-enhancement in the arterial phase if there is venous washout in the venous phase, then you assign it a LR5. Non-peripheral washout, again, refers to washout in the center of the lesion or covering the entire or part of the lesion, but not predominantly in the periphery of the lesion. Peripheral washout is, again, a major criteria for diagnosing HCC. And the third is the presence of a capsule, which is an enhancing, as you see in this example, this is a T1-weighted post-contrast MR image showing you heterogeneous arterial enhancement. And in the delayed phase, you have this peripheral thick enhancing rim and the presence of a capsule is also taken as a major criteria. Then there are some ancillary features and permit me into going into all the details of ancillary features, 
Some of them I have shown here. If you show restricted in a patient in a liver lesion, which essentially means that on a high B value, you have a very bright lesion. That's an ancillary criteria. Presence of fat, as is seen in this other example, there is a hyper-enhancing lesion here with a centrally located, uh, peripherally located uh, fat attenuation. This is also an ancillary feature in favor of uh, HCC. Ancillary features can only be used to upgrade a lesion by one category, and cannot, the lesion cannot be upgraded up to LR5 based on ancillary feature. Let's look at some more examples. This is a typical appearance of a nodular cirrhotic liver, where you have this non-enhancing fluid attenuating lesion. You're sure this is a liver cyst, which shows no enhancement, and you categorize this as an LR1 operation. This is a different patient where you have an arterial portal shunt, and this again falls into the LR1 category. These are some more examples where the uh, patient had the chronic hepatitis B infection. You have these lesions in segment two, as well as in the caudate lobe. The caudate lobe lesion shows you this typical peripheral nodular differences enhancement, suggestive of the hemangioma. The one in the left lobe shows you flash filling, retention of contrast. These are again all typical features of. Uh, mangiomas, and these uh, can then be diagnosed as LR1 observations. Cirrhosis-associated nodules are classified as LR2 unless they start developing features which are suspicious for the development of an early HCC. So T1 dryation is, uh, you see in this background of a cirrhotic liver, these are siderotic nodules on the situated image. All of these will be categorized as LR2 nodules. This is the appearance of uh, a T-type lesion, which does not show any arterial enhancement. On the other hand, it shows you delayed phase enhancement, and this fits in best with the diagnosis. And there is capsular retention as well, fits in best with the diagnosis of hepatic fibrosis. And if uh, you're certain that's what you're dealing with based on your level of confidence on the imaging findings, this would again be categorized as an LR1 lesion. When you see enhancing soft tissue in the portal vein, you diagnose this as tumor in vein. If this tumor in vein is contiguous to an enhancing lesion, which shows you features of LR5 lesion, then you would assign the category LRTIV, definitely due to HCC. On the other hand, if you have a targetoid lesion in the liver and there is enhancing soft tissue in the portal vein, you would then say, LRTIV likely due to LRM. So based on whether the lesion is contiguous to an LR5 lesion, again, the category would change. Let's look at this uh, example where you have an arterial enhancing lesion located in the right lobe. There is extension into the right branch of the portal vein. As is seen by this filling in the right branch of the portal vein, there is enhancement within that. So again, this is tumor vein, LRTIV, which is contiguous to a LR5 lesion. So this would be LRTIV, definitely due to HCC. Let's take another example and try and assign an LR category to the LIRAD category. This is the diagnostic table that you typically use. You have a lesion which is large. It's showing it's larger than two centimeters. So it falls in uh, the category where it's uh, larger than two centimeters. There is non-rim arterial phase enhancement. There is venous washout. So this would be a definite LR5, which where no further biopsy is required, and this can be treated as an HCC. We still, of course, rely on the BCLC staging for assigning the lesions into the different management arms. Let's look at this example, a 15-year-old patient with background cirrhosis. You have this rim arterial phase enhancement. Notice this is very different from the previous examples that I showed you. This is only in the free of the lesion. There is a thick peripheral rim enhancement, there is some washout, but then in the delayed phase, there is actually retention of contrast in the central region. Lesion larger than two shows rim enhancement and shows no definite capsule, and there is some retention of contrast in the delayed phase. These are all features which are malignant features, not suggestive of HCC, and this is then assigned the category of LRM. What all is included under LRM? Mass-forming glangiocarcinomas fall into LRM, atypical HCCs and mixed HCC and cholangiocarcinoma tumors fall into the category of LRM. This is a 57-year-old male who has hepatitis B-related cirrhosis. There is this very small 
arterial enhanced adhesion, which does not show any washout. MR also did not show any washout. There was just arterial enhancement. So lesion is eight millimeters in size. It shows a non-rim arterial base enhancement. There's no washout, there's no capsule. So based on this diagnostic table, this would fall to the category of LR. Based on the categories, again, you can go down different uh, arms for uh, deciding what should be the interval for the next surveillance study and what should be the management. This is uh, the only study that I could uh, come across in the literature where they have tried to study the impact of LIRAD on prognosis. If uh, it can uh, you know, assign a prognostic sense to a lesion, they uh, studied single HCCs and retrospectively assigned a LIRAD category and then tried to see the risk the recurrence free survival and the overall survival. And they saw that surgery offered a better uh, overall survival in LIRAD 5 lesions as compared to percutaneous ablation. On the other hand, no such difference was seen in LR3 or LR4 lesions. So the impact on uh, prognosis has not really been studied in literature. The, on the other hand, the impact on diagnosis, of course, is very often. LIRAD has improved uh, the diagnosis of HCC and made it more evidence-based and made it more uniform across uh, the categories. When we study the response to treatment, we typically prefer to do it using MR because if keeping done, then the liquid oil causes problem in assessment of uh, response on CT. Here you have this peripheral rim enhancement. Peripheral rim enhancement can be seen after the local ablative therapies, and this is not taking a reference. On the other hand, if you have this kind of a nodular recurrence, nodular enhancement, uh, treatment, this is taken as a viable tumor, uh, as a poor response to the therapy that's being offered. Sometimes we rely on contrast enhanced ultrasound to try and resolve a problem which is uh, equivocal on uh, CT or MR. We saw this lesion on T2, it was T2 bright. When we gave gadolinium, we saw any, there was only peripheral rim enhancement, which was also minimum, and we were not sure what we were dealing with. And we did a contrast enhanced ultrasound we saw that there was definite arterial phase enhancement and there was washout on a contrast enhanced ultrasound. The washout shown by uh, HCC tends to be mild and uh, delayed. And therefore, therefore, we thought this was an HCC based on the contrast enhanced ultrasound. We biopsied this lesion and we have HCC. This is a slide which shows the differential diagnosis of lesions in each of the categories. And so you can make out that in LR1 and LR2, majority of the lesions are benign or are just cirrhosis and nodules, whereas as you move towards five, you have HCCs and M's are mostly uh, mass-forming phalangiocarcinomas. So people have uh, tried to assess the accuracy of IRAD in comparison with the other uh, guidelines like the ASF or NCCN, and it has been shown that IRAD has the highest sensitivity and accuracy between these guidelines for placing your uh, relative probability of uh, HCC. However, there are problems with LIRAD. It has standardized the lexicon, but it does not take into account some of the features that are being talked about in the literature, which determine prognosis. Also, LR5s, which turn out to be HCC on biopsy, are treated the same as LR5s, which are HCCs, even though the tumor biology of these categories is very different. Similarly, there are now some imaging which can predict microvascular invasion, like this rim of peripheral enhancement, adjacent lesion in the liver, and this is not given much importance in the LIRAD system, whereas this is a poor prognostic indicator. Similarly, people have shown some morphological features for CK19 positivity on HCC. Again, these are not given any importance so far in the LIRAD system. Arterial phase rim enhancement, irregular margins, and a high, a low ADC value are features for CK19 positive HCC but these are not given any significance in the LIRAD system. Similarly, we know now that if the lesion shows substantial necrosis, if more than 20% of the tumor shows necrosis on MR, that is uh, a predictor for a macro trabecular massive subtype of HCC. And these are again features which are not given importance in the current versions of HCC. This is one patient that we encountered recently where there is this arterial phase enhancement, but there is a large portion of the tumor which is showing necrosis and the AFP values were very high, which are predictive features for macrotrabecular massive HCC, which tend to have very poor prognosis, but these features are not given any importance in uh, the LIRAD system of nomenclature. 
to conclude, NIRAD should be used only in adult patients who are developing, who have a high risk of developing HCC. We need a multi-phase CT or a multi-phase MR to do this assignment. The major features that I have shown with examples are non-brim arterial phase enhancement, venous washout, presence of a capsule, and threshold growth. It is a dynamic system and continues to be evolved. As new evidence emerges, they do modify the uh, LIRAD rules, and therefore, some of the uh, drawbacks that I pointed out will hopefully get resolved in the coming future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Sharma, for an excellent overview as to how best this LIRAD system has evolved and has helped us in achieving the diagnosis and uh, the mixed patterns and all those patterns which have been described. We'll be taking up the uh, questions after that. And now we have a very important thing that the PET uh, has been used for uh, uh, diagnosis. Uh, can it be used for prognostic role in uh, HCC? And we have uh, Professor Neeraj Saraf, who is Director and Head Clinical Transplant Hepatology Vedanta Medicity Gurgaon, to enlighten us as to how it can make a its own role in the diagnosis and in prognosticating after the treatment has been provided. Dr. Neeraj, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Inazil uh, and uh, Dr. Duseja and Sunil for inviting me uh, for this talk. Uh, I must say that PET-CT is a lesser often discussed uh, topic in uh, HCC meetings. And uh, so in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll try and uh, give an overview of the current role of PET-CT in uh, HCC. So this is what I'll talk of, uh, diagnosis and FDG avidity in HCC. What is the physiological basis of uh, FDG PET scan? Uh, FDG versus fluorocholine as uh, tracers, radio tracers, a PET, the role in staging of HCC, and most importantly, the prognostic value of PET in HCC, uh, be it surgical resection, liver transplant, uh, or uh, local regional therapy. So let's look at the background. HCCs usually don't light up on FDG PET scans. The utility of uh, FDG in detecting HCC is limited because of high background uptake and rapid clearance of 18 FDG by normal hepatocytes. So 40 to 50% of HCC are actually FDG negative and they don't light up on PET scans. Well differentiated HCC more likely to be FDG non-avid and I'll explain that later. And poorly differentiated HCC are more likely to be uh, metastatic. FDG PET may be wo more valuable in uh, poorly differentiated HCC uh, in those who have metastasis and uh, for response uh, assessment. So this is the physiological basis of uh, 18F FDG PET scan uh, in HCC. So generally cancer cells have high glycolytic rate and increased uh, glucose transport one and hexokinase expression. HCC, on the other hand, has lower uh, GLUT1 and then metastatic or other cancers like cholangiocarcinoma. So what happens is that in a normal hepatocyte, there is a high glucose 6-phosphatase, which uh, facilitates the conversion of FDG 6-phosphatase to 18-FDG, which is then subsequently removed from the cell. So because of high glucose 6-phosphatase in hepatocytes, there is rapid clearance uh, of 18 FDG, and that's why uh, uh, most of the well differentiated uh, HCCs do not show FDG or do not uh, light up. Whereas high grade or poorly differentiated HCC have lesser G6 phosphatase activity, and that is why more FDG is retained and they light up more on uh, uh, on a PET scan. So. This is some of the values which I'll talk of uh, subsequently in my talk. So what is the stand SUV? SUV is standardized uptake value. And generally the cutoffs are vary between three to four. Then there's something called tumor to non-tumor liver uptake ratio. 
that is the TLR. It is also called as the SUV ratio and uh, well differentiated HCC approximately uh, 1.1 differentiates, difficult to uh, differentiate from normal liver. Poorly differentiated HCC, generally the TLR or SUV ratio is two or more. So these are two uh, you know, uh, nomenclatures which are often used when we describe a PET scan uh, appearance. And uh, uh, the degree of FDG avidity is SUV and uh, TLR, like I said, is the ratio of tumor to non-tumor uh, liver. Now, what are the radio tracers uh, available? So the most commonly uh, used is FDG, which I think all of us are using in clinical practice. I want to highlight a little bit on f fluorocholine, uh, which may improve sensitivity for diagnosis and response assessment. Uh, this has a, low, a shorter half-life and therefore, you know, transport is uh, a problem and that is why uh, the availability of fluorocholine is limited unless you are, you know, you have a, a reactor on site or nearby where you can make these uh, radio tracers. So how do these two radio tracers compare, uh, fluorocholine and 18-FDG, which is uh, commonly used? The sensitivity is about 88% for 18-F and 68% for FDG uh, when it is looked at various sites for uh, diagnosing HCC. Corresponding site-based sensitivity was 94% for 18-F and almost 60% for FDG. Uh, in this study, which was uh, you know published up almost ten years ago, so fluorocholine is probably a better radio tracer for diagnosing HCC, and FDG is probably a better uh, radio tracer for uh, prognosticating or you know uh, deciding whether HCC is uh, well differentiated or uh, poorly differentiated. And this is an example of uh, a, a PET scan where. Uh, this is a FDG PET scan where you can see there is uh, there is no light up the the white arrow and the same uh, HCC lights up on using F fluorocholine. So the current the radio tracer we use FDG for PET scan has really no role in diagnosis and only fluorocholine could possibly have a role for diagnosis. Uh, what if we use both of them together? So there's a new concept of coming of dual tracers. And uh, this is a study published recently in Journal of Hepatology, uh, which looked at 122 patients in PET uh, with PET CT performed for staging. And the dual PET uh, CT could detect new lesions in 21%, upgrade the staging in 11%, and modify treatment strategy in 14%. So, uh, if you use both the tracers, then we can definitely have a better diagnostic and prognostic uh, 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 value for the HCC. A dual uh, tracer PET-CT also modified the final treatment in 44% patients with unexplained elevation of uh, alpha fetoprotein and about 40% with doubtful lesions. So uh, using a dual uh, tracer PET-CT, uh, we can stage HCC better detect 21% more new lesions, modify staging in 11% and modify treatment in 14% patients. So as far as diagnosis is concerned, the current PET CT which we use FDG really has no role in diagnosis. Now what about staging? So FDG PET is very useful in detecting extra hepatic uh, HCC metastasis and uh, there is a sensitivity of almost 80 to 100% for detecting extrahepatic metastasis. It is superior to uh, bone scans for detecting bone mets, and it has higher uh, diagnostic accuracy for uh, detecting lymph node metastasis as compared to a contrast CT. And these are various studies which show that a PET CT, you can see here, has better sensitivity for uh, uh, detecting uh, metastasis as compared to uh, a CT scan. So PET CT is good for uh, bone mets, it is good for uh, lymph node mets, but some studies have shown that it is not really very good for uh, lung metastasis. But this is where the value 
comes in staging HCC that you can detect extrahepatic metastasis of HCC. Uh, some more studies which show that PET-CT can modulate the final tumor staging. Uh, these are studies uh, uh, which showed that the number of patients with a change of F, uh, stage by FDG PET uh, could, could be achieved. And uh, this is a study by in 2014 by uh, Kawamuda et al, uh, which showed that in 16 patients, that is about 25% patients, uh, the staging could be uh, changed by using a PET CT scan. So no role of PET scan in diagnosis, but it has a definite role in HCC staging. This is uh, another study uh, published very recently in liver transplantation, 148 patients, PET CT detected additional extra hepatic mets in 12% of treatment naive and about 14% of uh, treatment experienced patients. So a PET CT can change uh, in this study, change the BCLC staging uh, in 6% of treatment naive and about 19% of uh, treatment experienced patients compared to CT or MRI alone. And uh, PET CT uh, provides prognostic information and improves uh, tumor staging beyond CT MRI alone uh, with uh, subsequent changes in management of, for uh, a patient with uh, HCC. Now this is a, a, a CT scan of a patient who underwent TACE, and this is a, a eight week post TACE scan. And if you can see here, it doesn't show any, a CT scan doesn't show any uptake, but when you do a PET CT scan, there is uptake which shows that there is residual disease. So there is a change in staging by using a PET CT scan as compared to a, 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 a typical dynamic CT scan. So a FDG PET has definite role in staging uh, HCC. Now let's come to uh, prognostic value of uh, a PET CT scan in uh, HCC. Now this is a study uh, which we published in 2013 and this is a, you know, you can appreciate that this is early days of PET scan. Uh, and uh, uh, so at that time we published data for about a hundred patients. A radiologically high disease was found more commonly in patients with FDG avid primary tumors, where a lower stage was found in patients with non FDG avid primary tumors. FDG avid tumors also showed lower incidence of metastatic disease and portal vein thrombosis with a significant P value. And histological findings in liver transplant explants showed that a higher grade tumor was more common in FDG avid tumor as compared to non FDG uh, avid tumor group, again with a significant p value. So, uh, in our uh, small series of 100 patients, we showed that patients who had, uh, who were FDG avid, had more metastatic disease and more portal vein thrombosis and had poorer prognosis. Oh, sorry. So uh, compared, you know, again, uh, similar to data available, this study also showed that uh, only about 60% of the tumors, 59% were FDG avid primary tumors. The rest were all non FDG avid. And as you can see here, and like I just explained, as the stage of the cancer increased, the, the percentage of uh, non FDG uh, or FDG tumor, FDG avid tumors decreased and non-FDG avid tumors uh, increase. So FDG PET scan can serve as a molecular signature for management decisions and can be used as an independent and a significant prognostic factor in patients uh, with HCC. Now coming to the role of PET scan in uh, surgical resection. So for the accurate assessment of risk benefit ratio in the constant of resection for HCC, a prognostically relevant tumor biology feature is essential. Enhanced uptake on PET has shown to indicate the presence of unfavorable uh, histopathological features such as poor differentiation and microvascular invasion and thus predicting a poor uh, overall survival and recurrence-free survival. There are a host of studies which look at the role of PET scan in a curative surgical treatment of HCC uh, I'll just highlight a couple of them. 
So this is a study published by Yo et al, 207 patients. Uh, and this study showed that the LB grade and the SUV ratio were identified as significant and independent prognostic factors of over, overall survival in patients who went uh, underwent resection. Uh, another study, sorry, uh, published uh, uh, by Kitamura et al, again showed that a SUV ratio cutoff of two was a significant and independent predictor of HCC relapse in patients who uh, underwent resection. So when we are taking up a patient for resection, the lighting up on a PET scan, uh, so the SUV value or the SUV ratio can tell us uh, about poorer histological features, chances of recurrence and microvascular invasion. So this is a study particularly looking at microvascular invasion. Uh, uh, the routine performance of a PET CT scan previous to uh, HCC resection could be useful uh, to obtain a better understanding of the biological ag aggressiveness of the neoplastic disease. And if you look at this study, uh, if you look at all the parameters, you know, uh, the alpha fetoprotein, the fibro scan, the tumor size, the, the ratio, the tumor to non uh, tumor liver ratio uh, at 60 minutes was the only significant factor uh, which predicted microvascular invasion. So again, PET-CT can predict microvascular invasion and is particularly useful in patients undergoing resection uh, as well as uh, liver transplantation. Again, uh, some studies showing the role of PET-CT scan uh, correlating with microvascular uh, invasion uh, with high sensitivity uh, and specificity. And this is, uh, these are two scans of patients who had, uh, you know, uh, uh, who had a positive PET scan and uh, uh, both underwent liver transplantation, uh, had microvascular invasion on uh, the explant pathology and had uh, early recurrence. So a positive PET can predict microvascular invasion and early recurrence after any form of uh, surgery. Uh, this is again data from our center, which we published. Uh, uh, this is published in uh, liver transplantation last year, uh, main work done by Prashant. So this is data of about 450 patients who underwent liver transplant in, in the last decade from 2006 to 17. And uh, this is the overall survival, which is, uh, uh, this is the overall survival, which is about 55% at 10 years. Uh, this is the recurrence-free survival and the disease-free survival. What I want to highlight again in this study is that we divided these patients into three groups. They were low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. So low risk was uh, no risk factors. The moderate risk uh, were alpha fetoprotein plus a positive PET or a positive PET, PET plus out of UCSF and high risk were those who had all the criteria. That means they were, uh, they had high AFP uh, beyond UCF and a positive PET. So if you look at the survival, the survival was significantly lower in the high risk group and the moderate risk group as compared to the low risk group, 72% versus, uh, uh, oh sorry, 89% versus 71% versus 41%. And if you look at the cumulative incidence of recurrence, then the group with the moderate risk and the high risk, which involved a PET CT scan had significantly higher recurrence, 25% and 46%. So although we don't have uh, data separately for PET scan because uh, we didn't have SUV values for all our scans, but we this study also showed that uh, PET CT scan could be one of the markers for uh, prognosticating uh, patients undergoing uh, liver transplantation. Again, a very important study published a uh, few years ago in Journal of Hepatology, showing that the combination of AFP and uh, 18 FDG PET predicted better outcomes than those using the Milan criteria, which are the standard criteria for selecting patients with uh, uh, for liver transplantation. So if you look at this, this is uh, use you know the uh, the survival between uh, within Milan and beyond Milan, and you can see this is almost same. But if you look at the SUV ratio, uh, less than 1.1 and more than 1.1, this is significant in uh, predicting survival. 
and similarly alpha fetoprotein uh, less than 200 and more than 200 also was uh, significant in uh, showing a difference in survival so a combination of criteria uh, using alpha fetoprotein and pet positivity uh, is better uh, uh, is a very good prognostic uh, uh, factor in this study in a multivariate analysis and it was better than Milan criteria, tumor size, and numbers. Uh, prognostic value of PET scan in HCC uh, according to Milan criteria. Now, I just want to you know, highlight one thing in this, the various studies which have shown that you know, the, if you have patients within Milan criteria, but they have a positive PET, they do badly. If you have a patient within Milan criteria with a negative PET, remember these are well differentiated, they have a very good prognosis. And if you have patients outside Milan criteria, but with a negative PET, they do equally good or even better as compared to those within Milan with a positive PET. So what I'm trying to tell you again is what the Journal of Hepatology study showed that a PET scan is probably, a, a positivity on a PET scan is probably better than uh, Milan criteria in uh, prognostic value in patients undergoing liver transplantation. So if you have a patient, and this is a study, uh, 91 patients, five-year recurrence-free survival was comparable between Milan criteria patients and out of Milan criteria patient, but with a negative PET. So this is, you could use, you could take up patients uh, on an individual basis who are out of Milan criteria, who have a negative PET, and they will have a fairly good uh, prognosis uh, 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 even better than those uh, within Milan criteria. Again, a PET scan can be used to expand LT selection. So if you have patients who are outside criteria, uh, who are outside UCSF criteria, but are PET negative, then these patients probably might do well. Uh, and these are various studies which have shown that. And the, the proposal of expanded criteria uh, have been, you know, patients who are PET negative and out of UCSF or who are a PET negative and out of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the rule of seven system. And you can see that various studies have shown that you can increase transplant eligibility if you use a PET as a novel criteria uh, for prognosis. And, you know, various studies have shown that you can increase it by, uh, you know, 25 to almost 50%. So using a PET can be inclusive and get, can you know, send more patients uh, for li uh, liver transplantation, even they are uh, out of criteria. What about PET in locally advanced disease? So there is data that uh, PET scan can uh, again prognosticate and as well as uh, assess tumor response in patients undergoing local regional therapy. Uh, again, various uh, non-curative approaches Sorafenib, TACE, uh, local treatment, uh, uh, this is uh, con uh, concomitant uh, radiotherapy and uh, uh, chemotherapy. And various studies have shown that a lower SUV ratio, uh, more, less than 1.7 or more than 2, was an independent predictor of prognosis uh, in patients who underwent these local regional uh, therapy. PET scan can also be used to assess metabolic assessment of tum tumor viability uh, following local regional tumor therapy. Again, various studies have shown that the sensitivity of a PET CT scan is more uh, than a contrast CT scan in uh, patients who have undergone uh, a new adjacent taste prior to liver resection or liver transplant. Uh, again, a study showing the non-curative uh, local regional therapy, taste, RFA, or uh, ethanol injection, and the tumor response could be better assessed uh, with a PET CT scan as compared to a triphasic CT scan. So PET scan can be used to individualize patients or decide whether a patient would have, uh, you know, a, a good prognosis after local regional therapy, and again to assess the response to uh, local regional therapy. So where do we stand today or what are what do the guidelines or the staging systems tell us so unfortunately they are still not part of any guidance uh, statements so what does a nozzle say there is no significant role of pet in diagnosis of hcc 
except for detection of distant metastasis. And I showed that during my talk. A PET scan may play an important role in prognostication of HCC. Higher the SUV, poorer is the prognosis. And I uh, have given that in all scenarios uh, in surgery, liver transplant, as well as in local regional therapy. Easel talks of a PET scan. It says that PET scan is not recommended for early diagnosis of HCC because of high rate of false negative cases. And uh, it does not talk of prognostic role. ASLD 2018 does not even mention PET in any algorithm. So PET scan is still not part of uh, uh, you know, any guidance and there's still not uh, uh, a lot of evidence uh, and mainly because of lack of prospective studies. Most of the studies are small and they're all retrospective. So to summarize what I've said, uh, FDG PET has no role in diagnosis of HCC. Commonly used tracer FDG is poorly avid in HCC. 18 fluorocholine is more avid. FDG PET scan is useful in staging HCC for detecting extrahepatic disease and microvascular invasion. Adding PET CT to assessment algorithm of patients planned for transplant, resection, or ablation may identify patients at risk for recurrence after each procedure. Patient, uh, a PET CT may identify patients who, despite being outside the Milan criteria, have a favorable biological characteristic and there should be, you know, could be considered as uh, transplant candidates. PET CT plus AFP is probably a better prognosis, a predictor of prognosis in uh, liver transplantation. PET scan can help us in uh, selecting patients for LRT and for assessing response to a therapy. The reason where we, you know, uh, the, the, the problem with why PET scan is still not in great use or part of any guidance is because most studies are retrospective. Uh, there is a great variability regarding the tumor stage and underlying liver functions in uh, most of these studies and the use of different FDG uptake measurements and SUV That's cut true. values. So there's a lot of variation in the SUV cutoff values. Uh, and this is probably why I think we need more data to really have uh, them part of uh, guidelines. Uh, I think FDG PET can probably fulfill an unmet need of predicting tumor biology uh, without really doing a pre-transplant or the pre-surgery uh, tumor biopsy. And like I said, at present, uh, it is not part of any staging system and uh, management guidelines, but I think with more emerging data, uh, it probably will have a role in, uh, uh, you know, in prognostic value and in selecting patients for uh, various forms of uh, treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nirasara, for an excellent talk. And uh, you have really highlighted what would be the importance of PET in diagnosis if the, we change the uh, dye which we want to use, but it is not available. But for prognostication, you have shown uh, with alpha fetoprotein, it is very good. So uh, I have got an elite pan panel of uh, experts with me and uh, I would request them one by one to give their comments and questions if they have. Uh, Dr. Vinod Dixit, he's the professor and head, Department of Gastroenterology, Institute of Medical Sciences, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. Dr. Uh, Vinod, uh, any comment or any questions to the uh, speakers? First of all, sir, I would conclude both the speakers, they really covered very well the topic and it was very nice. Uh, I just have a small uh, query from Dr. Raju, Professor Raju Sharma. He said that Liret system usually should not should be applied only in the adult people. Any reason for not actually including the suppose somebody has got a 15 years of age come with the ACC, uh, it will not be applicable. And what is the reason actually? Why you cannot have uh, you apply only after 18 years of age? Any reason for that? It has been shown that uh, patient. Sharma, patient. are you able to see listen? Yes. Pediatric uh, patients if, uh, who say have an idle hepatic fibrosis uh, or any vascular cause for cirrhosis, it has been shown that they are the positive predictive value of these uh, criteria is not very high. There are no other lesions as well. And uh, mostly when uh, pediatric patients develop HCC, it's in a non serotic background, isn't it? I mean, HCC can occur in 11, 12 year olds also, but most often it is in a non serotic mm -hmm. background and it is of a fibrolamellar variety. 
all the studies have been done in the context of uh, patients with chronic liver disease, where there is a high pre-test probability of developing an HCC. That is why it's been clearly laid down that you cannot use it in patients who are less than 18. Okay. Uh, Dr. Niraj, Dr. Niraj, you are able to listen to me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Dr. Andrews, as you rightly said, because still we are using the conventional UC, the multi-phase CT scan for the diagnosis of SCE. And uh, so when you feel actually the most appropriate time when you should order for the PET CT, because conventionally you are not using as a diagnosis for the SCC. So what condition, actually, what stage you feel that this may be more valuable and it should be ordered if the facility exists? Right, sir. So like I uh, said during my talk, it really has no diagnostic value, the, 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 the current PET CT scan which we use. And yeah, sorry. So I would use it uh, in patients who are undergoing definitive curative therapy. And that is what we are doing at our center. So any under patient undergoing resection, and every patient undergoing liver transplant, we do use it. Uh, it helps us stage. Sometimes you do find, uh, you know, uh, uh, metastasis okay. we missed on a dynamic CT, and that would, you know, rule out that patient for a transplant or resection. And uh, it does have prognostic value. And but you know, I must confess that at present, it's you know, we're not rejecting patients. So I think the real use will come if you are going to reject a patient uh, if he has, uh, you know, a positive or a high SUV value or you're going to include a patient who's beyond criteria, like I showed, and has a negative pet, but I think we are not doing that right now. And probably we need more data for that. But I, we at our center do a pet for every resection and a transplant. I would not necessarily do it for a non-curative therapy like a taste or ablative therapy. Okay. Uh, yes. Dr. Dixit, okay. any other question? No, no, no sir, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Professor Krishna Das Devadas, He's professor and head department of gastroenterology, government medical college, Trivandrum. Sir, your comments, please, or any questions you have. Thank you, sir. At the outset, uh, let me congratulate both the speakers for having done a very good job and a very thought-provoking uh, talk. Uh, Dr. Neeraj, um, why is it that um, uh, pet, FDG PET is positive in a high percentage of the metastatic disease, metastatic lesions, but not in the primary lesion in the liver, because it is a factor of the um, carcinoma cells, the high phosphatase and the high P glycoprotein as well as the low GLUT1 and 2 levels that uh, makes it uh, less FDG avid. Is it because um, uh, it is uh, basically the poorly differentiated malignancies that metastasize? Which is yeah. the reason for the high metastatic uh, rate? Yeah. So you know, uh, in a normal hepatocyte, FDG is cleared, and well differentiated cancers, as far as my understanding goes, probably are behaving more like a normal hepatocyte, and most of the, uh, you know, the FDG is cleared from the hepatocyte. Whereas poorly differentiated are retaining more FDG, and they are the ones who are more likely to have portal vein thrombosis or uh, metastasis. So I think it is basically the. Uh, it's a factor of differentiation rather than. Uh, the metastasis. And uh, Dr. Raju Sharma, one question to you. Um, uh, for LIRADS 4 or LIRADS 3 lesions, which are quite confusing for us clinicians, so would you go for a repeat imaging or would you go for a biopsy straight up? Uh, this is often customized decision made in an MDT. For LR3, most often we would recommend a follow up imaging study at a shorter interval than usual. But LR4 depending on what are the features which are making it LR4, very often we buy LR4 lesions. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, uh, very nice that uh, you have just uh, talked about the importance of uh, uh, the staging at LR3 and LR4. So, we are going to uh, Dr. T.D. Adav, his professor, Department of GI Surgery, PGI at Chandigarh. Sir, your comments, please. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Raj. Uh, Dr. Raju, uh, just uh, we as a clinician do one cross-sectional imaging, but in your LR, both uh, both are overlapping. So when will you recommend that we should go for MR and when will you recommend that we should go for CT scan? So if, you go as per, if I tell you as per the 
the line lyrat does not give you any preference you know because yes, yes. Uh, the choice between ct and mr tends to vary between institutions depending on availability and the expertise so lyrat does not lay out whether you should do ct or mr if you ask me my personal preference if logistics and scheduling allows then mr is preferable for all cirrhotic patients when you're evaluating for hcc mr should be the first but i understand in the interest of cost and uh, logistic considerations very often we land up doing ct but definitely in our experience we find mr to be superior uh, dr raju in the same corollary uh, hepatobiliary agents which are used as a contrast are they better than the extracellular contrast agents which are being used yes sir the one available in india the only one in india is gadobinate which is multi hands and we do all our liver studies with the, the hepato uh, hepatocyte specific agents because that gives you an additional paradigm of doing the hepatocyte take phase so it does give us added value and it's better than the extracellular agents and that's I what the studies have also shown it's a very important thing which uh, if it is available and your money is not a constraint probably we should use this hepatobiliary agent absolutely because it provides the blood flow based treatment characteristics and also the uh, the tissue tissue uh, right. up, uptake which is their metabolic uptake yes sir. i think it's a very important thing uh, doctor uh, please go ahead so one important yeah. point uh, dr neeraj jai you are saying what i can understand that uh, it's a uh, better to have a, uh, when you are having a liver transplant patient and you have a high risk uh, scc then uh, probably uh, we want to have a patient where chances of recurrence is very less and uh, you want to exclude any any patient which is going to have a probably hidden metastasis but as you said that you are you are talking about beyond you see uh, beyond milan or beyond you see sir but what is beyond beyond uh, has no limit so have you any uh, by, by, for beyond also something some criteria or any patient you are uh, trying, talking about yeah so at our center we uh, don't consider size as uh, you know a contraindication for a transplantation so any size is generally what we do and uh, but obviously there should be no uh, extra hepatic disease and there should be no vascular invasion at the time of transplant so size and number uh, we don't uh, we are not at present uh, following and we have uh, recently published our data also which uh, you know uh, with fairly fairly good results um and but here here is where i think a pet scan can play a role that if you are you doing a large size and the patient is pet positive also then maybe we should not and maybe we should do large size with pet negative so that they have more favorable uh, outcomes okay thank you uh we have now dr ajay gulati is professor department of radio diagnosis pgim at chandigarh sir ajay please give your comments uh thank you sir and uh, i think two excellent talks back to back and uh, uh, raju sir is uh, already uh, you know given a very nice comprehensive overview of the practical way how we approach these lesions and the cirrhotic background uh, my question sir is uh, about the uh, you know your experience now with the ai coming in you know the artificial intelligence and the ct texture analysis these things are you know coming up in a big way and you know in the setting of hcc would they you know have some value because we want to have a look at the tumor biology and you know possibly grade the tumors as well which just by morphology we may not be able to give that information so what do you think would be the value in the current future i know it's something which is very new and is you know uh, something which would uh, we would learn over time but uh, what is your uh, inputs into this so i have no personal experience of using ai in hcc we have been using it uh, you know we did extensive in kidney tumors and have found it a useful picker of uh, the grade of differentiation and we published uh, that in the context of renal tumors but not specifically for hcc but in truth speaking it would be as useful in hcc you know you just need to apply it to study it and there are already early publications coming out that uh, texture analysis radiomics is going to be a very useful biomarker for predicting the uh, degree of differentiation as well as uh, things like ck17 positive macrotubule xcs it will be possible to predict these reliably and hopefully better than pet dr neeraj may not be happy with that but uh, 
I think we may be able to do it better than PET if we rely on AI techniques and uh, texture analysis, especially. And uh, another small comment here is said that, uh, you know, some of the big centers now have the luxury of actually having uh, dual energy scanners. I know, you know, LIDAR only gives the minimal specifications about the number of rows of detectors, which should be there to actually do these imaging. But uh, if we do have the luxury of these scanners, do you feel that all such patients should be, uh, you know, done on dual energies, given the fact that- We already that do it. Uh, incidentally, we already do all our uh, liver scans on dual energy mode because it becomes easier to perceive that arterial enhancement because right. the K edge, you know, you can match the K edge to iodine. So it's easier to pick up contrast enhancement. The degree of confidence increases to pick up arterial enhancement when you do dual energy. So we routinely do our livers on dual energy, but I'm sure that's not the way everyone can when the availability is not that good. Can I just chip in, sir, just small comment? Yes, sir, please, yeah. please. But before I, I ask a question, I think Dr. Samisha is sitting quiet. So let me, okay. as a chairperson, ask him to comment first. And then I have a small question for Dr. Raju Sharma. Let's, Amir, Dr. Rai, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, yes. No, <laughs> I've, been, I've been a very patient uh, listener to these excellent uh, talks. And uh, more importantly, I think the panelists are asking such important uh, questions. So I think I have the luxury as a co-chairperson to for today, just sit and listen and absorb. So over to you, Ajay. Okay, just a small question to Dr. Raju Sharma before I think Sunil, you wind it up. I think the, this topic is was for diagnosis and prognosis and the lines you said is you know, CTMR, we use it, but you know, uh, we will have a separate session on screening and surveillance. Uh, but then in, in patients with NASH related cirrhosis or and in non serotics there's some issue and you know, the standard recommendation for, you know, screening and surveillance is ultrasound every six months with alpha with or without alpha beta protein. But those with obese serotics, maybe, and most of them would be NASH serotics, there is a limitation of ultrasound, right? And in that, the ACG or AG has recently come out with the guidelines that if you have a limitation of ultrasound, you can do a CT or MR in them. So now, how do you define that limitation? It's so subjective ultrasound. So on that, if I'm aware, LIRAD's 2018 version had come, published in Radiology 2018, which used ultrasound and said that if you are not able to see more than 50% of the parenchyma or if there's too much of heterogeneity, I mean, that they said type C limitation based on LIRAD. And then they said you do a CT or MR. So your thoughts on that and the utility of LIRADs, you know, using ultrasound. You're absolutely right. There is also a visualization score that you're supposed to give when you're doing ultrasound surveillance. In addition to giving a category, you're also supposed to give a visualization score, which is based on the liver echogenicity, how heterogeneous it is. And if your liver visualization score puts you in a category of severely limited visualization of the liver, you can automatically go ahead and do an ultra, uh, CT or an MR. And we do that very often in our own experience. It's very hard to do a good ultrasound in a cirrhotic patient. You know, the whole liver looks heterogeneous. Picking up lesions between one, one centimeters can be very, very challenging. And if we feel that the liver architecture is so grossly distorted, we often resort to doing a, a multi-phase CT or an MR, even for the purpose of surveillance. So, so Ajay, you, you can wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Ajay, I may add at uh, this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. So, in institutes where curative therapy is possible, like a liver transplant, I would suggest that we should not be relying on ultrasound alone six monthly, but once a year. What we do in our institute is to do just a T2 weighted MR uh, acquisition annually. If yeah. there is any lesion seen, then we give contrast. So we don't give a contrast study uh, every year. But just non-contrast T2 weighted, I would like uh, a response from Raju Sharma on this of uh, picking up lesions and then uh, sort of giving uh, contrast. So the issue I was trying to raise, can lyrides be applied to ultrasound? I understand, but I was taking it one step uh, forward yeah. in yeah, sure. trying to uh, uh, sort of, because ultrasound will have its limitation, limitation. when it is done yeah. routinely in uh, centers which are not uh, sort of centers of excellence. But I think where you have transplantation and you would want to pick up patients early, uh, this is the thing that... Uh... 
Raju, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. There is a publication also. Uh, so we don't do what you are suggesting, but I know it's already published. There's a paper which came out from Mass General in last year, which said uh, which has proposed abbreviated uh, MR protocol for the purpose of uh, surveillance kind of study. Yes. And then if you pick up something, you can go ahead and inject Contra. So it is indeed a good thought process. And to respond to Ajay's uh, question, do use LIRAD for ultrasound? Yes, there is a LIRAD for ultrasound. Well, there's a whole separate set of guidelines for LIRAD for ultrasound for surveillance and a separate one for contrast enhanced ultrasound also. Sure, thank you. Suni, maybe you can wrap it up. Yes, sir. So if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to thank both the speakers, Professor Rajiv Singh and Professor Neeraj Saraf for the very interesting talks. And I also want to thank our chairpersons, Professor Ramesh Ruprai and Professor Samir Shah and all the panelists for this wonderful interaction. We move on to the next session and I invite Dr. Sahaj to introduce the chairpersons for that. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is um, so after this very exciting session and a very engaging discussion, I would now like to invite uh, the chairpersons for our part two of diagnosis of SCC, where we'll be concentrating on uh, the biomarkers and uh, tissue diagnosis. The chairpersons for this session would be Professor Ajay Kumar, who is the director and head department of gastroenterology and hepatology at BLK Math Super Specialty Hospital, New Delhi. And Professor Pankaj Puri, who is the director department of gastroenterology and hepatology uh, at Fortis Escorts Liver and Digestive Disease Institute, New Delhi. Uh, Professor Pankaj Puri is also the treasurer for in the International Association for Study of Liver. Uh, over to the chairpersons, please. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, the next, we'll carry on with diagnosis. And the next lecture will be given by Dr. Thank Ashish you. Kumar. And his topic for today will be conventional uh, serum biomarker uh, index, the diagnostic and prognostic well, significance. Everybody knows Dr. Ashish. He's a senior consultant and professor at Sir Gangaram Hospital. And Dr. Ashish, the floor, please start. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Uh, are, is my slide visible and am I audible? Yes, yes, your yeah. slides are visible. Okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Ajay, Dr. Sunil and Dr. P. N. Rao for giving me an opportunity to speak on this important uh, meeting. So my topic is conventional serum biomarkers in HCC, its diagnostic and prognostic significance. I would briefly touch upon the history of serum biomarkers for hepato hepatocellular carcinoma. So it was in the year 1956 uh, when uh, Bergstand et al. published a uh, study where they analyzed the fetal blood and compared it with the adult blood. And they found that in the fetal blood, there's an extra uh, protein in the range of uh, uh, al between al albumin and alpha globulin. And so they named it, it was probably a, a new protein that is secreted only in the fetus, but not in the adult blood. And so they called this alpha fetoprotein. So this alpha fetoprotein in the fetus is a 70 kilodotal uh, glycoprotein. And in fetus, it may have same role as the albumin. However, its exact biological function during the embryonic development was not fully known. And soon after the birth, the alpha fetoprotein levels rapidly declined. Then subsequently in 1963, two scientists from uh, Russia, uh, Moscow, uh, they found that there's a protein which is found specifically in the rat uh, hepatomas as well as in some uh, human hepatocellular carcinomas. And this they subsequently, they found that this is the same protein which was initially discovered by Bergstein uh, in the fetus. So they, from then on, it was found that this alpha fetoprotein, which was uh, present in the fetal blood, is now also secreted by some of the patients of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, from their tumors. So the alpha fetoprotein levels in the blood are high in, patient, in pregnant women because it is being secreted by the uh, fetus. Then it declines as soon as the uh, childbirth occurs. And then it rises again only if there's a hepatocellular carcinoma or if there's some malignancy or some other benign conditions also. So this is the normal and this is the abnormal. <clears throat> but the role of alpha fetoprotein during embryonic development as well as in the carcinogenesis 
along with its mechanism and its function is still not fully elucidated. Then in 1970s onwards, alpha fetoprotein started being used as a serologic test for HCC. And this is a big landmark study uh, published in Cancer Journal in 1970, where 813 patients of HCC were, were examined and their sera was investigated. And it was found that uh, many of these, at least 65% of these patients had uh, raised alpha fetoprotein. But uh, in spite of uh, the finding that alpha fetoprotein is raised in malignant conditions, so there are some certain benign conditions as well where the uh, alpha fetoprotein was found to be raised, especially in cirrhosis or chronic hepatitis. So is, are both the AFPs same? So uh, subsequently in 1989, affinity chromatography was used to separate the isoforms of alpha fetoprotein. And for this affinity chromatography, a carbohydrate binding protein, which is derived from the commonly used lentil was used, that is lens glenaris agglutinin. And then three forms of alpha fetoprotein were separated, L1, L2, and L3. And it was found that in uh, HCC patients, it was predominantly L3 fraction, which may be uh, higher than the L1 fraction. While in liver cirrhosis or other benign condition, it is predominantly L1 fraction. So the L3 fraction of the AFP, which is AFP L3 in short, is an isoform of AFP, and it is represented as percentage of the total AFP. And if AFP L3 is more than 10%, then it, it uh, predicts that the patient is, has uh, HCC. However, its sensitivity is low uh, in various studies, uh, even less than 50%, but specificity is very high. But the studies on AFP L3 uh, have been very limited. Then in 1984, another tumor marker was developed, discovered. It was called as DES carboxy uh, prothrombin or abnormal prothrombin. And it, in a landmark study published in NEGM in 1984, uh, in about 76% of uh, 76 patients, they found that in many of these patients, uh, biopsy confirmed HCC, this abnormal prothrombin was found. So this abnormal prothrombin or uh, des, carbo des gamma carboxy prothrombin is also known as prothrombin induced by vitamin K absence 2. It is an abnormal form of prothrombin and it increases in HCC because HCC cells have an acquired defect of carboxylation of the prothrombin. So these uh, HCC cells start uh, releasing the prothrombin, which is abnormal. But PIVCA2 may also be elevated and with vitamin K deficiency because, again, with, with vitamin K deficiency, same carboxylation would not be possible. And so this uh, release prothrombin will be abnormal. And, and also in some, certain antithrombotic therapies such as warfarin. Now, uh, but these three biomarkers, AFP, DCP, and AFP, are uh, they don't go hand in hand. There are certain patients in which AFP will be elevated. There are certain patients in which DCP will be elevated and certain patients there'll be AFP, L3 will be elevated. And there a group of patients where be, there'll be no elevation. So what is the current use of these serum biomarkers for HCC? The role of biomarkers in a life cycle of a hepatocellular carcinoma can be a multitude. For example, it can be used in surveillance. So patients of cirrhosis who are undergoing periodic surveillance tests, these biomarkers can be utilized. It can be used in diagnosis. So a patient who comes with a liver SOL and is being tested to determine whether this SOL is HCC or something else, then it can be used in prognosis prediction. So these patients who have, we have diagnosed them as HCC, but they are being staged and we are planning their treatment. So these biomarkers can be useful in these patients and then response to treatment. So we have uh, diagnosed HCC, we and they, these patients have undergone curative or palliative treatment. So is the, these biomarkers declining or not? So uh, for pro response to treatment, it can be used. And also once that we have uh, given them curative treatment, they have responded. And when they, we are following these patients to diagnose the recurrence of uh, HCC, uh, these biomarkers may be useful. So I'll come to one by one, all three biomarkers. So first AFP, the use of AFP for surveillance. It is the most widely used uh, biomarker for surveillance, but if it is used alone as a surveillance tool, it has got suboptimal performance. Uh, so uh, its sensitivity is uh, about 60% and specificity is around 
80 percent. The the low sensitivity is because uh, it, the concentration of AFP is related to the tumor size. So uh, it would detect only advanced tumor and not the small tumors. So if uh, AFP is used alone, it will miss about 40 percent of uh, HCC because of low sensitivity. And also it is not very specific because it can be raised in uh, chronic hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis C, cholangiocarcinomas. So uh, if it is raised in these conditions, it will lead to false positive uh, uh, results and will lead to unnecessary tests like triple phase CT and other tests. But combination of ultrasound and AFP is better because it increases in detection rate for HCC. So, so for uh, AF, use of AFP for surveillance, we should use it in combination with ultrasound. And in a recent uh, meta-analysis published by uh, Dr. Singhal, who will be the next speaker, uh, it, uh, this meta-analysis of 32 studies comprising about 13,000 patients, it was found that uh, in, only 40% in, uh, of HCCs are detected at an early stage. But if we use uh, ultrasound, the sensitivity of ultrasound is 45%. Uh, to detect early HCC, but if we add alpha fetoprotein, then at least 63% of these uh, early HCCs could be uh, detected. So from then on, uh, alpha fetoprotein is now in recommendation that in combination with the ultrasound, it should be used as a surveillance tool. So what should be the AFP cutoff for the diagnosis of HCCs? So this is another meta-analysis published in last year only. It's a meta-analysis of 59 studies comprising about 11,000 HCC patients and 21,000 controls. It was found that if the AFP is used in the range of 20 to 100 AFP cutoff, then sensitivity is quite low, that is 61%, and specificity uh, is also low, that is 86%. But if we raise the cutoff of AFP to 200, then sensitivity uh, again falls down further, but this specificity raises. That is 98%. And if uh, the AFP cutoff is taken as more than 400, then it is obviously very low sensitivity of about one third of patients, but specificity becomes almost 99%. So as we increase the cutoff, the sensitivity decreases, the specificity increases. So uh, now, uh, what about the role of AFP in prognosis? So patient who, with, who have high AFP have lower survival. So this is a meta-analysis of 61 studies published this year only, where it was found that if the AFP is high, the recurrence-free survival was poorer, the uh, hazard ratio was 1.5, and even overall survival was poorer with the same hazard ratio. So if uh, there's high AFP, so regardless of what treatment you give, the survival will be poorer. What about the patients who are, are having high AFP and those who are undergoing liver transplantation? Another meta-analysis of 24 studies, and it was found that uh, patients who have AFP more than 50%, the recurrence rate was about 15%, but if the AFP was less than 50, the recurrence rate was in uh, 11%. So more uh, AFP, higher recurrence rate. What about if the AFP is very high, suppose 400? So this is another meta-analysis of 17 studies where it was found that if the pre-transplant AFP was more than 400, the recurrence rate what was uh, for HCC was about 2.69 fold. So in the previous slide, we saw if the AFP is more than 50, uh, the recurrence rate is 15%. But if the AFP is more than 400, the recurrence rate becomes almost three times. And so because of these high recurrence rate, the AFP has now uh, has been incorporated into various transplant criteria, for example, Hangsu criteria, where AFP cutoff of 400 is taken, AFP model, AFP TDT criteria, and various other criteria. Samson criteria takes an AFP cutoff of 100, uh, 1000. So it is uh, now incorporated in various transplant criteria. And also after treatment, if the AFP declines, then the um, uh, response and survival is better. So this is a meta-analysis of 29 studies. And after giving uh, local regional therapy or some curative or, uh, therapy, in a, within a period of one to two months, if there was any reduction of AFP or if there were 20% reduction or 50% uh, reduction, so if there's any reduction, the survival was better. The hazard ratio was 0.41. 
So whether it was curative therapy, local regional therapy, systemic therapy, or combined therapy, if once we are given therapy, if the AFP, AFP falls down, then these patients have better survival. So the utility of AFP is in surveillance, as we saw in combination with ultrasound, in diagnosis, as we saw that if the cutoff is increased, we, uh, it gives a positive diagnosis, and also in prognosis as well as uh, uh, assessing the response to treatment in hepatic resection, liver transplantation, uh, biologics, and uh, other uh, checkpoint inhibitors. What about PIVCA2? PIVCA2 and AF versus AFP, PIVCA2 uh, and a serum AFP levels don't go hand in hand. There's no positive or negative correlation between them. These are independent marker. And it is said that PIVCA2 is more specific marker for HCC than AFP uh, because other liver condition rarely give rise to elevated PIVCA2 and except for intake of warfarin and other vitamin K uh, deficient therapies. The serum half-life of PIVCA2 is much shorter than AFP. So it will uh, be a better marker for HCC tumor response uh, after giving therapy. And if is also it correlates with the stage of HCC. So, so PIVCA2 versus AFP for HCC diagnosis and other meta-analysis of 31 studies, it was found that AFP had in this meta-analysis was found that AFP had a sensitivity of 66%, specificity of 84%, but PIVCA had same sensitivity but a higher specificity. And the area under curve of PIVCA was 0.856 as compared to AFP, which was 0.77. So it is a marginally better uh, specificity than AFP. Then patients undergoing uh, local regional therapy, again, uh, the DCP or the PIVCA2 levels, those patients uh, who have uh, lower DCP uh, have a better overall survival. For example, those patients who are receiving TAS and they had lower uh, DCP, their survival was better. And those who are having higher DCP levels, for example, those undergoing um, RFA or ablation, there, uh, if the DCP levels are higher, then the survival overall survival was, was poorer. Again, patients uh, with high DCP have a higher HCC recurrence. So patients with a DCP or PIVCA2 levels more than 300 to 400 have a five-fold high recurrence rate. And because of this, in few of the transplant criteria, again, uh, DCP is also incorporated with a cutoff of 400 or 300, like in Kyoto criteria, Kyunshu criteria, AP levels, and AP 200 levels. Uh, what about AFP L3? The AFP L3 has got very low sensitivity as compared to both uh, uh, AFP as well as DCP, but very high uh, specificity. In a meta analysis of six studies, the sensitivity was as low as 34%, but specificity was 92%. So what, uh, what if we combine all these tumor markers? So, uh, so as I showed that these tumor markers are independent. So in a study which was conducted in 2015, it was found that in about 66% of patients, AFP was elevated, 65% uh, DFP was elevated, and about 43% of patient AFP was elevated, AFP L3 was elevated, and about 159 patients, about 20%, none of these were elevated. So there's another meta-analysis of uh, six studies where they have combined AFP and AFPL3 for diagnosis of HC. And it found that the sensitivity is increased because of combination 71% and specificity is also increased to 79%. Another meta-analysis of 40 studies where AFP is combined with DCP for diagnosis of HCC, sensitivity is higher, 80%, specificity is also 80%. Another meta-analysis of 11 studies where all three of them have been combined, uh, AFP, AFP, LC, and DCP, and the sensitivity goes up further, 88%, specificity is about 80%. So use of tumor markers in HCC staging, many of the staging systems like uh, BM, JIS staging, and uh, Gratex staging, Ballad scoring, and some other staging have now started using tumor markers, especially AFP, and sometimes a DCP as a uh, included them in the staging system. Also, there's one interesting study where they found that if the all three tumor markers are positive, that means triple positive, 
then these patients are, have very poorly differentiated HCC. They have increased chances of microvascular invasion. They have more invasive growth as compared to all negative, all triple negative uh, tumor markers patients. So to summarize, all the three conventional biomarkers of HCC, that is AFP, DCP, and AFP-L3, have definite role in HCC diagnosis and prognosis, although AFP have been so much criticized that it is has poor role, but it, its role is established and we cannot go away with it. And individually, each of these biomarkers may not perform optimally, but when combined with each other, either all three together or at least two of them together, or when combined with other modalities, for example, alpha fetoprotein with ultrasound, they have increased utility. So these uh, biomarkers are going to stay uh, until we have better biomarkers available but uh, till now, all three of them are going to stay. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you for excellent work. I think that you put that in the right way. Now that we have another interesting uh, uh, talk in the same diagnostic part. After the serology, then we are talking about uh, pathology. And for that, we have Dr. Sanjay Kakar, who is the chief of uh, uh, hepatology pathology at uh, uh, San Francisco in the University of California, and who will be talking to us about the tissue diagnosis of HCC, the evolving concepts. Over to you, Dr. Sanjay. Yeah, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Ajay and Inasal for uh, inviting me to participate uh, in this session today. So as a, a liver pathologist, my role today will be to uh, evaluate the role of biopsy in uh, confirming the diagnosis of HC, HCC and uh, with emphasis on comparison with uh, uh, the radiologic techniques as well as uh, implications on uh, management. And then I would also like to highlight some of the tools that we have in our arsenal for highlighting the liver, for the, making the diagnosis, just provide you a brief uh, glimpse of that. And then finally, I would like to also emphasize uh, some of the other uh, information that can be gleaned from the liver biopsy that can have uh, important clinical implications. So we all know that uh, uh, the guidelines from various uh, liver societies uh, have uh, stated that tissue diagnosis is not necessary if imaging findings are typical in uh, high-risk settings uh, such as uh, uh, cirrhosis. At the same time, there are significant discrepancies in imaging versus biopsy diagnosis that have also been stated uh, in these guidelines. So uh, let's review some of the uh, uh, literature uh, which uh, dates back to more than 15 years. So this was one of the first studies uh, which showed that uh, uh, of 30 HCCs uh, that were transplanted based on imaging diagnosis, uh, the uh, explant liver did not show uh, any HCC in 27% uh, of uh, cases. And similar figures uh, were also found in um, a much larger study that was uh, done subsequently. And as we know, HCC uh, bumps up uh, the priority for liver transplantation, at least in the US. So the, this had very important uh, implications and uh, at that point of time, uh, the smaller uh, HCC, that is T1, less than two centimeter, did not receive uh, priority anymore for transplantation because of this uh, high uh, rate of false positive diagnosis. So more recently, uh, another study that came from UCSF, uh, this uh, was more than 300 HCC cases. So this focused on T2, which is more than two centimeters so, uh, size uh, tumors, which had not received any local regional therapy. And this study found that 11% of T2 HCCs that were diagnosed based on imaging did not have any HCC on the explant liver. And they also concluded that the LIRADs did not have any impact on this conclusion. Uh, so a couple of other studies uh, which uh, compare the diagnosis of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and HCC based on the LIRADs uh, scoring. So here's a study from 2016, which showed that uh, the LRM category for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the accuracy rate was 80%. And um, there were three observers in this study. So the LR5, uh, among the LR5 cases, 
2.9 uh, to 11.4% uh, were intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas. And very similar results in a more recent study that 17% uh, of LRM were HCCs and close to 10% of LR5 were um, uh, not HCC, but other malignant neoplasms. Uh, another recent study, which also shows very similar numbers uh, that uh, in the neighborhood of um, 10% or so of LR5 to 10% of LR5 uh, turn out to be uh, tumors other than uh, HCC. So if you really examine the uh, pathologic evaluation of uh, these uh, uh, false positive tumors, then a variety of uh, benign as well as malignant conditions uh, uh, come up. So benign nodules, necrotic nodules, uh, FNH. I, I've seen a few FNH cases for, of uh, uh, tumors that were categorized as uh, LIRAD5. Uh, hemangiomas uh, can occasionally uh, be categorized as uh, LR5. And as you can see here, a small percentage of uh, these cases uh, turn out to be intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas. And here's another study which had very similar results. So they had 19 discrepant cases. Uh, six of them were in sclerotic uh, liver. So that's kind of the focus here. And out of these six, uh, three of them were intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas. Now this is uh, for uh, cholangiocarcinoma or uh, HCCs in general. But if we examine the subtypes of HCCs, there are some which uh, can pose even a, a greater challenge uh, for radiologic diagnosis. And here is one such uh, variant. Uh, this is a Scirus variant of HCC. And as you can see that uh, the tumor cells are embedded in abundant fibrous stroma. And abundant fibrous stroma is a characteristic feature of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, but this can occur in around five to eight percent of HCC as well. The tumor cells themselves show features of HCC. It's the abundant fibrous stroma uh, that can lead to uh, uh, challenges in diagnosis, both in in terms of radiology as well as, as well as pathology, because these tumors often show aberrant immunophenotype also. So markers like HEPAR are all, um, often negative in these cases, and they can show CK19 positivity. So they can kind of mimic the immunophenotype of uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and a wider set of markers, which include lipican-3 and arginase, can help uh, in the accurate diagnosis of uh, these tumors. Now, um, there are a lot of studies in the literature which show that the imaging features of Scirus HCC overlap significantly with those of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, and they often show you know, delayed enhancement and rim enhancement and so on. Uh, typical MR features of HCC in one study were seen in only uh, uh, less than a third of uh, uh, Scirus HCC uh, cases. So here is some uh, uh, kind of a summary of the numbers. There's a very wide variation of reported uh, uh, specificity of HCC based on uh, imaging. But in general, some of the uh, uh, numbers based on the uh, larger studies are that uh, of the LR5 uh, lesions, around 3 to 10% are uh, or turn out to be intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And among the uh, LRM, around 15 to 20% are HCC. And lower numbers of LR2 and LR3 may, be, uh, may turn out to be HCCs uh, as well. Now let's translate these numbers into um, the practical connotations. What do they actually mean uh, for management? So we know that uh, a diagnosis of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma has very significant implications uh, uh, irrespective of what management is being chosen. For example, if it's a resectable tumor, because of the high rate of uh, lymph node involvement, uh, lymph node dissection is often performed in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, but not necessarily in HCC. Uh, similarly, for um, uh, the uh, uh, chemotherapy, uh, cholangiocarcinomas often respond to gemcitabine or F uh, 5 fu based therapies, and now we have uh, targeted therapies depending on the mutational profile. Uh, these uh, uh, drugs, of course, don't uh, uh, make a difference in HCC, which has uh, uh, the standard treatment now has become you know, VEGF and PDL1 inhibitors, uh, sorafenib, and so on. But uh, you can see the stark difference in the approach uh, depending on the uh, diagnosis. And as has been discussed uh, earlier, also uh, the liver transplantation uh, for HCC you know, is, of course, indicated uh, if the patient is within Milan or UCSF criteria or other criteria, depending on the 
institutions policy, but in a wide variety of institutions, uh, yeah, diagnosis of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma will likely lead to a denial in liver transplantation. So even though the discrepant uh, numbers may be in the range of five to 10%, they can have a huge impact uh, on um, uh, patient management. Some of the other rare HCC mimics on imaging uh, you know, are tumors like uh, angiomyolipoma, which uh, there's a lot of literature showing that these are virtually indistinguishable from HCC on imaging. Uh, the same can happen sometimes in angiosarcomas and benign vascular tumors. But these are rare instances, and uh, they are even less relevant in the context of uh, uh, cirrhosis. So let's examine the uh, pathologic diagnosis of HCC. This is a slightly older study, but uh, they went through the literature and reviewed more than 200 studies and then selected a few which uh, were stronger studies to come up with these uh, uh, numbers. So in uh, their analysis, the specificity was uh, 100%, uh, but I think nothing is 100% in medicine. So I think it's more accurate to say that uh, the specificity of diagnosis is more than 95% in liver biopsies. Uh, the sensitivity in uh, this analysis uh, range, the range uh, was uh, 66 to 93%. Uh, but if you see the lower end of the range, which was uh, based on one study, they used a thin gauge needle. And uh, when uh, and that study was excluded, the uh, sensitivity is more than 90%. So that's pretty much the uh, conclusion that you will reach if you do an extensive review of literature that specificity in the, is in the range of more than 95, 95 to 100%, and the sensitivity is uh, uh, more than 90% for a liver biopsy. Some of the limitations of liver biopsy are uh, that smaller tumors have much lower sensitivity. They tend to be in the neighborhood of 80% or so, and there will be certain percentage of cases where the biopsy will prove to be inadequate uh, for uh, diagnosis, especially if uh, the tumor is located in a a location which is more challenging to target. But in general, if uh, a 14 to 16 gauge needle is used and adequate biopsy uh, for 1.5 centimeter or more is obtained, I think the problem of inadequate biopsy becomes uh, uh, much, much smaller. So the two main risks that have been um, uh, mentioned in the context of liver biopsy is bleeding and tumor seeding. The risk of uh, severe bleeding is um, quite rare in uh, most series, and it's 0.5% or, or lower. But tumor seeding, and if you see poor data, it comes to more than uh, it comes to less than three percent, and it can be it has been at least advocated that it can be lowered by the using uh, the coaxial technique. And uh, in the few cases where tumor seeding does occur, it can be successfully managed with ablation or localized resection and it has no impact on uh, outcome. In this context, I would like to uh, just share the quote from the EASL guidelines in 2018, that it is widely accepted that the potential risks, bleeding, needle tra track, seeding are infrequent, manageable, and do not affect the course of disease or overall survival. So in general, they should not be seen as a reason to abstain from diagnostic uh, liver biopsy. So let me provide you a brief uh, glimpse uh, to the tools for that we have for diagnosis. I'm not gonna go into any uh, you know, detail uh, on this. So the two common scenarios that present uh, to a liver pathology are the distinction of high-grade dysplastic nodule versus well-differentiated HCC at one end of the spectrum. And then the, at the other end of the spectrum, we have to distinguish between HCC and other malignant uh, neoplasms. In most cases, the distinction between high-grade dysplastic nodule and a progressed HCC, meaning that which has cytologic and architectural atypia, is yeah, pretty straightforward. The challenge occurs in the setting of early HCC, often tumors that are less than two centimeters, and they may not have very well-developed cytologic and uh, architectural atypia. And the distinction in some of these cases is based on stromal invasion, which may not be sampled on a biopsy. And some of the other features that can be helpful are the diffuse the sinusoidal staining with CD34, which is a, a feature that occurs because of arterialization. And then uh, these three immunostains, which are actually mentioned in many of the clinical guidelines also, that a combination of these three, glutamine synthetase, 
Lipican 3 and heat shock protein 70 uh, can be helpful now for uh, this distinction. So here's an example. On one side, you have a, a cirrhotic liver and the same uh, uh, biopsy had uh, another code which showed these atypical features with small cell change and crowding. So this degree of cytologic atypia with an artery and no accompanying bile duct. That's very strongly suggestive of HCC. But at this well differentiated end of the spectrum, it's always good to further confirm the diagnosis with further workup. And these are the three stains that I was mentioning earlier, which um, were suggested based on these two Italian studies. The first one was resection, second was done in biopsy. And if you just focus on this column, it states that if any two of these three are, are positive, then um, the sensitivity is 72% uh, in resection, 50% in biopsies, and none of the HCC or none of the dysplastic nodules showed uh, staining with two or more markers. But in my own experience, uh, by the time HSP70 and Lipican 3 are positive, I really don't need this, those stains. I can just make the diagnosis uh, based on HNE, reticulin, and so forth. So I, I think those are not, practically speaking, very helpful. But glutamine synthetase does help if it is diffuse. Uh, it um, indicates beta ketinin activation and can really help in borderline cases. So here's the example I showed you. You can see the diffuse uh, CD34 staining. The HSP70 is showing nuclear staining here. The glutamine synthetase is diffuse, and glipican 3 is negative. And this kind of profile can help in confirming the diagnosis. So in distinguishing HCC from other malignant neoplasms, we have a very wide set of hepatocellular markers, so HEPAR, arginase being the most common. And in the poorly differentiated end of the spectrum, uh, glipican 3 can also be uh, very helpful. And here's an example of um, an HCC which showing arginase positivity and HEPAR uh, is negative. Just to emphasize that uh, a panel of markers is very essential for making a diagnosis uh, because of variable sensitivity uh, and specificity of these markers. We also have the albumin in situ hybridization, which has very high sensitivity for HCC, but it's also positive in intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma. So it's helpful in confirming a liver primary but not necessarily distinguishing HCC from intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma. So another tool that we have in our arsenal now is uh, the characteristic mutational profile, which uh, can help in even the diagnosis in certain challenging cases. So we know that uh, intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma is characterized by IDH uh, and FR mutations, FGFR2 fusions, which are very uncommon, or very rare in HCC while uh, beta ketin mutations and TERP promoter mutations are more typical of um, you know, HCC. So here's an example of a case that was very hard to classify based on the uh, HNE features in immuno immunohistochemistry. So here you can see uh, the HNE features which have kind of overlapping uh, characteristics of HCC and cholangic carcinoma. There was some vague gland formation. HEPAR was positive, but so was CK19, very strongly positive and other hepatocellular markers were negative. So given the strong implications of treatment, uh, it was very difficult to classify this one way or the other. And the genomic analysis really helped because it showed IDH1 mutation and then pointed towards a diagnosis of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma uh, in this case. So let me, uh, uh, in the final portion, highlight some of the features in addition to the diagnosis that liver biopsy can provide. The differentiation of the tumor has been used in selecting patients for liver transplantation in uh, uh, some centers. And this has been done for many years in the University of uh, Toronto. And what they have uh, shown is that if you take the patients who are beyond the long criteria and uh, do a biopsy and exclude the poorly differentiated ones, then the outcomes are very similar to those which are within the Milan criteria. And the similar results have also been obtained uh, using the Hangzhou criteria, which also includes tumor differentiation. Uh, it does have, suffer from limitations such as intra-observer variability in assigning uh, poor differentiation to HCC, as well as there's some inherent sampling error because the poorly differentiated area may not be sampled. Uh, some of the other poor prognostic features like CK19 and histologic variants uh, have not been put into practice yet, uh, but they can also provide prognostic information. 
And uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, this is a newly described variant, the macrotubacular massive variant, which is characterized by these very thick cell plates, and as well as the sarcomatoid variant, which resembles a sarcoma. And both of these are associated with the poor outcome. Biopsy also enables the histologic subtyping of HCC. I already talked about scarus, macrotrabecular, sarcomatoid variants. And then we have the fibrolamellar variant, which is uh, you know, totally distinctive in terms of uh, its molecular profile. It has a higher rate of lymph node metastasis, which may have an impact on the surgical approach. And then we have lymphocyte-rich HCC, uh, which is characterized by a very prominent lymphoid infiltrate. And uh, this may predict response to immunotherapy. And finally, liver biopsy also provides uh, the opportunity to characterize the tumor in terms of its uh, genomic profile. And there are a variety of classifications that have been proposed uh, based on gene expression profiles, mutational profile, although none of them have really entered uh, a clinical practice yet. Now, there have been other uh, uh, you know, suggestions in the literature about the impact of genomic features and response to treatment, such as wedged FA, amplification and response to sorafenib, meta-amplification and response to meta-inhibitors. Uh, certain mutations may respond to mTOR inhibitors. And it has been uh, uh, estimated that around 20 to 30% of HCCs, uh, which are intermediate or advanced, may have uh, mutations that uh, are amenable to targeted therapy using drugs that are already FDA approved. And in the context of the fact that um, now, FGFR2 inhibitors are approved in uh, intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma, and IDH1 are going to be approved also. It further emphasizes the really important uh, uh, aspect of confirming the diagnosis because of these various therapies that are available. So I'm going to end uh, by highlighting uh, two of these uh, editorials that appeared in uh, uh, Apatology a few years back. Uh, one of them, they were proposed competing ideas. Uh, one of them advocated liver biopsy, and the other one uh, stated that liver biopsy should not be done just because of research purposes, which I agree with. And as I have emphasized, I think the main role of liver biopsy in today's terms is not really for research, which will, of course, be very useful, but it's primarily to make the diagnosis uh, uh, so that appropriate therapy uh, can be administered. So I'm going to end with somewhat a, a provocative uh, summary that biopsy for HCC should be considered in all cases, uh, regardless of imaging results, uh, provided, of course, that this is uh, likely to make a difference in management and there are no contraindications like you know, decompensated cirrhosis and so on. And then, of course, there are widely accepted indications which have already been mentioned, such as atypical imaging, uh, LR4 category, LRN category, and LIRADS, and, uh, of course, in non cirrhotic liver uh, as well. And in addition to the biopsy information, uh, in addition to diagnostic information, biopsy can also provide prognostic information and molecular profiles, which uh, can be clinically significant depending on the setting. And I'll end uh, with uh, a few more quotes from the uh, easel guidelines. So biopsy has to be considered if a higher level of certainty is required, especially if systemic therapies are going to be used. Uh, potential complications are rare and uh, do not justify abstaining from a diagnostic biopsy. And finally, uh, a word about clinical trials, that it's really very important that uh, a biopsy be done for clinical trials of HCC. You know, a lot of money is spent on these trials, and this can really help in expanding treatment options and evaluating the results in uh, a much better fashion. Okay, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kakkar. And the next uh, talk will be by Dr. John Kiziel, and he'll be speaking on liquid biopsy, the diagnostic and prognostic role in HCC. Dr. John? Thank you very much. I'm uh, hoping to share my screen at this point. Uh, please let me know if you're seeing the presenter yes, view or the presentation view. Uh, this is the presentation view, if you can put it on a full screen. Is this better? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, so uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak on this topic. Um, by way of disclosures, I do um, have a role as an inventor of intellectual property that will be uh, discussed today that we are commercializing with um, a, a company called Exact Sciences. My other disclosure is that I'm not a hepatologist. I primarily treat uh, patients with colorectal cancer, uh, but my research program is uh, heavily focused on the development of uh, liquid biopsy for early detection of cancer. Um, I'm going to review um, or summarize uh, topics that have already been covered, including the unmet need for biomarkers in HCC and examine the concept of liquid biopsy within this disease, and then describe our work in developing the multi-target HCC blood test, primarily for surveillance. Um, there is much less uh, data available on alternate liquid biopsy approaches for HCC and specifically uh, centered around diagnosis of HCC as opposed to surveillance, and probably even less data available on the potential uses of liquid biopsy for um, therapy selection uh, and or monitoring response to treatment. HCC, as is well known by this audience, is the second leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide, and its incidence is rising in the United States and will probably overtake colorectal cancer fatality by the end of this decade. Because symptom onset uh, is a predictor of poor survival, uh, surveillance is the preferred strategy, and currently that is with ultrasound and AFP, as mentioned by Dr. Kumar earlier. And uh, also presented in his talk it was this meta-analysis uh, showing that the combination of the two tests is still relatively insensitive for curable stage HCC. Therefore, I think that there remains a critical and unmet need to improve early detection of HCC, and there are significant advantages to biomarkers in this, uh, in this task. Specifically, unlike ultrasound, they are operator independent and may hopefully improve access and compliance with early detection programs, which are presently, uh, compliance is, is quite poor in the United States. Um, the newer protein-based models such as GALAD that came up earlier will um, still miss about 30% of curable stage HCC. Um, and thus, uh, this led uh, our team and many others to assess the role of liquid biopsy for the detection of HCC, spurred on by uh, successes in other diseases, including the liquid biopsy for colorectal cancer, that is the multi-target stool DNA test. There's also been explosive growth in biomarker discovery approaches and a cornucopia of potential markers to choose from. HCC may be particularly well suited to a liquid biopsy approach for early detection. Uh, as we know, the liver receives about a third of cardiac output and in the state of health, um, Liver specific DNA comprises about, uh, is really only second to white blood cell or leukocyte DNA in terms of its background level in healthy plasma. In the setting of HCC, the uh, liver specific DNA globally, this is not tumor specific DNA, but liver specific DNA rises markedly. This uh, circulating DNA that we find in patients with or without HCC is highly fragmented, roughly 160 base pairs in length. And that leads us to focus uh, for biomarker identification on single strand level phenomena like mutation or methylation events, as opposed to higher order structures like nucleosomes or chromosomal fragments. HCC um, mutations, unfortunately, are heterogeneous and relatively uncommon. So even uh, the, the high abundance mutations that we heard about in the last lecture are relatively low in terms of their prevalence uh, in a population of tumors. And the HCC as a disease has very high uh, tumor heterogeneity. And this leads to relatively poor performance of existing multi-gene panels. To uh, target a much larger number of mutations, um, to target mutations that have uh, potential um, pathogenic significance across large genes like p53, 
um, sequencing is really required. And this is difficult to automate at large scale for the millions of patients who might need it. Um, and tissue informed uh, um, bespoke panels actually will actually require a biopsy in order to develop those, which is not always practical uh, or possible in this disease. In contrast, DNA methylation is substantially more broadly informative. And by that, I mean that relatively few methylation events are, are represented in most uh, tumors. And that's uh, in not only in HCC, but in this example from colorectal cancer, where only four methylated DNA markers were found in nearly all of the advanced adenomas and primary tumors that were studied by a targeted PCR approach. DNA methylation also has a biologic significance in cancer, as we demonstrated in this older study that methylated uh, bone morphogenic protein 3 uh, is a tumor suppressor gene in uh, bile duct cancer, and that's been shown for colon cancer and gastric cancer as well. Our assessment of DNA methylation in hepatocellular carcinoma began with reduced representation by sulfite sequencing. So this is a next generation DNA sequencing approach that was done in frozen tissues from cases and controls. And we identified easily uh, at least 250 novel differentially methylated regions that had an area under the operating characteristics curve of at least 0.75. And this was filtered from about a terabyte of data with over uh, 2 million reads that were sequenced at at least tenfold uh, depth. We then performed an independent validation study using uh, DNA extracted from formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples from normal controls, serotic controls, tumors from non serotic patients, and ACCs from serotic patients. This uh, matrix display uh, shows uh, each individual patient is a column uh, and each individual methylated DNA marker is a row. The increasing uh, color intensity of uh, the red to, sorry, yellow to red spectrum indicates deciles of methylation intensity that are above the 95th percentile value in the control patient samples. This also allows you to look across markers to look for potential combinations of markers that may be informative or complementary. And here we can see that just the top five markers alone uh, showed over 96% sensitivity. And this is in, uh, in, in DNA extracted from primary tumor tissues. Thus, we felt as though we had identified promising directions in this field, and in the uh, lexicon of the National Cancer Institute Early Detection Research Network Biomarker Development Roadmap, we felt as though we had a, a promising phase one uh, study completed. Um, phase two, in which one develops a clinical assay and validates it in patients with or without established disease, is a substantially more complicated process. This required uh, four sequential and independent large-scale case control uh, studies in patients with uh, a broad range of stages of HCC, a broad range of underlying liver etiologies producing the HCC, and uh, an extensive number of uh, serotic and non-serotic control patients. Um, we uh, took 10 of the markers that I showed you on the prior matrix slide uh, and tested them in plasma samples from cases and controls, uh, eliminating about four markers heading into the marker selection study, which uh, identified uh, three markers of particular interest, HOXA1, TSPYL5 and normalized to B3GALT6. Um, we looked at complementarity for existing serum markers, including AFP, DCP, and the L3 fraction, uh, and selected AFP to put into a final algorithm setting study. And then that algorithm was uh, validated in yet a fourth independent set of cases and controls. This is uh, data that was uh, recently presented by Amit Singhal at ASLD and uh, published uh, earlier this year in CGH. 
The um, clinical validation study overall performance for this new test that we call the multi-target uh, hepatocellular carcinoma blood test, that's the combination of methylation, AFP, and sex, showed 82% sensitivity in BCL st stage 0 and A patients at a specificity of 97%. This was significantly higher than AFP and significantly higher sensitivity than GALAD at a pre-specified cutoff of negative 0.63. The early stage sensitivity, the BCLC stage 0 and A, were also significantly higher. The specificity, however, was lower than AFP, and that was at a cutoff of AFP of uh, 20 uh, or greater, and was also less specific than GALAD. When we match the specificity of uh, GALAD to the specificity of the multi-target stool DNA, or sorry, multi-target uh, HBT test, the sensitivity values were not significantly different. However, um, it is important to remember that these studies were powered for superiority to AFP, so we still consider this a very promising direction. What role would liquid biopsy um, potentially play in the diagnosis of HCC? Um, I think that HCC will be an important uh, target disease in an emerging uh, paradigm for cancer screening and early detection called multi-cancer early detection testing or MCED. Population level screening, at least in the United States, um, centers around cancers that have relatively high uh, overall prevalence, such as colorectal cancer, where the number needed to screen is about 170 patients to detect one cancer. These other uh, less common and uh, potentially much more aggressive and fatal diseases, such as esophageal, uh, stomach, hepatobiliary cancers, and pancreatic cancers are not screened because their prevalence is too low and the number needed to screen is too high. If it were possible to detect just one of these diseases at the same point of care of screening for colorectal cancer, potentially by a liquid biopsy that could sample more than one disease from blood plasma, the prevalence of the diseases in aggregate would increase and thus lower the overall number needed to screen. It would also increase the positive predictive value for cancer, uh, regardless of the specificity cutoff of, uh, of that multi-cancer early detection test. We assessed this in proof of concept using a um, methylated DNA and protein um, multi-target test to detect uh, not only um, other common gastrointestinal cancers, but also liver cancer and ovarian cancer. In this training and test set analysis that we presented earlier this year at the AACR meeting, a five methylated DNA marker and three protein panel had an area under the operating characteristics curve of 0.95 in the training set and 0.96 in the validation set. You know, it's important to emphasize that this study was not powered to tell these cancers apart and that these were primarily stage two through four cancers, the exception being liver, which included a few BCLC stage zero and A. There are other competitors in this space, including uh, the Thrive Company, which has been acquired by Exact Sciences. They have a test called CancerSeq, which assesses multiple gene mutations and proteins. And in their Detect A cohort study of over 10,000 women ages 65 to 75, the CancerSeq panel at a cutoff of 99% detected 26 cancers that would have not been picked up by either symptoms or standard of care. It's important to note that uh, two of those cancers, one was liver and one was bile duct, were uh, found in patients that were not otherwise suspected of being at risk of those diseases. Similarly, uh, the GRAIL uh, Corporation and their uh, laboratory developed test now called Gallery offer an additional characteristic, which is the cancer signal of origin. And that um, may ultimately give clinicians uh, and patients uh, an idea of where a positive signal is coming from. This recently published large case control study of over 2,800 cancer patients and over 1,200 controls 
had an overall sensitivity of only about 52%, but at a specificity of 99.5%. The sensitivity for cancer increased uh, depending on which the particular uh, tumor subtypes were. So the individual sensitivities for some diseases may be quite low, but for others, including uh, hepatobiliary cancers, the signal in, um, in this population of uh, case patients was quite high. And this did include a substantial number of early stage patients. What's exciting about this data and this approach, which uses next generation sequencing for a large number of methylated DNA targets, is that the um, test results are actually able to classify where the primary tumor is located. So the actual uh, cancer primary uh, tumor uh, location is on the uh, x-axis, the um, predicted by the panel origin is on the y-axis and the diagonal indicates the number of concordant hits. And in this example, 82% um, of the hepatobiliary cancers were correctly localized by molecular signal. Now, this is an exciting uh, uh, progress uh, because of the fact that we expect that there are large numbers of patients at risk for HCC in the general population who are not under surveillance because they don't know that they have cirrhosis. That number has been estimated in the United States to be about 70% of cirrhotic patients are unaware that they have it, and the HCC may be their first presentation of that illness. This testing is not currently sophisticated enough to discriminate uh, liver cancers from bile duct cancers. And so additional diagnostic confirmation uh, by MRI or CT would likely be required. I'll conclude by speaking briefly about potential new use cases for liquid biopsy in uh, treating patients with HCC and monitoring their response to therapy. And this has been touched upon in prior lectures. In patients eligible for curative treatment, whether that's transplant, uh, resection, or ablation, but particularly for those receiving uh, local therapy, uh, the majority of patients will experience uh, disease recurrence within a fairly short period of time. And that can be due to inadequate recognition or resection of synchronous minimal residual disease which may be underappreciated by imaging. It's these patients with minimal residual disease, however, who are anticipated to benefit most from emerging adjuvant treatments uh, trials, which are uh, currently in progress with over 120 uh, national uh, clinical trial registered um, uh, protocols in adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy for HCC. Um, obviously, the uh, remaining liver is still diseased and has a field cancerization defect, which can predispose to the emergence of de novo independent metachronous lesions. And it is for that reason that after treatment, we uh, currently perform surveillance with cross-sectional imaging and AFP. Could liquid biopsy be more sensitive or specific in that setting as well. And that's important because we know that for patients with early detection of recurrence, salvage resection therapy or local regional therapy can be beneficial and it could lead to earlier initiation of systemic therapy. To explore this uh, as part of a, a grant application, we took a look at data from the marker elimination study that we published back in 2019 and uh, looked at patients that were sufficiently early in stage to undergo potentially curative therapy, either through transplantation, resection, or local regional therapy. For patients with um, a prototype value of methylated DNA markers falling above the 50th percentile, it was noted that those patients had reduced probability of going to transplant, increased probability of recurrence, and reduced overall survival. This has led to um, a grant application in this space with my colleague, uh, Dr. Wen Tran, who will attempt to assess whether or not preoperative liquid biopsy results are associated with recurrence and help set a threshold for detection of recurrent disease using the multi-target um, liquid biopsy test we have for HCC, as well as to try to determine if um, we can detect disease molecularly before we can uh, radiographically. 
this is a competitive field and there are several other groups that are involved in looking at circulating tumor DNA or other liquid biopsy um, uh, markers for disease monitoring or prognostication in HCC. However, as uh, when reviewed in a publication earlier this year, the um, currently available literature is relatively small. Um, most of the studies are limited in terms of their small sample size and early phase research. Thus, uh, I conclude that surveillance for HCC will likely benefit from expanding biomarkers, including the multi-target HCC blood test, which was commercialized and launched earlier this year on a limited basis in the United States. There's currently a prospective study enrolling in comparison of that test to ultrasound. Liquid biopsy is anticipated to find um, HCCs in patients who are otherwise quote unquote average risk and not aware of their underlying cirrhosis, but will likely not replace contrast enhanced imaging or biopsy for diagnosis and is anticipated to have an increasing role in management of patients after HCC is identified. I'll thank my uh, outstanding research team and funding sources here, including our collaborators at Exact Sciences, and look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you, Dr. John. Uh, Dr. John uh, Kisiel is the director of GI Neoplasia Interest Group and the associate professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic uh, College of Medicine and Science, and a consultant in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Mayo Clinic. And we are already running very late. We're already 15 minutes late. So we have a nice panel and I'd request the panelists uh, to keep their questions, comments and observations brief. We have Dr. Ashim Das, Dr. Radhika Srinivasan, Dr. Surinder Rana, Dr. Maki Raki Maiwal and Dr. Mithun Sharma. So may I request uh, the panelists, Dr. Ashim? Yes. Thank you. So uh, this is very three excellent lectures on the three aspects of the management of hepatocellular carcinoma. Being a pathologist, I just want to highlight, I think I want to ask Dr. Sanjay that uh, what pathologists should uh, convey other than confirming the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma in a true cut biopsy? Sanjay, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Das. Uh, I had uh, mentioned some of the uh, additional features that the biopsy can provide in uh, the uh, aspect of HCC, and whether they are relevant or not depends on the situation. So I had mentioned uh, differentiation of HCC, which is being used in some centers to select patients uh, for transplantation who are beyond the Milan criteria. So if that is the clinical context, that uh, is relevant, then differentiation would become important. And similarly, other uh, features like the genomic features, if any specific targeted therapies are being considered, which I think we are not quite there yet, but uh, that is likely to become important in the future. But in general, for now, I think the most important uh, role of liver biopsy is to make the diagnosis of HCC and uh, ensure that it is not uh, other malignant tumors, or it's not a benign diagnosis. I think that's the main clinical role today. And uh, subsequently, it is likely to expand to other areas. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kakkar. Uh, Dr. Radhika? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Ajay uh, and also NSL for giving me this opportunity to be on this panel. Uh, we had, of course, again, three excellent talks, uh, starting from the serum alpha fetoprotein to liquid biopsy. So uh, one, the questions to Dr. Sanjay, uh, uh, yeah, you know, you showed a case um, where, uh, wherein you said the genomic diagnosis could will help you diagnose uh, um, cholangiocarcinoma vis-a-vis -vis HCC. Uh, my comment was simply, uh, you know, you could have uh, both tumors in the same uh, uh, having different regions, one, one showing HCC and one showing the other. We had a previous speaker who was referring to the usage of the term primary liver cancer and giving the proportions of both the cancers. And of course, in a small biopsy, even if you do genomics, there is always the limitation of hitting a particular area, which may show you a particular 
uh, mutation. And if you were to sample more areas of the tumor, you could come up with more mutations. And perhaps that is where uh, liquid biopsy probably uh, would have an advantage uh, over actually uh, doing uh, genomics on tissue samples. And uh, um, basically, I think the biggest uh, challenge, um, how I do not know how we are going to adapt and evolve uh, with liquid biopsy being a real challenge to you know histopathologists, I think. So you could comment on that. Uh, and just another small comment on, uh, we had a case of neuroendocrine differentiation in, finally we thought there was some neuroendocrine differentiation in HCC, whether you've seen that or not. And lastly, um, where do you think uh, final aspiration biopsy actually fits in? There are several centers in the world, not just in India, and of course, PGI is one of the centers wherein we have very well-developed uh, cytopathologists, uh, cytopathology expertise available. And uh, we have uh, given this HCC diagnosis. Or Nowadays, you should remember that it's not just smears. We also do cell blocks, which act like microbiopsies. So perhaps, you know, at least in several situations, they could be equivalent to uh, a corneal biopsy. So that is one thing. Those are three things for you. And I'll just finish my uh, comments again. Uh, I think uh, when we look at HCC, you know, we had uh, in the initial talks uh, that the etiopathogenesis and the etiology of HCC is so different. Uh, it, it, and indeed it is changing over, over ages. You know, we had Dr. Ajay telling us right now we have uh, a different kind of profile than what it was even 10 years ago in our own center. So I think we should really look at HCC from, uh, you know, whether it, you're looking at imaging or histopathology from the etiological point of view, whether it's, even if, whether it's liquid biopsy and HCC, which is HBV related, may be totally different from what is related in HCC related to NAPLD or NASH. So, I mean, that, that is something for all the panelists to actually um, respond. And uh, a specific question to Dr. John that are you going to, are you looking into a pan cancer blood test? Thank you so much. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. That's Radhika. a lot of questions, so if you could answer some of them. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Uh, one line answers. So, Dr. Radhika, I totally agree with you that genomic findings do overlap. If you look at the TCGA data, classic uh, HCC mutations like third promoter mutations were seen in a small minority of cholangiocarcinomas. And similarly, IDH1 mutations have been reported in hepatocellular carcinoma. I myself seen a very differentiated HCC with IDH1 mutation. So this is not any magic bullet, which will just give, deliver all the answers. So genomic findings have to be put along with morphology, the um, immunostochemical profile to make the diagnosis. And uh, it does not make the diagnosis in isolation. In terms of neuroendocrine differentiation in HCC, uh, neuroendocrine differentiation is very kind of a term that is used differently by different people. If uh, you just say mean staining with neuroendocrine markers, that uh, does occur in a minority of HCC that they will have staining for synaptophysin, chromogranin very very rarely, and there are some other tumors which are not HCC which can be synaptophysin chromogranin positive, including the recently described you know, cholangiocarcinoma variant which is inhibin positive. And that can be mistaken for HCC. So there's a, a, a lot to put in, uh, 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 unpack in that question of neuroendocrine differentiation. So, thank you so in much. In terms of uh, FNAC versus core biopsy, yes, if, if there's an adequate sample, FNAC can be good enough and you can do all the amino stains. You can even do the genomic profiling by a good cell block uh, sample. Uh, where the problems arise is if it's a really challenging diagnosis, then you don't have the architecture to look at you cannot really interpret the two dimensional synthetase staining because that requires uh, architecture. So there are some drawbacks, but in a good sample, in many of the cases, you can make the diagnosis by FNAC. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raki. Yeah, uh, I will be very brief and I will just ask one question uh, to Dr. John first. Uh, where do you foresee in future the uh, role of liquid bi biopsy uh, in the context of diagnosis or in context of monitoring the progression or response to the treatment modalities? I, I think that they are both uh, fair game. So uh, going back to Dr. Radika's question, I think that in, in diagnosis that 
the idea of a of a pan cancer or multi cancer blood based test um, is not designed to probably tell HCC from CCA, but rather to try to identify more asymptomatic patients in the general population. So um, I foresee that. Um, uh, multi-target testing will result in an increased workload for our radiology and pathology colleagues, not, uh, not less. Um, I think also um, in terms of th the same tools and technology can certainly be applied to uh, monitoring response to treatment, identifying patients who could benefit from uh, downstaging, prognosticating and helping select patients for particular types of therapy, as well as monitoring uh, disease recurrence. And there are many groups that are active in this space um, to try to build on the body of evidence that's already been uh, established with uh, serology. Thank you, Dr. John. Dr. Surinder Rana, please. Yeah, excellent talks. Just two short questions. One to Ashish. Uh, what do you think is the role of microRNA as a biomarker in HCC? And to Sanjay, a short question. How do you look at the role of endoscopic ultrasound guided fine needle biopsy in diagnosis of HCC? Thank you, Dr. Surinder. So I had covered mainly the conventional biomarkers, the AFP and uh, these micro RNAs and all these are emerging biomarkers and they have, haven't been studied in uh, larger studies. So we need more studies before they can be recommended for routine screening or for diagnosis of HCC in these patients. And uh, regarding the EOS uh, guided uh, biopsies, so we've started seeing uh, some uh, gastroenterologists doing the core biopsies using EOS guided FNAs. And uh, you know, they are really uh, very brave. I mean, I've gotten like 10, 12 cores as a pathologist. I love it. So if you can provide me 12 cores from a tumor during US guided biopsy, I think that would be perfect. Thank right. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Mitsun? Dr. Mitsun? That's a small question to uh, Dr. Ashish. So what cutoff do you pra use practically for BIFCA2? And how often in your practice do you see cases with alpha fetoprotein high with no SOL on imaging? And how do you go about it? Uh, see, the, uh, for cutoff of BIFCA2, it's uh, because it's uh, uh, available in very few centers in India. So generally, most of the centers have recommended for uh, that uh, at least 200 to 300 cutoff. But uh, I found that above 40, there's an increased suspicion of uh, HCC. Regarding the uh, patients with uh, no SOL but uh, high uh, AFP, I've seen multiple times. It is more commonly seen when there's rapidly dividing uh, hepatocytes, especially like acute liver failure or acute and chronic liver failure settings where they are rapidly dividing hepatocytes. So they would behave just like fetal hepatocytes, which are rapidly dividing and regenerating. So these patients may have uh, high AFP, but uh, low, uh, no SOL. But we need to be very careful with the imaging of these patients. Thank you. Thank you. We've had a excellent session with three wonderful talks. And since we are running late, I will close the session here and hand over the mic to the organizers. I think that said, before you wrap it up, I think just I wanted to thank on behalf of Inazal to all the faculty for this wonderful session and special thanks to Sanjay and John for joining us for the early morning, Saturday early morning. And I know there's a Thanksgiving weekend there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Sad you. you can just wrap it up here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So it seems that we had a very engaging discussion today and there's a lot to watch for in this space probably in the next few years. So with this uh, small comment, I would like to hand over the proceedings to Dr. Nipun Verma, who's an Associate Professor of Hepatology at PGI. Thank you, Dr. Sahaj. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank organizers and uh, let me have the pleasure to invite two big stalwarts in the field of hepatology, which who needs no introduction. Dr. Jang Bahadur Dilavri, a former professor and head department of hepatology, PGI Chandigarh, and Professor Rakesh Agarwal, director, Jipmar Puducherry, former professor of gastroenterology at SGPGI Lucknow, and immediate past president of INASAL. Over to you, sir. You need to unmute yourself, sir. Professor Dilavri, please. Yeah. Sir, can please, you see me? Uh, why don't you go ahead? We can't see you, sir. We can can you see you. me? Yes, yes, sir. We can yes. see you. Can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to chair this session. And this session is very important indeed, not because I'm chairing with Rakesh. It is important because only by early detection of cancer, of liver, liver cancer, one can do a benefit in survival, in surviving patients. So therefore, this session is very important, how it can help us for early detection of cancer. The first uh, talk is by Professor George Iano, who is Professor of Medicine, University of Washington, and is Director of Hepatology from Seattle, USA. And he's going to talk to us on role of risk stratification in HCC screening. Over to Professor Iano, please. Yeah, hi. Um, Professor, can everyone hear me? Yes. Good, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And let me see. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Can you see it in full screen mode? Yes. Okay. Good. No, we have the side panel also which shows all the slides. Okay, let me start again. Okay, how about now? Still not on the full slide. Still, still there. No. Uh, you need to, we have two windows, so you need to go to the other option. Yeah, I'm going to start. Let me see. I will um, share this, minimize my main screen, and Can I help you? Please no, it's okay. I, I think it sometimes does it with my multi screen, but I, I should be. Give me one minute. It should sense it, my second screen. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. All right. Now that should work, right? Yes, it did. You are okay. perfectly right. Please go ahead. So, sorry about this technical issue, which I'm going to blame on waking up at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning, but Thank you very much for uh, getting me up so early in the morning <laughs> for this presentation. And um, it, it was a pleasure to actually be able to watch some of the previous presentations that were a little bit late because I think a lot of what I have to say on risk stratification and HCC screening follows very naturally from some of the prior talks. So I'm going to start by highlighting something that shouldn't be news to anyone on this call, but just going over current HCC recommendations to say that the AASLD essentially recommends screening uh, for all patients with cirrhosis, with ultrasound, with or without AFPRE, and does not recommend screening in cases of advanced fibrosis currently or pre-cirrhotic liver disease. Um, and essentially, I have what one might call a one-size-fits-all strategy. And, this, and what this does not do is a, a, a account for great variations in the underlying risk of liver cancer among patients with cirrhosis and certainly among patients with pre liver disease. In addition, as you have heard before, um, the tests that are being recommended currently like ultrasound and alpha fetoprotein have relatively low effectiveness that is relatively low sensitivity and specificity and have been used in the same fashion for at least 30 years. Um, and, and I want, before I proceed, I wanted to highlight that there are differences between international liver societies. For example, ESL actually recommends screening by ultrasound, does not mention AFP. And for the most part, actually recommends that screening should also be considered in patients with advanced fibrosis. But the fundamental concept that I wanted to highlight to you uh, in terms of risk stratification and risk-based surveillance is shown in this slide. So currently what we have, the one size fits all strategy is if you have cirrhosis and hepatitis B, I'm not gonna talk about hepatitis B, but mostly focus on cirrhosis and other chronic liver diseases unrelated to hepatitis B. If you have cirrhosis, 
you get screening with ultrasound, with or without AFP. If you don't, you don't get any screening. But just to give you the bottom line up front, the concept of precision HCC screening or re-stratification involves the steps shown below. So first you utilize a number of baseline predictors or risk factors. You incorporate them into an HCC risk calculator and estimate an individual patient's risk of liver cancer. Then depending on that person's individual risk of liver cancer, graded, let's say from high risk all the way to very low risk, you can recommend different screening strategies that have potentially different effectiveness and also different costs. And this uh, concept of precision screening is gaining a lot of momentum in other cancers such as breast cancer. And I suspect that liver cancer can be a very important test case for this concept as well. And just to give you uh, some specific examples, because in the previous slide, in the yellow boxes, I was showing screening strategy one, screening strategy two, a hypothetical example just to help frame your mind, although it's purely hypothetical, might be something like if you have a very high risk of liver cancer, let's say greater than 2% per year, greater than 3% per year, a recommendation might be for that kind of patient to get abbreviated MRI. If you have medium risk to get ultrasound with or without biomarkers, if you have low risk to get biomarkers, and if you have very low risk potentially to get no screening. But we have a long ways before to get to that and I'm going to start from the beginning by highlighting some of the principles that underlie the concept of risk-based surveillance for liver cancer and for other cancers. The number one principle is that you have to have some wide variation in liver cancer risk in the at-risk population. And we have that in patients with cirrhosis, liver cancer risk can range from less than 0.2% to more than 5% per year. And if you include pre-cirrhotic liver disease, the variation is even greater. You also um, need to have, um, the, the second concept is that that's fundamental, and I'm gonna highlight it in the next slide, is that the cost effectiveness of a screening strategy depends on the incidence of, of liver cancer. So the higher the incidence, the much, much lower the, the cost of a screening strategy. And finally, uh, you need to have multiple screening strategies that have potentially different costs, um, but also different um, uh, effectiveness. And, and the idea here is that screening strategies that may be a lot more expensive, such as MRI or abbreviated MRI, can become cost-effective in populations who have a very high risk of cancer. And I'm gonna linger on the second concept a little bit before I dive into my presentation, because this is fundamental. Um, this is a figure that shows the relationship between the risk of screening, the risk of liver cancer, sorry, on the x-axis and the cost effectiveness of screening on the y-axis. And what it shows is that the cost of the cost effectiveness, the cost increases exponentially as the risk of screening declines. And if you have patients with say F3 fibrosis, um, who have a, a risk of liver cancer that's 0.3 or 0.4% per year, you end up with costs per quality adjusted life year of screening that are above $200,000 per quality adjusted life year, which is why it's so prohibitively expensive uh, to screen those patients. Uh, whereas if you have uh, liver cancer risks that are around 1% or 1.5% per year, you end up with uh, costs that are in the $50,000 per year range, which is considered somewhat arbitrarily the ballpark for what we think is acceptable to pay for liver cancer screening or for other screening modalities. But the fundamental concept here is not the details, but the concept that this incredible dependence of the cost effectiveness or the cost of screening on the underlying risk of the disease, the risk of cancer in the population. And so the I'm going to back to the beginning now and go back to the beginning and highlight the three components that I believe a risk-based surveillance strategy needs to have. And they correspond to the colors on the figure below. So in green, you need to have a way to estimate HCC risk, which as I said in the previous slide is the one of the single perhaps most important uh, component of the cost effectiveness of screening. So you need to be able to estimate liver cancer risk using some kind of risk calculator. And then you need to have multiple different strategies uh, of screening that potentially have different effectiveness, but also different costs and harms. If you only have one screening strategy like ultrasound, 
let's say there's no point in doing re-stratification because everybody's going to get the same screening strategy at the end. And then you need the part in the middle, uh, the red part that tells you at what threshold, specific thresholds, would you recommend each strategy? So at what risk of cancer greater than say 2%, 3% becomes your high risk strategy that at that point you recommend a specific screening strategy. So all those three components need to be in place. And in reality, most people like myself are working on different parts of this strategy, but ultimately it all needs to come together. So what about the first part, estimating HCC risk in individual patients? How do we do that? Um, well, we are lucky in, uh, in cirrhosis and in liver cancer, we have multiple risk factors that have been described over the years that are associated with liver cancer risk in patients with cirrhosis and in patients with pre-cirrhotic liver disease. This includes demographics like age, gender, race, and ethnicity. It includes comorbidities like diabetes and obesity. Many laboratory tests like low platelet count, the FIB4 or fibrosis 4 test, uh, albumin, alkaline phosphatase. The etiology of liver disease is very strongly predictive. Patients with active hepatitis C, for example, have much higher risk of liver cancer than other patients with cirrhosis. The stage of fibrosis, of course, is very important. Um, you know, the higher the stage of fibrosis, the higher the risk of liver cancer. And most of us even think of liver cancer exclusively in patients with cirrhosis, although that's not true. Liver stiffness measured by fiber scan may be related to liver cancer risk. Portal hypertension, if we could measure it non-invasively. And of course, there are a lot of genetic polymorphisms like PMPLA3 uh, that are associated with liver cancer. And even polygenic risk scores have been proposed that could bring together a number of uh, genetic polymorphisms into single scoring systems. And there may be biomarkers of early detection, um, you know, biomarkers ra rather of, of, of risk, which should be distinguished from biomarkers of early detection. Now, if you have a lot of risk factors, a lot of predictors like this, you need a way to bring it all together into a single score to estimate risk in an individual patient. And there are generally three ways one can do that. There are simple scoring systems that are already available that you can actually calculate yourself or calculate very readily. There are HCC, what I call HCC risk calculators, which are, again are fairly simple regression models. They're multivariable regression models, but again, essentially represent a simple linear formula. And then there are machine learning modalities that are gaining a lot more popularity because they're potentially more accurate. So what about simple HCC scoring systems? The FIB4 or the fibrosis 4, I suspect most people in this audience have heard about it and know about it. It's a very simple formula uh, consisting of age, the AST, the platelet count, and the square root of ALT. It was developed essentially as a non-invasive predictor of liver fibrosis and cirrhosis, but it turns out that it is also very good, perhaps even better at being a predictor of liver cancer. And in this particular study, a predictor of the risk of liver cancer. In this particular study, we looked at thousands of patients in the Veterans Affairs Hospital who uh, had hepatitis C that was eradicated by antiviral treatments. And we divided them into categories depending simply on their fibrosis four score before and after the antiviral uh, treatment, if it was greater than 3.25 or less than 3.25. And we divided them into cirrhosis and non-cirrhosis. And you end up with these eight mutually exclusive category and you see what an, an, a nice gradation in risk you have in each of these very, very simple categories. You can so easily ca categorize these patients into eight uh, mutually exclusive categories with great, very much uh, uh, um, graded risk of liver cancer and put them into different risks of liver cancer for a potential risk stratification strategy. Now, what about risk calculators, uh, um, uh, which are, like I said, simple regression models a number of them have already been described, such as the Toronto Liver uh, Cancer Risk Index, the AMAP score, and two scores that we've described uh, in the Veterans Affairs Healthcare System. And um, these are multivariable models. Uh, and you end up, what I'm going to show you in the next slide, um, you end up with uh, the potential to enter characteristics of a patient, something like eight or 10 or 15 at most uh, potential predictors and then the model will calculate based on an underlying regression formula that individual patient's three-year or five-year risk of liver cancer. This is just a screenshot from the models that we have developed that are available at hccris.com. And within the VA, at least, these have shown 
um, great sensitivity and specificity and are internally validated and are actually used now in the Veterans Affairs National Healthcare System uh, to categorize all of our patients with cirrhosis uh, for potential targeting and optimization of screening strategies. And then there are also um, machine learning modalities that can be used. And the allure, the attraction of machine learning is that potentially it can exceed in accuracy um, that of regression modeling. And there are tree-based models, there are neural networks models. Um, and the disadvantage of machine learning is that it is a bit of a black box. So you generally don't know, it spits out an answer, but you don't know exactly how it arrived at that answer, although there are ways to get around that. The other disadvantage of using uh, machine learning, especially neural networks, is that if it includes a very large number of inputs, it can be hard to execute in real clinical practice. But this is an example of a proof of principle study that we conducted where we used um, what's called recurrent neural networks in combination with a group at Michigan uh, to extract the entire electronic health records from patients in the um, National Veterans Affairs Healthcare System and to use 24 labs of patients with cirrhosis modeled over time um, and as well as some other predictors uh, to estimate their three-year risk of liver cancer. And in this study, this recurrent neural network machine learning model exceeded in calibration, uh, sorry, in discrimination in this study, the uh, models that we developed using the same data, but using traditional regression techniques. So the area under the ROC curve in green was slightly greater than that of regression models. The downside, of course, is that this recurrent neural network model cannot really be executed in clinical practice. It requires extreme computational power and none of the electronic health records systems that are currently available to my knowledge will be able to execute such a thing. Whereas the regression models can be executed in real time. Now the second uh, requirement for a restratification strategy is that you need to have multiple screening tests available to choose from depending on a person's underlying risk of liver cancer. And we've heard a lot about biomarkers from John, John Kisiel and others. So this is just a way to put it, kind of summarize it for you. So there are protein-based biomarkers that are already available, uh, such as the Fujifilm Wake panel, the GALA score. And there is a lot of excitement about circulating free tumor DNA markers, uh, which I'm gonna uh, just gloss over just because you've just heard about that. But potentially biomarkers could be a good, uh, a solid part of our armamentarium to give us potentially different tests with different performance characteristics that, and costs that could fit into this restratification strategy. And there are also imaging strategies, which um, I, I only logged into the um, conference just a little while ago, maybe you've heard or not before. Uh, for example, using abbreviated MRI protocols, which are uh, um, shortened versions of a complete MRI protocol that include basically only those sequence that, sequences that we know are important in diagnosing liver cancer. For example, the dynamic contrast enhanced phases in a, in a, in a previous MRI protocol that uses a dynamic contrast enhanced phases. And the bottom line with abbreviated MRI protocols is that with a 10 or 15 minute scan or 10 or 15 minutes in the magnet, you can end up almost having the complete same information as that of a complete MRI and sensitivity and specificity almost identical to that of a complete MRI, which as most of you know, is a gold standard diagnostic test for liver cancer. Um, and so the excitement there is, is, is great uh, if this could become a potentially cost-effective test in uh, selected at-risk patients. Um, this is what an abbreviated MRI would look like. Again, very familiar to most of you. So you would get the pre-contrast phases, the dynamic contrast and has phase in B with a um, hypervascular uh, lesion with uh, pseudocapsule and uh, arterial phase enhancement. And then uh, in the delayed phase, uh, you get washout as shown in C. And then you need the last component of the risk-based surveillance strategy, which is, uh, let's say you, you can calculate the risk of a, an individual patient of getting liver cancer. You have multiple screening modalities, but how do you decide that at a risk greater than X, somebody gets abbreviated MRI or, the, or at a risk um, from one to 2%, uh, 
or three percent, the appropriate strategy might be uh, circulating free tumor DNA or a liquid biopsy. Well, usually that's determined by decision analysis and modeling of the different strategies, uh, incorporating in them the cost of each strategy and the potential effectiveness of each strategy. So this part in the middle is very, very important. It should not be ignored in any such strategies. So here's my conclusion. I think that liver cancer has great potential, really, to be one of the leaders in which we implement this novel re-stratification and re-space surveillance and precision screening. Um, I think that HCC risk estimation is possible uh, and can further improve with uh, better models. There are many promising screening tests that are in different phases of validation that could fit into such a strategy uh, um, according to a particular patient's risk. And we need decision analytic studies to bring it all together uh, to decide either who to screen, whether you need screening or not, what strategy fits best at a person's particular risk level. Um, and we can also use these strategies, by the way, to get better outreach to high, high risk groups. I think the previous speakers have highlighted that one of the main problems we have with liver cancer screening is the uptake of screening is very low. Uh, and I wanna finish by thanking Inazel uh, for this uh, invitation and hope to at some point visit in person and meet you all in person. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Delabri, Professor. Yes, Nagarwal. I'm. I'm there. I'm there. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for this wonderful talk. And the the point you made is that you must have cirrhosis first before you start screening it. And this various scoring system is still we are learning from it, and we don't know which is the best scoring system yet. But one must have cirrhosis first before one start even thinking, uh, thinking screening because otherwise it would be not cost effective. We'll, we will go on to second speaker now and have discussion at the end. The second speaker is Dr. Amit Singhal, who's done uh, equally pioneer work in this field. And he's professor of medicine uh, in uh, Dallas. He's a chief of hepatology and uh, in the medical center liver tumor program. And he's done a lot of publications on this field of limitations of current screening and surveillance modalities and features of perspectives. Professor Amit Singhal, please. Over to you. Um, thank, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Anazel um, for this kind invitation to provide this talk. Um, and as you heard, I'll be talking about the limitations of current screening and surveillance modalities uh, for HCC. Um, I have to say um, a lot of the um, slides I'll be covering over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes have been touched upon um, on, you know, during some of the prior talks, um, but I'll try to at least provide my perspectives and add on to, to what's been said um, already, but I apologize in advance for any repetition. Um, here you can see my disclosures um, and uh, any slides that are relevant in terms of my disclosures, I've actually labeled um, and I'll call it out um, in terms of conflicts of interest. Um, so to start, I think epidemiology that everyone here um, is well aware of, HEC is the third leading cause of cancer related death um, worldwide. And when you take a look at this, the highest burden um, is in East Asia and in Africa, driven by high rates of endemic hepatitis B in, in both of those areas. Um, in um, the Indian subcontinent, uh, we see lower um, HEC mortality compared to some of the surrounding regions. Um, but in terms of epidemiology and, and the, the predisposing factors, um, we see that this is largely driven by um, you know, continued viral hepatitis, but also as we know, um, Indians are very high risk for having um, non-viral etiologies and components of the metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, um, as well as alcohol use that can contribute to that HEC risk um, and HEC mortality in that, in that region. Once again, um, well aware that prognosis is strongly associated with tumor stage at the time of diagnosis. We know that as we've heard from many of the prior speakers that if we find HEC at an early stage, um, we have curative therapies available, local ablation, surgical resection, liver transplantation. And these patients can achieve a median survival well over five years, if not touching double digits, 10 plus years. 
Whereas those patients who are found to have intermediate or advanced stages um, have palliative therapies available, including chemoembolization, radioembolization, and systemic therapies. Once again, as touched upon by some of the prior speakers, we now know that this is much more fluid and it's less bucket-based than it has been historically. So patients can start in the intermediate stage um, and be downstaged to some of these curative therapies. And as we heard, um, you know, some of the some of the centers um, can even expand liver transplantation to those patients beyond traditional transplant criteria. Um, you know, as long as that um, disease is liver localized and still achieve favorable outcomes in selected patients. But overall, I think we can all agree that the goal here is to find patients at an early stage if and when possible. There are multiple professional society guidelines, including a nasal, that currently recommend surveillance in high risk individuals. Um, and so we know that HCC surveillance um, can improve. Um, early detection, um, and I'll go through those data. Um, and we really need to have um, efforts that increase early detection efforts um, in, in multiple countries. So when we take a look at the data underlying these recommendations, the, the best data for HEC surveillance um, comes from a large randomized control trial that was conducted over 15 years ago in China. Um, patients were randomized to receive HEC surveillance or not. And we see that um, the group randomized to surveillance had significantly higher early detection, higher curative treatment receipt, and most notably, this continues to be the only level one data um, that shows that HCC surveillance reduces HCC related mortality with a 37% reduction in HCC related mortality. Now, this study is, is, um, is very instrumental and very is a cornerstone of why we should do HCC surveillance but is not without limitations. Uh, most notably, this study used block randomization, but um, was not analyzed according to that fashion. So even though this remains the level one data, um, you know, is, is imperfect in terms of its um, uh, support for HCC surveillance. And also, of course, we're unclear if these results really apply to contemporary populations. As I mentioned, this study was done in the 1990s in a hepatitis B population conducted in China. Um, and so you can see just from a phenotype of patients that were included in that study, this is much more like the person on the left. Whereas many of the patients that we see in clinical practice tend to be the phenotype on the right, much more obese, and that can make um, surveillance much more difficult by itself. The other thing is that we know that there are notable differences in terms of liver morphology between a hepatitis B screening population and a cirrhosis screening population. Once again, discussed earlier in some of the radiology talks in terms of the nodularity that we see in cirrhosis and how this can impact ultrasound sensitivity and specificity. And so the results from that, that, um, that surveillance trial cannot be directly extrapolated to the cirrhosis patient population that most of us see in our clinical practice. Unfortunately, when a randomized control trial was attempted, among patients with cirrhosis, this had to be stopped early because of poor enrollment. And so we're forced to depend on cohort studies that evaluate the association between HCC surveillance and improved outcomes. Um, as many of you know, we published a meta-analysis about um, uh, just about seven years ago that looked at the association between HCC surveillance and those improved outcomes. Here you can see data fresh off the, um, off the press in terms of an updated um, meta-analysis which we looked at recent cohort studies, looking at the association between HCC surveillance and improved outcomes, including early stage detection, receipt of curative therapy, and improved overall survival. And in short, what we can see from these more recent studies is that HCC surveillance is associated with early stage detection, associated with receipt of curative therapy, and most notably associated with a reduction in uh, um, mortality where we see a 36% improvement in overall survival um, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.64 um, when you take a look at those patients who received HCC surveillance um, compared to not. Now, once again, when we take a look at the modalities in terms of which, in terms of how HCC surveillance should be performed, this is when we start seeing discrepancies. Um, and this really goes to the debate of ultrasound with or without alpha-fetoprotein. 
Here you can see the recommendations from the um, a, a nasal society, where a nasal recommends six monthly abdominal ultrasound by experienced personnel, um, and serum AFP has no additive role in HCC surveillance. These guidelines are actually in, um, uh, in parallel with those from EASL, which also recommend um, ultrasound alone, but are discrepant from those from ASLD, which all recommend ultrasound with or without alpha feta protein. Now, when we take a look at the data for ultrasound alone, here you can see results from the prior meta-analysis that has been referenced um, in, in a couple of the prior talks, including those by Dr. Um, Kumar, as well as uh, Dr. John Keisel, where we take a look at the, the data for ultrasound alone, and you can see that ultrasound is clearly very operator dependent with a wide variation in terms of ultrasound sensitivity for early detection across studies with a range of 21% all the way up to 89%. And these are, studies are all done in expert centers, so it's not a matter of just expert center, but even among expert centers, you still see a, a wide variation in ultrasound sensitivity for early tumor detection. Furthermore, when you take a look at the pooled sensitivity of ultrasound for early detection, you see that the pooled sensitivity of ultrasound is only 47%. That means that even if you do ultrasound in an expert center, you have less than a 50-50 chance of finding um, HCC at an early stage, clearly highlighting that we must do better. Now, once again, we've had discussions of ultrasound visualization. This was part of the discussion panel earlier today. And what we've seen um, from some of the studies that we've conducted, this is a study with over 1,000 ultrasounds independently reviewed um, in terms of adequate visualization, you can see that 20% of ultrasounds were either definitely inadequate or likely inadequate for um, evaluation of HCC nodules. We see that the odds of having inadequate visualization higher if you have liver dysfunction, higher if you have obesity or morbid obesity, and higher if you have non-viral contributing factors, including alcohol-related cirrhosis or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Now, once again, we know that we are, we are shifting from a viral hepatitis world to more and more cases related to obesity and non-viral etiologies. And this means that ultrasound poor visualization is only gonna become more and more of an issue as we move forward. Now, this study was done in 2017, preceded the ultrasound LIRADS visualization score. We have subsequently now replicated the study using the ultrasound visualization score and found exactly the same results. 20% of ultrasounds classified as having poor visualization according to LIRAD's visualization um, criteria. So now, if we can't perform ultrasound in all patients, if it's not an optimal test, which I contend it is not an optimal test, what can we do differently? Now, I will say I don't believe that CAT scan is really a viable option for HEC surveillance given multiple potential harms more expensive, we have ionizing radiation, we know that it's nephrotoxic, and we know that this is particularly true if you have to repeat that CAT scan um, uh, with repeated intervals. And so I would contend that HCC surveillance should not be performed using CAT scans, and we need to think of other modalities. Now we do have data for MRI-based surveillance. This is, a, this is a study, the Prius study, um, that was coming out of South Korea, prospective study, 407 patients with child pew A or B cirrhosis, majority being hepatitis B infected. These patients were fouled over one and a half years, so over 1,000 surveillance rounds, and they had semi-annual ultrasound and MRI done in all patients over that one and a half years. 43 patients were diagnosed with HCC, 42 at an early or very early stage. And in brief, what we see is that the sensitivity of MRI for early tumor detection substantially and significantly higher than that of ultrasound, 86% versus 28%. Similarly, sensitivity for very early tumor detection, significantly higher for MRI, 86% versus 26%, and the specificity higher for MRI versus ultrasound, 97% versus 94%. I think this study is actually very important in terms of the viability of MRI as an HCC surveillance modality, of course, this does need to be replicated in non-hepatitis B individuals, and I think we do need replication studies outside of this single center experience. 
Now, this was um, just uh, referenced by uh, Dr. Ayonu just um, uh, in the in the prior talk in terms of, you know, taking an MRI, which is a 45 minute modality and potentially selecting sequences and shrinking that 45 uh, minute modality down to a 15 minute exam, i.e. this concept of abbreviated MRIs. And you can see that this has been evaluated in at least four different studies using case control um, 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 study design. And in brief, what we find from these abbreviated MRI studies is that abbreviated MRI, where you take those selected sequences, appears to retain high sensitivity and specificity for early HEC detection. There have similarly been um, data looking at non-contrast MRI, which also appears promising for um, having high sensitivity and specificity. I think these concepts need to be validated using cohort studies, moving beyond the case control um, study design. And we will see if, once again, these concepts can retain um, high sensitivity and specificity. I would argue in parallel, we need to then think through reimbursement models. And so while we shrink the, the duration of that MRI exam, we also need to make sure that we continue to also decrease the cost of MRI, which can then make it a more viable strategy moving forward. Now, moving outside of the imaging um, uh, um, um, framework and thinking of biomarkers, which I think is the, the much more viable strategy long term, um, let's review the data for what biomarkers we have and what biomarkers are on the horizon. Now, once again, we heard um, an excellent talk by Dr. Kumar earlier today talking about some of these biomarkers. Um, I'll highlight some of the key concepts in that talk and hopefully reframe it um, in terms of um, you know, my, my perspectives here. So when we take a look at the data for ultrasound with or without alpha beta protein, starting on the left-hand side of the slide, we see data from our prior meta-analysis taking a look at the comparative data for ultrasound with or without AFP. Despite all of the talks and despite all of the commentaries, editorials, et cetera, that have been written on this topic, um, when we published this a couple of years ago, there were only seven studies taking a look at ultrasound with versus ultrasound without AFP. What you can see here is that each of the studies that evaluated this question found a benefit for adding AFP to ultrasound, although many of them did not find a significant difference given limited sample size. When you pool the results across all of those studies, we find that the sensitivity of ultrasound with AFP for early stage HEC detection significantly higher than ultrasound alone, 63% versus 45%, once again, p-value 0.002. So we, we contend that, this, that these data suggest that, sent, that ultrasound, uh, ultrasound should be used with AFP for HEC surveillance at this time. We have subsequently published this uh, um, using uh, modeling studies and cost-effective analyses, using data for both benefits and harms. And across um, uh, simulations, ultrasound with AFP was the most cost-effective strategy in over 80% of simulations, once again showing that the data suggests that ultrasound with AFP is the best strategy, as well as the most cost-effective strategy for HEC surveillance at this time. Now, as referenced from some of the talks um, previously, um, we've heard that there are multiple biomarkers that are currently undergoing phase two and um, phase three evaluation. I list here some of those biomarkers uh, that are undergoing evaluation. I want to touch on upon a couple of these um, that are the most promising. Here you can see the um, data for the GALID panel. Uh, I, I will say this is one of the areas that I do have a conflict that I've um, uh, worked um, with uh, Fujifilm and, and um, uh, Waco in the past. Um, uh, GALID is a biomarker panel that includes two patient demographics, gender and age, as well as three biomarkers that you've heard upon, um, AFPL3, AFP, and DCP. Here you can see data from the largest case control study looking at this biomarker panel, nearly 7,000 patients, nearly 2,500 with HCC, nearly 4,500 with chronic liver disease, vast majority being cirrhosis. In the table, I'm going to focus on every other row, the second, fourth, and sixth row, which are the data for GALAD taking a look at early tumor detection. And you can see here that GALAD by itself achieves a sensitivity 
of 60 to 80 percent for early tumor detection, um, depending on which cohort you look at. 80 percent in the UK cohort, 60 percent in the J Japanese cohort, 67 percent in the German cohort. This is a biomarker panel alone without any imaging, and you can see that this sensitivity rivals that of ultrasound with AFP. Further, we find no difference in gallant performance by cirrhosis etiology, SVR, or hepatitis B treatment. So I would contend that gallant is a very promising biomarker panel um, in this case controlled study. Now data for, for gallant in terms of a phase three cohort study was just presented at ASLD um, this past month, once again suggesting that gallant achieves very high sensitivity even six months prior to HEC diagnosis, so appears to be validated in a phase three biomarker study, and I think is getting closer and closer to us being considered for, for everyday use in clinical practice. Once again, you heard um, a, an excellent talk from John Keisel earlier today talking about um, the methylated DNA panel from the exact sciences. Um, these were data that we presented once again at ASLD just this past month. Clinical validation case control study, 159 HEC cases, 250 controls. And in short, what we presented um, at the ASLD is that this um, uh, methylated DNA panel, sensitivity for early stage detection, 82%, specificity, 87%. Overall, you take a look at the diagnostic odds ratio in terms of surveillance, um, and you can see that this really rivals that of GALAD. So I think both of these very promising in these case controlled um, uh, uh, studies, um, and you know we will see as this continues to be validated in phase three and phase four cohort studies uh, moving forward. And finally, you know once again we've heard references to circulating tumor cells um, and um, you know um, uh, uh, extracellular vesicles um, in terms of promise um, for for HCC surveillance. Here I just show you. Um, uh, high level results from early case control, um, you know, phase one, two studies in terms of these showing promise, although we do need validation in larger phase two and phase three studies before we can start to consider these as rival, rivaling those um, of, the, of the biomarkers that have already presented. The nice thing is that we do now have phase three validation platforms that have been designed um, and available for validation of these biomarkers. As I referenced, GALAT has now been presented in terms of a phase three evaluation in the um, uh, NCI, Hepatocellular Carcinoma Early Detection Strategy, or the HEADS cohort. Um, and we anticipate the, this panel also being evalu evaluated in the Texas HEC Consortium. Um, and I think that these will rapidly allow uh, um, validation and translation of promising biomarkers moving forward. Finally, for the last couple slides, I want to leave you with this concept that was referenced in a couple talks briefly. Um, you know, when we think of HEC surveillance effectiveness, it's not just about test modality, but it's also about utilization. And we know that unfortunately, HEC surveillance is underused in clinical practice. Here we can see results of a systematic review and meta-analysis that we published a couple of years ago taking a look at 29 studies published over the last decade. And in short, what we see is that the pooled surveillance estimate, so the, the chance that somebody received HCC surveillance, only 26%. And it doesn't matter if you're in the US, if you're in Europe, or if you're in Asia. There's underuse of HCC surveillance no matter where you are. We know that the lowest utilization is among um, uh, primary care clinics and population-based cohorts. But these settings actually account for a large proportion of our patients with cirrhosis and chronic hepatitis B. So we clearly need to do better in terms of increasing surveillance utilization among these clinical practice settings. We know that there are several provider as well as patient reported barriers to HEC surveillance that must be solved. Here's a study um, that we published last year, taking a look at barriers to HCC surveillance from a patient perspective. Patients across three different types of healthcare settings reported these as the more, four most common barriers to HCC surveillance. Cost of testing, difficulty with scheduling, uncertainty where to get the surveillance done, and difficulties with transportation. And I would contend that these barriers are probably not US specific barriers, but are likely found 
um, in settings across the world. Most notably, we found that patients who reported any one of these four barriers were significantly less likely to have HCC surveillance in the year prior. So these barriers clearly translate into lower surveillance utilization in clinical practice. The other thing that I would like to point out is that many of these barriers are specific to imaging-based surveillance. Difficulty with scheduling, uncertainty where to get this done, transportation difficulties because it requires a separate appointment. And so if we can move towards a biomarker-based strategy, this will also likely increase HEC surveillance utilization because it can be done at the time of a clinic visit. And so the effectiveness of biomarker-based surveillance is not just about sensitivity, but when you multiply sensitivity by utilization, I would contend that biomarker-based surveillance will be significantly and dramatically higher than the effectiveness that we see with ultrasound or any other imaging-based surveillance strategy. So I really think that biomarkers are where we should put, be putting most of our effort and most of our money as we move forward. In summary, HEC mortality is increasing and is projected to be the third leading cause of cancer death. Early HEC detection facilitates curative treatment and long-term survival. HEC surveillance is supported by several studies, including a randomized controlled trial in patients with chronic hepatitis B, several cohort studies in patients with cirrhosis. Albeit imperfect, the preponderance of data does suggest that HEC surveillance is beneficial. Ultrasound alone has suboptimal sensitivity, particularly in contemporary cohorts where we see high rates of obesity and non-viral etiologies, really highlighting the need for novel blood and imaging-based modalities, many a promising need for the validation in cohort studies as we move forward. And finally, um, as I just mentioned, HCC surveillance is underused in clinical practice. Multiple barriers must be addressed, but I think they can be addressed with some of these novel um, blood and imaging-based modalities. Um, I'd like to thank um, everyone who I've had a chance to work with over the last several years, anyone who's funded any part of our research, um, and happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Singel. Excellent talk. And also highlighting that the surveillance is suboptimal, is not being done all over in, in the higher uh, percentage. And those, who are, those where the surveillance is done what is the detection rate of early cancer? So when you have surveillance done, the sensitivity of ultrasound alone is less than 50%, and the sensitivity of ultrasound with AFP is around 63%. And that's where we clearly need to do better. Okay, Rakesh, you'd like to take over the panelists now? Sure, thanks, uh, Dr. Dilhabri. So our panelists are Dr. Shashi Paul from Olney Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, Dr. Sunil Dadich from SN Medical College in Jodhpur, Brigadier Atul Sood from Command Hospital in Chandi Mandir, Haryana, Dr. Lubna Kamani from Aga Khan University Hospital in Karachi, Pakistan, and Dr. Nipun Verma, Department of Hepatology at PGI Chandigarh. Does any of you Ladies, uh, gentlemen and ladies, do you have any questions? Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm Dr. Shashi Paul. Good evening. And uh, thank you so much for the organizers to make me part of this uh, academic feast. And a big congratulations to the speakers who have given wonderful, lucid, informative talks. And it's really, really extremely relevant and having a lot of repercussions on the topic that we are discussing. So since both uh, surveillance and the screening tests are highly interlinked, so then my question is also quite interlinked, which, which says so that there are now multiple risk modeling scores available. So much of data has come up. Even though there are limitations, majority are on the non-surveillance cohorts. The cost benefit uh, analysis data is not much available. Is this time now to reconsider the one size fit all strategy of screening tests, uh, you know, recommending the alterations in these kind of, uh, in this approach of one size fit all strategy? Has the time come? Do we have enough evidence for all this? 
I will uh, take one more personal questions and then we'll ask our speakers to address the questions. Another person, anyone? So I would like to ask Dr. George that uh, as a lot of machine learning algorithms are evolving and you have feature explanation uh, of th those also like extreme gradient boost and random forest. Have we used those criteria and developed certain uh, logistic regression based models like I've seen JAMA paper and there you have used logistic regression based models. So how are they performing in uh, external cohort? Um, so will the speakers take those up, please? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, George. Yeah, thanks. I mean, those are two excellent questions. And uh, Shashi, you asked first, is it time to give up the one size fits all strategy? <laughs> and is it time to uh, use restratification? It's a bold statement. I, I think it's time to study it and it's time to, um, to think of it as a viable strategy. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, you need all three components. You need to have a way to estimate risk. You need to have multiple screening modalities and you need to have the middle part where you know at what screening threshold, at what risk threshold do you recommend each modality. Do we have all those things now? No. So I guess the simple answer to your question is no, we can't give up the one size fits all. Um, but also we can keep studying each of these three components individually, right? And that's the only way we're gonna make progress. Now, you see, when I, when I try to write a grant or publish a paper and you attack one part of this equation, you often get criticized. You say, well, yes, you're gonna give me a risk calculator, but how are you gonna use it? You don't know how to use it. Once you once you tell me the risk is 2% or 3%, what are you going to do differently? And people have to acknowledge, yes, we're going to attack it separately. While John Kaisel and others are developing, um, uh, you know, circulating free tumor DNA panels and others are studying the properties of MRI, you know, somebody else is developing a risk calculator and somebody else is doing a decision analysis to say if a cost of a test is such and the specificity and the sensitivity is such, you know, we could use this modality or that modality. And then my point was to highlight that all those three things need to come together. And I think they will come together. I kind of disagree a little bit with maybe Amit or others who think that there's always going to be the entry level is going to be a biomarker test that everybody gets. Maybe that's how it's going to evolve. And maybe, maybe the biomarker test is the way we stratify people. I don't know. But that's a sort of slightly different concept. And then in answer, I guess, to Nippon's, question about um, machine learning and uh, um, you know features. Um, my uh, next strategy, uh, Nippon, is to um, uh, transform some of the models that we develop using traditional regression techniques, um, transform them into XGBoosted machine learning models, and but but use the same underlying features, use the same uh, um, group of 15 or 20 readily available extractable characteristics, which, which in a way takes away some of the value I get it of machine learning, but it makes it more feasible. You know, you, if you develop a model that says, I'm going, a machine learning model that says, I'm going to take out the entire EHR longitudinal labs over time every information in the HR and it's gonna spit out an answer. Liver, you're gonna get liver cancer in one year uh, or not. And it may be very highly predicted. Well, good luck validating that in another study because other people's EHRs are different and, and good luck executing it in, in, in real clinical practice. Like I said, hardly any system has that um, uh, algorithmic capability and that um, to, to execute such a, um, machine learning models. But, but if you say, I'm gonna use the same 10, 15 predictors, uh, platelet count, AST, ALT, maybe a combination of FIB4 alkaline phosphatase, your age, your gender, your race, your BMI, your diabetes, your smoking status, enter all of them. Then the machine learning model can still give you a slightly higher prediction by taking care of interactions, missing values, so on and so forth. Uh, let me stop here because I'm sure Amit has some really important comments on this. Dr. Singal? Yeah, George, um, you know, I, I think that we're actually on the same page. You know, you said that you may disagree with me, but I actually think that um, I think we're on the same page in terms of our approach. 
um, you know, I think that um, while I sort of like focused on the biomarker strategy as being the most promising strategy moving forward, I guess the way that I would look at this is, you know, you, you brought up the idea of like high risk, intermediate risk and low risk. And, you know, I think it would be great if we can identify a low risk group who, for example, doesn't need surveillance that you can continue to follow with a risk calculator or a risk biomarker. Um, as you know, um, you know, Yujin Hoshida has, you know, now has his um, risk biomarker now been validated in a couple of different cohorts. But if you have something like that, whether it's a clinical risk calculator or a risk biomarker, and you identify low risk patients who have sufficiently low risk, you could follow them with that risk biomarker or that risk calculator and, and thereby not need to subject those patients to HCC surveillance. Um, you know, I think that we have a um, a bias that we often think that HEC surveillance or any kind of cancer screening is only good, but we do know that there are potential false positives. We know that there are potential harms that can come out of this. And so avoiding that um, in some patients can actually be a, a good thing. Um, and then you can imagine like an intermediate group where hopefully will be the majority of patients where you could do something quote unquote easy, but effective like a biomarker based strategy and thereby reserve high intensity modalities, for example, MRI based surveillance or AMRI, et cetera, where you can then put those more intensive measures, which require also a little bit more navigation to maximize utilization. Um, you can then do that in that high risk group. So I think that both of us have the same, you know, general vision for where the field can go. Um, though I agree with you that we need a lot more work to be done before we can, um, you know, put this in practice. And so the work that you're doing and, you know, the work that others are, are doing in this area are critical for us to, to move forward towards this, you know, precision screening world. So let me turn the argument slightly. So Dr. Singhal, you've been talking about biomarker based methods having greater sensitivity. But to me in India, I think specificity is much more important and we're going to lose specificity when we use biomarkers especially when we are in a population where liver injury due to other causes is very common, that's going to be really worse. And so that's my question to you. And to the other panelists, what do you think the relevance of all this is in India? Where, you know, if we look at cost effectiveness, there is just going to be no cost effectiveness as far as we are concerned. What do they think? But after uh, Dr. Amit has answered the question. Yeah, I, of course. I, I mean, I, I believe that specificity is critical to maintain. Um, you know, once again, we know that when people have false positives, this utilizes um, diagnostic modalities, costs, um, as well as any potential downstream harms that can occur. Um, I would actually argue that the specificity of ultrasound is not what we think. So when you take a look at this, the specificity that is often reported in the literature is the specificity when you take a look at actual detection of masses greater than a centimeter. But we know that actually when you take a look at clinical practice, there are many patients who have either visualization score Cs, there are patients who have subcentimeter lesions, and those patients often also undergo diagnostic evaluation. So we've actually shown a study where we looked at um, a cohort that we followed at our hospital for over a, for a three year period. And the false positives or the diagnostic workup was higher with ultrasound than with AFP, let alone using biomarker panels the harms from ultrasound were greater than that of AFP. And I would contend that biomarkers are a continuous value. And so you can always adjust that cutoff. So if, you know, if it's an AFP is 21, you're not obligated to then go on to do a CT or MRI. You can actually say that I understand that this patient has underlying hepatitis B or underlying active hepatitis C, more likely to be a false positive. And you can take a look at longitudinal values. You can take a look at other things to then mitigate any potential harms of that biomarker-based strategy. And so overall, when you take a biomarker and you add on a good clinician, which all of us saw good clinicians, biomarker-based strategies are actually safer and have less unnecessary diagnostic evaluation than an ultrasound, where oftentimes you're depending on an independent read, you can't take a look at the images, and you find that actually the diagnostic evaluation is much higher. So Amit, I have a question for you. What about the false positives? Have, has anybody compared the false positivity picked up on abbreviated MRI versus the routine contrast MRI? Yeah, so the specificity for um, uh, uh, MRI was 97% in that PREA study. We just have a study that was accepted 
um, just this past week where we took a look at the, that PREA study and we did abbreviated MRIs. We created an abbreviated MRI from there and the specificity was maintained above 90% in the, in the abbreviated MRI group. Mm -hmm. So very high specificity with the MRI as well. As well. All the phases, all the three protocols, the non-contrast, hepatobiliary, and the other one? Yeah, we just did the uh, we did the hepatobiliary abbreviated MRI. We did not take a look at the non-contrast um, sort of MRI in there. But when you take a look at the case control data that I that I presented, once again, those data do suggest that the specificity of abbreviated MRI is reasonably high. Um, although, if you really want to maximize specificity over sensitivity, it may not be as high as as one would desire. We have very limited time. One minute, Doctor Lubna, you want to add anything? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, listening to these very two important talks, uh, we know that uh, uh, detection of early HCC improves outcome, and definitely the ultrasound and the alpha fetoprotein is not sufficient. As said, its only sensitivity is 63%. What about doing a routine MRI, as you said, at 97%? So actually, it would be more cost-effective because we will be saving lives, we will be saving patients from advanced disease, from liver transplantation, and we will be actually can afford, offer a cure. So I guess in long term, uh, MRI will be cost effective as compared to just ultrasound and uh, alpha fetoprotein till we have a better modality test or uh, better blood test. So what, uh, what would be the take home message now from today? Because definitely we are doing studies, but what would be the take home message in this last session? Professor, you are trying to say something, please. Yeah, yeah. I just had one comment. That is, in our clinical practice, uh, we see mostly decompensated cirrhotics, and in that group of patients, uh, uh, screening really doesn't uh, have much of relevance. Patients with child A and child B cirrhosis uh, are the ones who are not regularly followed up, uh, who actually would benefit from the. Uh, point of screening. Uh, what are your comments on that? Uh, Dr. Sunil, do you want to have, uh, have anything to add? Yes, sir. We yes, sir. I, I want to ask something. What is the minimum level of incidence of SCCS at which the uh, the surveillance uh, becomes cost effective? Uh, yeah. So uh, either of the two speakers, please. Um, I'm going to be provocative a little bit and address Lupna's question mostly which is a common sense question that a lot of radiologists and hepatologists who take care of patients say, why don't you just do an MRI and be done with it? All of you know that an MRI will pick up lesions. And all of you know it's very highly specific and sensitive. Maybe it's 95, maybe it's 94, maybe it's 97, but it's extremely sensitive. The point is it's expensive. And in most healthcare systems, if you do the math, you cannot do MRIs on everybody. You can probably not, if you do them, if you try to space out the interval, do them once a year instead of once every six months, then you lose that advantage because tumor, because cancers can, can evolve in three months, six months. So the real answer is abbreviated MRI. If you can get a 15 minute scan, but by the way, in the United States, Medicare right now reimburses just $450 for a complete MRI. It's not an expensive test anymore. In India, it's probably a lot less than that. Um, so if you can get an MRI, down, an abbreviated MRI, to be reimbursed at $150 or $200, how can any other biomarket test compete with that? I, I worry about the biomarket folks because in some ways they're over-engineering the problem. The, the answer is already out there, but they're over-engineering the problem. That's the provocative answer. Just, I just, if the I, I don't want of, to, I don't, no, no, I don't want okay. to be wishy. No, no, it's no, no. okay just to, to point little, out. You know, otherwise, everybody's going to say, well, you could do this, no, you no. could do that. So that's exactly why I want to come in. Everybody shouldn't say think that MRI, because it is cheaper than $400, here it's the answer. Because yeah. proportionately, every other test and every other treatment also costs much less. So the ratio remains the same. Right. The ratio yeah. of MRI versus other tests remains the same. Correct. So... Yeah. George, I think, you know, you bring up, the, I mean, I agree with you that MRI costs have decreased and MRI sensitivity and specificity are high. Um, I think the one thing is radiologic capacity is, is a significant issue. And so when you take a look at, um, you know, when you take a look at health systems, which have a large proportion of patients who are in need of HCC surveillance, I don't think that we have radiologic capacity 
to start doing MRI, even an abbreviated MRI in all of those patients. I can tell you, even for some of our diagnostic MRIs, we have to wait sometimes a week or two weeks because um, in some of our facilities because of sort of delays. I mean, MRI is being used in many other indications more and more. And so unless we build MRI facilities across every country in the, in the world um, to be done, I think that you're gonna run into issues of radiologic capacity. Um, so um, I think that's my one fear. And then the other thing is that, you know, even though we think that this is an, an answer from a provider perspective, I mean, patients hate getting an MRI. Um, I have patients with HEC that I have to spend five minutes explaining why they need to get an MRI and they reluctantly do that. Talk about doing this as, you know, a screening test and I think it's gonna become much harder. So you're gonna have issues with uh, many reasons why we need to think of something beyond MRI-based surveillance strategies. But I do think that abbreviated MRI does play a role. It's just not the answer where we have to give up everything else. Um, I'm just going to spend two minutes on the other questions. Cost effectiveness threshold traditionally used to be 1.5%. More recent analyses suggest that it has dropped as the cost of these modalities have dropped. Um, so a, a cost effectiveness analysis showed the more, more recent estimates somewhere being around 0.7% or 0.8% to be cost effective. So much lower than our traditional listed cost effectiveness thresholds in patients with cirrhosis, non cirrhotic patients even lower, as many know, somewhere around 0.2%, probably even lower than that in terms of non cirrhotic patients, such as those with Hep B. And then the final question of this child pew A and B, um, if I'm understanding the question, it's like the child pew B patients are the ones in clinical practice, the child pew A's are the ones that often are not being followed as closely, but those are the ones who most benefit from um, HEC surveillance. We know that from a nice Italian cohort study years ago. Um, and this is where I think that we need to start thinking of outreach efforts and other sort of um, strategies where we can then reach out to these patients, identify them earlier um, and do this, even though they may not be in practice, we need to think of how we can best identify and, and get these patients into um, surveillance programs. And so we've done some of the outreach stuff, which I think can be used in many countries across the world, including India. Uh, we've, uh, thank you. We have run out of time, so I don't think we'll have uh, another round of questions. If I may add a little bit of the Indian perspective. We are talking of radiologic capacity in terms of MRI. If we start doing for all cirrhosis, ultrasound of the quality that we want, I don't think we have the radiologic capacity. I think that's another thing that needs to be uh, kept in mind. Cost effectiveness by the US standards with the, you know, what we are willingness to pay that the US has, those are the figures for us, the figures are very, very different. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. And finally, for uh, you know the proportion of false positives it's much more likely in a developing country where infections are much more common and that's something that we really need to keep in mind so i think it remains a difficult area uh, especially when we come to the indian subcontinent so this will continue to be so we'll continue to discuss and finally our patients are not really willing to come back every uh, 6 months get these tests done when you know, especially when cost of any false positive test, further testing is very high. So with that, I think we had a very interesting session uh, and we close this session here. Thank you. And also Rakesh, should be very, to, to detect early cancer will be also difficult in India. Yeah. Now, you want to say, sir, why? The early detection, because we do not have uh, surveillance, surveillance is not enough around to detect early cancer. So therefore we will be missing lots of early cancers, even if we have surveillance, but if the surveillance is only 20%. And really finally, sir, if we start actually doing in everybody, the number of lesions we will pick up, the facilities to treat them and the cost of treatment is fairly high and that's going to be challenging. With that, I think we'll, uh, with permission from Dr. Dilavri, maybe close the session. Yeah. Thank you. Back to the Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I think before we close, I think I, I would like to thank from Enazel's, uh, uh, from Enazel's behalf to all the faculty, I think for this wonderful session, uh, speakers, chairpersons, and the panelists. And special thanks to two speakers, I think who joined us early morning on Saturday and this is a Thanksgiving weekend for them. I think 6 a.m. for maybe both of you or 8 a.m. So thank you very much and uh, hope to see you in person in one of the you know, next um, Azul meetings whenever 
hopefully next year i think it should be a physical meeting so thank you all and uh, uh, dr nepon you want to say something before i make some housekeeping announcement here no i really love the presentation and precision risk assessment which and which is a topic close to my heart and machine learning thank you sir for the opportunity thank you everyone so i think we have had a wonderful day one of you know this midterm meeting on uh, hcc a lot of learning i would say i think uh, new things new concepts and i think and tomorrow is also another like, exciting day we are starting with you know the staging and the treatment decision and followed by all the treatment modalities starting from the radiological to surgical to systemic uh, therapy and the radiation and finally i think we are going to end with a very practical what we'd say a panel discussion on the real challenges and solutions of treatment of hcc in south asia in general and in india in particular so hope to see you tomorrow again but tomorrow we are starting at 2 pm indian standard time and maybe you can calculate your timing at time zone so see you tomorrow and good night everyone have a nice day thank you thank you thank you so thank you thank you good night, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.